Chapter One of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter One. My father's family name being Pirrup, and my Christian name Philip, my infant tongue could make of both names nothing longer or more explicit than Pip. So I called myself Pip, and came to be called Pip. I gave Pirrup as my father's family name on the authority of his tombstone and my sister, Mrs. Joe Gargery, who married the blacksmith. As I never saw my father or my mother, and never saw any likeness of either of them, for their days were long before the days of photographs, my first fancies regarding what they were like were unreasonably derived from their tombstones. The shape of the letters on my father's gave me an odd idea that he was a square, stout, dark man with curly black hair. From the character and turn of the inscription, also Georgiana, wife of the above, I drew a childish conclusion that my mother was freckled and sickly. To five little stone lozenges, each about a foot and a half long, which were arranged in a neat row beside their grave, and were sacred to the memory of five little brothers of mine, who gave up trying to get a living exceedingly early in that universal struggle. I am indebted for a belief I religiously entertained, that they had all been born on their backs with their hands in their trouser pockets, and had never taken them out in this state of existence. Ours was the marsh country, down by the river, within, as the river wound, twenty miles of the sea. My first most vivid and broad impression of the identity of things seems to me to have been gained on a memorable raw afternoon towards evening. At such a time I found out for certain that this bleak place overgrown with nettles was the churchyard, and that Philip Pirrip, late of this parish, and also Georgiana, wife of the above, were dead and buried, and that Alexander, Bartholomew, Abraham, Tobias, and Roger, infant children of the aforesaid, were also dead and buried, and that the dark, flat wilderness beyond the churchyard, intersected with dikes and mounds and gates, with scattered cattle feeding on it, was the marshes, and that the low leaden line beyond was the river, and that the distant savage lair from which the wind was rushing was the sea and that the small bundle of shivers, growing afraid of it all, and beginning to cry, was Pip. "'Hold your noise!' cried a terrible voice, as a man started up from among the graves at the side of the church porch. "'Keep still, you little devil, or I'll cut your throat!' A fearful man, all in coarse grey, with a great iron on his leg. A man with no hat— and with broken shoes, and with an old rag tied round his head. A man who had been soaked in water, and smothered in mud, and lamed by stones, and cut by flints, and stung by nettles, and torn by briars, who limped, and shivered, and glared, and growled, and whose teeth chattered in his head as he seized me by the chin. "'Oh, don't cut my throat, sir!' I pleaded in terror. "'Pray don't do it, sir!' "'Tell us your name,' said the man. "'Quick!' "'Pip, sir.' "'Once more,' said the man, staring at me. "'Give it mouth.' "'Pip. Pip, sir.' "'Show us where you live,' said the man. "'Point out the place.' I pointed to where our village lay, on the flat inshore, among the alder trees and pollards, a mile or more from the church. The man, after looking at me for a moment, turned me upside down, and emptied my pockets. There was nothing in them but a piece of bread. When the church came to itself, for he was so sudden and strong that he made it go head over heels before me, and I saw the steeple under my feet, when the church came to itself, I say, I was seated on a high tombstone, trembling while he ate the bread ravenously. "'You young dog!' said the man, licking his lips. "'What fat cheeks you a got!' 
I believe they were fat, although I was at that time undersized for my years, and not strong. "'Darn me if I couldn't eat em said the man, with a threatening shake of his head. "'And if I haven't half a mind to it!' I earnestly expressed my hope that he wouldn't, and held tighter to the tombstone on which he had put me, partly to keep myself upon it, partly to keep myself from crying. "'Now look a here,' said the man. "'Where's your mother?' "'There, sir,' said I. He started, made a short run, and stopped and looked over his shoulder. "'There, sir,' I timidly explained. "'Also Georgiana, that's my mother.' "'Oh,' said he, coming back, "'and is that your father along er your mother?' "'Yes, sir,' said I. "'Him, too, late of this parish.' "'Ha!' he muttered then, considering. "'Who do you live with? Supposing you're kindly let to live, "'what you hadn't made up my mind about?' "'My sister, sir, Mrs. Joe Gargery.' "'Wife of Joe Gargery, the blacksmith, sir.' "'Blacksmith, eh?' said he, and he looked down at his leg. After darkly looking at his leg and me several times, he came closer to my tombstone, took me by both arms, and tilted me back as far as he could hold me, so that his eyes looked most powerfully down into mine, and mine looked most helplessly up into his. "'Now look a here,' he said. The question being whether you're to be let to live. You know what a file is? Yes, sir. And you know what whittles is? Yes, sir. After each question, he tilted me over a little more, so as to give me a greater sense of helplessness and danger. You get me a file, he tilted me again. And you get me whittles, he tilted me again. You bring em both to me. He tilted me again. Or I'll have your art and liver out. He tilted me again. I was dreadfully frightened, and so giddy that I clung to him with both hands, and said, If you would kindly please to let me keep upright, sir, perhaps I shouldn't be sick, and perhaps I could attend more. He gave me a most tremendous dip and roll, so that the church jumped over its own weathercock. Then he held me by the arms in an upright position on the top of the stone, and went on in these fearful terms. "'You bring me, to-morrow morning early, that file and them whittles. You bring the lot to me, at that old battery over yonder. You do it, and you never dare to say a word.' or dare to make a sign concerning your having seen such a person as me, or any person soever, and you shall be let to live. You fail, or you go from my words in any particular, no matter how small it is, and your heart and your liver shall be tore out, roasted, and ate. Now, I ain't alone, as you may think I am. There's a young man hid with me, in comparison with which young man I am an angel. That young man hears the words I speak. That young man has a secret way peculiar to himself of getting at a boy and at his heart and at his liver. It is in vain for a boy to attempt to hide himself from that young man. A boy may lock his door, may be warm in bed, may tuck himself up, may draw the clothes over his head, may think himself comfortable and safe, but that young man will softly creep and creep his way to him, and tear him open. I am a-keeping that young man from harming of you at the present moment, with great difficulty. I find it very hard to hold that young man off of your inside. Now, what do you say? I said I would get him the file, and I would get him what broken bits of food I could, and would come to him at the battery early in the morning. "'Say, Lord, strike you dead if you don't,' said the man. I said so, and he took me down. "'Now,' he pursued, 
You remember what you've undertook, and you remember that young man, and you get home. Uh, good, good night, sir, I faltered. Much of that, said he, glancing about him over the cold, wet flat. I wish I was a frog, or a eel. At the same time he hugged his shuddering body in both his arms, clasping himself as if to hold himself together, and limped towards the low church wall. As I saw him go, picking his way among the nettles, and among the brambles that bound the green mounds, he looked in my young eyes as if he were eluding the hands of the dead people, stretching up cautiously out of their graves, to get a twist upon his ankle, and pull him in. When he came to the low church wall he got over it, like a man whose legs were numbed and stiff, and then turned round to look for me. When I saw him turning, I set my face towards home, and made the best use of my legs. But presently I looked over my shoulder and saw him going on again towards the river, still hugging himself in both arms, and picking his way with his sore feet among the great stones dropped into the marshes here and there, for stepping-places when the rains were heavy or the tide was in. The marshes were just a long black horizontal line then, as I stopped to look after him, and the river was just another horizontal line, not nearly so broad nor yet so black, and the sky was just a row of long angry red lines and dense black lines intermixed. On the edge of the river I could faintly make out the only two black things in all the prospect that seemed to be standing upright. One of these was the beacon by which the sailors steered, like an unhooped cask upon a pole, an ugly thing when you were near it. The other, a gibbet, with some chains hanging to it, which had once held a pirate. The man was limping on towards this ladder, as if he were the pirate come to life, and come down, and going back to hook himself up again gave me a terrible turn when I thought so, and as I saw the cattle lifting their heads to gaze after him, I wondered whether they thought so, too. I looked all round for the horrible young man, and could see no signs of him. But now I was frightened again, and ran home without stopping. End of chapter Chapter Two of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter Two. My sister, Mrs. Joe Gargery, was more than twenty years older than I, and had established a great reputation with herself and the neighbours because she had brought me up by hand. Having at that time to find out for myself what the expression meant, and knowing her to have a hard and heavy hand, and to be much in the habit of laying it upon her husband as well as upon me, I supposed that Joe Gargery and I were both brought up by hand. She was not a good-looking woman, my sister, and I had a general impression that she must have made Joe Gargery marry her by hand. Joe was a fair man, with curls of flaxen hair on each side of his smooth face, and with eyes of such a very undecided blue that they seemed to have somehow got mixed with their own whites. He was a mild, good-natured, sweet-tempered, easy-going, foolish, dear fellow, a sort of Hercules in strength, and also in weakness. My sister, Mrs. Joe, with black hair and eyes, had such a prevailing redness of skin that I sometimes used to wonder whether it was possible she washed herself with a nutmeg grater instead of soap. She was tall and bony, and almost always wore a coarse apron, fastened over her figure behind with two loops, and having a square impregnable bib in front that was stuck full of pins and needles. She made it a powerful merit in herself, and a strong reproach against Joe, that she wore this apron so much, though I really see no reason why she should have worn it at all, or why, if she did wear it at all, she should not have taken it off every day of her life. 
Joe's Forge adjoined our house, which was a wooden house, as many of the dwellings in our country were, most of them at that time. When I ran home from the churchyard, the forge was shut up, and Joe was sitting alone in the kitchen. Joe and I, being fellow sufferers, and having confidences as such, Joe imparted a confidence to me, the moment I raised the latch of the door and peeped in at him, opposite to it, sitting in the chimney-corner. "'Mrs. Joe has been out a dozen times, looking for you, Pip, and she's out now, making it a baker's dozen.' "'Is she?' "'Yes, Pip,' said Joe. "'And what's worse, she's got Tickler with her.' At this dismal intelligence I twisted the only button on my waistcoat round and round, and looked in great depression at the fire. Tickler was a wax-ended piece of cane, worn smooth by collision with my tickled frame. "'She sat down,' said Joe, "'and she got up, and she made a grab at Tickler, and she rampaged out. That's what she did.' said Joe, slowly clearing the fire between the lower bars with the poker, and looking at it. She rampaged out, Pip. "'Has she been gone long, Joe?' I always treated him as a larger species of child, and as no more than my equal. "'Well,' said Joe, glancing up at the Dutch clock, "'she's been on the rampage this last bell about five minutes, Pip.' "'She's a-comin'. Get behind the door, old chap, and have the jack-towel betwixt you.' I took the advice. My sister, Mrs. Joe, throwing the door wide open, and finding an obstruction behind it, immediately divined the cause, and applied Tickler to its further investigation. She concluded by throwing me—I often served as a connubial missile—at Joe, who, glad to get hold of me on any terms— passed me on into the chimney, and quietly fenced me up there with his great leg. "'Where have you been, you young monkey?' said Mrs. Joe, stamping her foot. "'Tell me directly what you've been doing to wear me away with fret and fright and worry, or I'll have you out of that corner if you was fifty pips, and he was five hundred gargaries.' "'I have only been to the churchyard,' said I, from my stool, crying and rubbing myself. "'Churchyard!' repeated my sister. "'If it weren't for me, you'd have been to the churchyard long ago, and stayed there. Who brought you up by hand?' "'You did,' said I. "'And why did I do it, I should like to know?' exclaimed my sister. I whimpered, "'I don't know.' "'I don't,' said my sister. "'I'd never do it again.' I know that I may truly say that I've never had this apron of mine off since born you were. It's bad enough to be a blacksmith's wife, and him a gargery, without being your mother. My thoughts strayed from that question as I looked disconsolately at the fire. For the fugitive out on the marshes with the ironed leg, the mysterious young man, the file, the food— and the dreadful pledge I was under to commit a larceny on those sheltering premises— rose before me in the avenging coals. Ha! said Mrs. Joe, restoring Tickler to his station. Churchyard, indeed! You may well say churchyard, you two. One of us, by the by, had not said it at all. You'll drive me to the churchyard betwixt you, one of these days, and, oh, a precious pair you'd be without me! As she applied herself to set the tea-things, Joe peeped down at me over his leg, as if he were mentally casting me and himself up, and calculating what kind of pair we practically should make, under the grievous circumstances foreshadowed. After that, he sat feeling his right side flaxen curls and whiskers, and following Mrs. Joe about with his blue eyes, as his manner always was at squally times. My sister had a trenchant way of cutting our bread and butter for us, that never varied. First, with her left hand, she jammed the loaf hard and fast against her bib, where it sometimes got a pin into it, and sometimes a needle, which we afterwards got into our mouths. Then she took some butter, not too much, on a knife, and spread it on the loaf, in an apothecary kind of way, as if she were making a plaster, 
using both sides of the knife with a slapping dexterity, and trimming and moulding the butter off round the crust. Then she gave the knife a final smart wipe on the edge of the plaster, and then sawed a very thick round off the loaf, which she finally, before separating from the loaf, hewed into two halves, of which Joe got one, and I the other. On the present occasion, though I was hungry, I dared not eat my slice. I felt that I must have something in reserve for my dreadful acquaintance, and his ally the still more dreadful young man. I knew Mrs. Joe's housekeeping to be of the strictest kind, and that my larcenous researches might find nothing available in the safe. Therefore I resolved to put my hunk of bread and butter down the leg of my trousers. The effort of resolution necessary to the achievement of this purpose I found to be quite awful. It was as if I had to make up my mind to leap from the top of a high house, or plunge into a great depth of water, and it was made the more difficult by the unconscious Joe. In our already mentioned Freemasonry as fellow-sufferers, and in his good-natured companionship with me, it was our evening habit to compare the way we bit through our slices by silently holding them up to each other's admiration now and then, which stimulated us to new exertions. To-night, Joe several times invited me, by the display of his fast diminishing slice, to enter upon our usual friendly competition, but he found me each time, with my yellow mug of tea on one knee, and my untouched bread and butter on the other. At last, I desperately considered that the thing I contemplated must be done, and that it had best be done in the least improbable manner consistent with the circumstances. I took advantage of a moment when Joe had just looked at me, and got my bread and butter down my leg. Joe was evidently made uncomfortable by what he supposed to be my loss of appetite, and took a thoughtful bite out of his slice, which he didn't seem to enjoy. He turned it about in his mouth much longer than usual, pondering over it a good deal, and after all gulped it down like a pill. He was about to take another bite, and had just got his head on one side for a good purchase on it, when his eye fell on me, and he saw that my bread and butter was gone. The wonder and consternation with which Joe stopped on the threshold of his bite and stared at me were too evident to escape my sister's observation. "'What's the matter now?' said she, smartly, as she put down her cup. "'I say, you know,' muttered Joe, shaking his head at me in very serious remonstrance, "'Pip, old chap!' You'll do yourself a mischief. It'll stick somewhere. You can't have chewed it, Pip. What's the matter now? repeated my sister, more sharply than before. If you can cough any trifle of it up, Pip, I'd recommend you to do it, said Joe, all aghast. Manners is manners, but still your elf's your elf. By this time my sister was quite desperate. So she pounced on Joe, and, taking him by the two whiskers, knocked his head for a little while against the wall behind him, while I sat in the corner, looking guiltily on. "'Now perhaps you'll mention what's the matter,' said my sister, out of breath. "'You staring great stuck pig!' Joe looked at her in a helpless way, then took a helpless bite, and looked at me again. "'You know, Pip,' said Joe, solemnly, with his last bite in his cheek, and speaking in a confidential voice, as if we two were quite alone. "'You and me is always friends, and I'd be the last to tell upon you any time. But such a—' He moved his chair, and looked about the floor between us, and then again at me. "'Such a most uncommon bolt as that!' "'Been bolting his food, has he?' cried my sister. "'You know, old chap,' said Joe, looking at me and not at Mrs. Joe, with his bite still in his cheek, "'I bolted myself when I was your age, frequent, and as a boy I've been among a many bolters. But I never seen your bolting equal yet, Pip, and it's a mercy you ain't bolted dead.' My sister made a dive at me, 
and fish me up by the hair, saying nothing more than the awful words, "'You come along and be dosed!' Some medical beast had revived tar-water in those days as a fine medicine, and Mrs. Joe always kept a supply of it in the cupboard, having a belief in its virtues correspondent to its nastiness. At the best of times, so much of this elixir was administered to me as a choice restorative, that I was conscious of going about smelling like a new fence. On this particular evening the urgency of my case demanded a pint of this mixture, which was poured down my throat, for my greater comfort, while Mrs. Joe held my head under her arm, as a boot would be held in a boot-jack. Joe got off with half a pint, but was made to swallow that, much to his disturbance, as he sat slowly munching and meditating before the fire because he had had a turn. Judging from myself, I should say he certainly had a turn afterwards, if he had had none before. Conscience is a dreadful thing when it accurses man or boy, but when, in the case of a boy, that secret burden cooperates with another secret burden down the leg of his trousers, it is, as I can testify, a great punishment." the guilty knowledge that I was going to rob Mrs. Joe. I never thought I was going to rob Joe, for I never thought of any of the housekeeping property as his. United to the necessity of always keeping one hand on my bread and butter as I sat, or when I was ordered about the kitchen on any small errand, almost drove me out of my mind. Then, as the marsh winds made the fire glow and flare, I thought I heard the voice outside, of the man with the iron on his leg who had sworn me to secrecy, declaring that he couldn't and wouldn't starve until to-morrow, but must be fed now. At other times, I thought, what if the young man who was with so much difficulty restrained from imbruing his hands in me should yield to a constitutional impatience, or should mistake the time, and should think himself accredited to my heart and liver to-night instead of to-morrow? If ever anybody's hair stood on end with terror, mine must have done so then. But, perhaps, nobody's ever did? It was Christmas Eve, and I had to stir the pudding for next day, with a copper stick, from seven to eight by the Dutch clock. I tried it with the load upon my leg, and that made me think afresh of the man with the load on his leg and found the tendency of exercise to bring the bread and butter out at my ankle quite unmanageable. Happily I slipped away, and deposited that part of my conscience in my garret bedroom. "'Hark!' said I, when I had done my stirring, and was taking a final warm in the chimney-corner before being sent up to bed. "'Was that great guns, Joe?' "'Ah!' said Joe. "'There's another convict off. "'What does that mean, Joe?' said I. Mrs. Joe, who always took explanations upon herself, said, snappishly, "'Escaped! Escaped!' administering the definition like tar-water. While Mrs. Joe sat with her head bending over her needlework, I put my mouth into the forms of saying to Joe, "'What's a convict?' Joe put his mouth into the forms of returning such a highly elaborate answer, that I could make out nothing of it but the single word, Pip. "'There was a convict off last night,' said Joe aloud, "'after sunset gun, and they fired warning of him, and now it appears they're firing warning of another.' "'Who's firing?' said I. "'Drat that boy!' interposed my sister, frowning at me over her work. "'What a questioner he is!' Ask no questions, and you'll be told no lies. It was not very polite to herself, I thought, to imply that I should be told lies by her, even if I did ask questions. But she never was polite, unless there was company. At this point Joe greatly augmented my curiosity by taking the utmost pains to open his mouth very wide, and to put it into the form of a word that looked to me like sulks. Therefore I naturally pointed to Mrs. Joe, and put my mouth into the form of saying, Her? But Joe wouldn't hear of that at all, and again opened his mouth very wide, and shook the form of a most emphatic word out of it, 
but I could make nothing of the word. "'Mrs. Joe,' said I, as a last resort, "'I should like to know, if you wouldn't much mind, where the firing comes from.' "'Lord bless the boy!' exclaimed my sister, as if she didn't quite mean that, but rather the contrary. "'From the hulks!' "'Oh!' said I, looking at Joe. "'Hulks!' Joe gave a reproachful cough, as much as to say, "'Well, I told you so.' "'And please, what's hulks?' said I. "'That's the way with this boy!' exclaimed my sister, pointing me out with her needle and thread, and shaking her head at me. "'Answer him one question, and he'll ask you a dozen directly. "'Hulks are prison ships, right across the meshes.' We always used that name for marshes in our country. "'I wonder who's put into prison ships, and why they're put there?' said I, in a general way, and with quiet desperation. It was too much for Mrs. Joe, who immediately rose. "'I tell you what, young fellow,' said she, "'I didn't bring you up by hand to badger people's lives out. It would be blame to me, and not praise, if I had. People are put into hulks because they murder, and because they rob and forge and do all sorts of bad, and they always begin by asking questions. Now you get along to bed.' I was never allowed a candle to light me to bed and as I went upstairs in the dark, with my head tingling, from Mrs. Joe's thimble being played the tambourine upon it, to accompany her last words, I felt fearfully sensible of the great convenience that the hulks were handy for me. I was clearly on my way there. I had begun by asking questions, and I was going to rob Mrs. Joe. Since that time, which is far enough away now, I have often thought that few people know what secrecy there is in the young under terror, no matter how unreasonable the terror, so that it be terror. I was in mortal terror of the young man who wanted my heart and liver. I was in mortal terror of my interlocutor with the iron leg. I was in mortal terror of myself, from whom an awful promise had been extracted. I had no hope of deliverance through my all-powerful sister who repulsed me at every turn. I am afraid to think of what I might have done on requirement, in the secrecy of my terror. If I slept at all that night, it was only to imagine myself drifting down the river on a strong spring tide, to the hulks, a ghostly pirate calling out to me through a speaking trumpet, as I passed the gibbet station, that I had better come ashore and be hanged there at once, and not put it off. I was afraid to sleep, even if I had been inclined, for I knew that at the first faint dawn of morning I must rob the pantry. There was no doing it in the night, for there was no getting a light by easy friction then. To have got one I must have struck it out of flint and steel, and have made a noise like the very pirate himself rattling his chains. As soon as the great black velvet pall outside my little window was shot with grey, I got up and went downstairs, every board upon the way, and every crack in every board calling after me, STOP, THIEF! and GET UP, MRS. JOE! In the pantry, which was far more abundantly supplied than usual, owing to the season, I was very much alarmed by a hare hanging up by the heels, whom I rather thought I caught when my back was half-turned, winking. I had no time for verification. No time for selection, no time for anything, for I had no time to spare. I stole some bread, some rind of cheese, about half a jar of mincemeat, which I tied up in my pocket-handkerchief with my last night's slice, some brandy from a stone bottle, which I decanted into a glass bottle I had secretly used for making that intoxicating fluid, Spanish licorice water, up in my room diluting the stone bottle from a jug in the kitchen cupboard. A meat bone with very little on it, and a beautiful round, compact pork pie. I was nearly going away without the pie, but I was tempted to mount upon a shelf, to look what it was that was put away so carefully in a covered earthenware dish in a corner, and I found it was the pie, and I took it in the hope that it was not intended for early use, 
and would not be missed for some time. There was a door in the kitchen, communicating with the forge. I unlocked and unbolted that door, and got a file from among Joe's tools. Then I put the fastenings as I had found them, opened the door at which I had entered when I ran home last night, shut it, and ran for the misty marshes. End of chapter Chapter Three of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter Three. It was a rainy morning and very damp. I had seen the damp lying on the outside of my little window, as if some goblin had been crying there all night, and using the window for a pocket-handkerchief. Now I saw the damp lying on the bare hedges and spare grass, like a coarser sort of spider's webs, hanging itself from twig to twig and blade to blade. On every rail and gate wet lay clammy, and the marsh mist was so thick that the wooden finger on the post directing people to our village a direction which they never accepted, for they never came there, was invisible to me until I was quite close under it. Then, as I looked up at it, while it dripped, it seemed to my oppressed conscience like a phantom devoting me to the hulks. The mist was heavier yet when I got out upon the marshes, so that instead of my running at everything, everything seemed to run at me. This was very disagreeable to a guilty mind. The gates and dikes and banks came bursting at me through the mist, as if they cried as plainly as could be, A boy with somebody else's pork pie! Stop him! The cattle came upon me with like suddenness, staring out of their eyes, and steaming out of their nostrils, Halloo, young thief! One black ox, with a white cravat on, who even had to my awakened conscience something of a clerical air, fixed me so obstinately with his eyes, and moved his blunt head round in such an accusatory manner as I moved round, that I blubbered out to him, "'I couldn't help it, sir. It wasn't for myself I took it.' Upon which he put down his head, blew a cloud of smoke out of his nose, and vanished with a kick-up of his hind legs and a flourish of his tail. All this time I was getting on towards the river, but however fast I went I couldn't warm my feet to which the damp cold seemed riveted, as the iron was riveted to the leg of the man I was running to meet. I knew my way to the battery, pretty straight, for I had been down there on a Sunday with Joe, and Joe, sitting on an old gun, had told me that when I was prentice to him, regularly bound, we would have such larks there. However, in the confusion of the mist I found myself at last too far to the right, and consequently had to try back along the river-side, on the bank of loose stones, above the mud and the stakes that staked the tide out. Making my way along here with all dispatch, I had just crossed a ditch which I knew to be very near the battery, and had just scrambled up the mound beyond the ditch, when I saw the man sitting before me. His back was towards me, and he had his arms folded, and was nodding forward, heavy with sleep. I thought he would be more glad if I came upon him with his breakfast, in that unexpected manner, so I went forward softly and touched him on the shoulder. He instantly jumped up, and it was not the same man, but another man. And yet this man was dressed in coarse grey, too, and had a great iron on his leg, and was lame, and hoarse, and cold, and was everything that the other man was, except that he had not the same face and had a flat, broad-brimmed, low-crowned felt hat on. All this I saw in a moment, for I had only a moment to see it in. He swore an oath at me, made a hit at me. It was a round, weak blow that missed me, and almost knocked himself down, for it made him stumble, and then he ran into the mist, stumbling twice as he went, and I lost him. "'It's the young man,' I thought, feeling my heart shoot as I identified him. I dare say I should have felt a pain in my liver, too, 
if I had known where it was. I was soon at the battery after that, and there was the right man, hugging himself and limping to and fro, as if he had never all night left off hugging and limping, waiting for me. He was awfully cold, to be sure. I half expected to see him drop down before my face and die of deadly cold. His eyes looked so awfully hungry, too, that when I handed him the file and he laid it down on the grass, it occurred to me he would have tried to eat it if he had not seen my bundle. He did not turn me upside down this time to get at what I had, but left me right side upwards while I opened the bundle and emptied my pockets. "'What's in the bottle, boy?' said he. "'Brandy,' said I. He was already handing mincemeat down his throat in a most curious manner, more like a man who was putting it away somewhere in a violent hurry than a man who was eating it, but he left off to take some of the liquor. He shivered all the while so violently that it was quite as much as he could do to keep the neck of the bottle between his teeth without biting it off. "'I think you have got the ague,' said I. "'I'm much of your opinion, boy,' said he. "'It's bad about here,' I told him. "'You've been lying out on the meshes, and they're dreadful aguish. Rheumatic, too.' "'I'll eat my breakfast afore they're the death of me,' said he. "'I'd do that, if I was going to be strung up to that there gallows as there is over there, directly afterwards. I'll beat the shivers so far, I'll bet you.' He was gobbling mincemeat, meat-bone, bread, cheese, and pork-pie, all at once, staring distrustfully while he did so at the mist all around us, and often stopping, even stopping his jaws to listen. Some real or fancied sound, some clink upon the river, or breathing of beast upon the marsh, now gave him a start, and he said suddenly, "'You're not a deceiving imp. You brought no one with you?' "'No, sir, no!' "'Nor give no one the office to follow you?' "'No!' "'Well,' said he, "'I believe you.' You'd be but a fierce young hound indeed, if at your time of life you could help to hunt a wretched varmint, hunted as near death and dunghill as this poor wretched varmint is. Something clicked in his throat, as if he had works in him like a clock, and was going to strike, and he smeared his ragged rough sleeve over his eyes. Pitying his desolation, and watching him as he gradually settled down upon the pie, I made bold to say— I'm glad you enjoy it. Did you speak? I said I was glad you enjoyed it. Thank ye, my boy. I do. I had often watched a large dog of ours eating his food, and I now noticed a decided similarity between the dog's way of eating and the man's. The man took strong, sharp, sudden bites, just like the dog. He swallowed, or rather snapped up, every mouthful, too soon and too fast, and he looked sideways here and there while he ate, as if he thought there was danger in every direction of somebody's coming to take the pie away. He was altogether too unsettled in his mind over it, to appreciate it comfortably, I thought, or to have anybody to dine with him, without making a chop with his jaws at the visitor, in all of which particulars he was very like the dog." "'I am afraid you won't leave any of it for him,' said I, timidly, after a silence during which I had hesitated as to the politeness of making the remark. "'There's no more to be got where that came from.' It was the certainty of this fact that impelled me to offer the hint. "'Leave any for him? Who's him?' said my friend, stopping in his crunching of pie-crust. "'The young man that you spoke of. That was hid with you. Oh, ah, 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 he returned, with something like a gruff laugh. Him? <laughs> yes, yes, he don't want no whittles. I thought he looked as if he did, said I. The man stopped eating and regarded me with the keenest scrutiny and the greatest surprise. Looked? When? Just now. Where? Yonder, said I, pointing. Over there, where I found him nodding asleep, 
and thought it was you. He held me by the collar and stared at me so that I began to think his first idea about cutting my throat had revived. Dressed like you, you know, only with a hat, I explained, trembling, and, and, I was very anxious to put this delicately, and with the same reason for wanting to borrow a file. Didn't you hear the cannon last night? Then there was firing, he said to himself. I wonder you shouldn't have been sure of that, I returned, for we heard it up at home, and that's farther away, and we were shut in besides. Why, see now, said he, when a man's alone on these flats, with a light head and a light stomach, perishing a cold in want, he hears nothing all night but guns firing and voices calling. Hears? He sees the soldiers, with their red coats lighted up by the torches carried afore, closing in round him. Hears his number called, hears himself challenged, hears the rattle of the muskets, hears the orders, make ready, present, cover him steady, men, and his laid hands on, and there's nothing. Why, if I see one pursuing party last night, Coming up in order, damn em, with their tramp, tramp, I see a hundred. And as to firing, why, I see the mist shake with the cannon, arter it with broad day. But this man, he had said all the rest, as if he had forgotten my being there. Did you notice anything in him? He had a badly bruised face, said I, recalling what I hardly knew I knew. Not here! exclaimed the man, striking his left cheek mercilessly with the flat of his hand. "'Yes, there. Where is he?' He crammed what little food was left into the breast of his grey jacket. "'Show me the way he went. I'll pull him down like a bloodhound. Curse this iron on my sore leg. Give us hold of the file, boy.' I indicated in what direction the mist had shrouded the other man, and he looked up at it for an instant but he was down on the rank wet grass, filing at his iron like a madman, and not minding me, or minding his own leg, which had an old chafe upon it and was bloody, but which he handled as roughly as if it had no more feeling in it than the file. I was very much afraid of him again, now that he had worked himself into this fierce hurry, and I was likewise very much afraid of keeping away from home any longer. I told him I must go, but he took no notice so I thought the best thing I could do was to slip off. The last I saw of him, his head was bent over his knee, and he was working hard at his fetter, muttering impatient imprecations at it and at his leg. The last I heard of him, I stopped in the mist to listen, and the file was still going. End of chapter Chapter Four of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter Four. I fully expected to find a constable in the kitchen, waiting to take me up. But not only was there no constable there, but no discovery had yet been made of the robbery. Mrs. Joe was prodigiously busy in getting the house ready for the festivities of the day, and Joe had been put upon the kitchen doorstep to keep him out of the dustpan, an article into which his destiny always led him, sooner or later, when my sister was vigorously reaping the floors of her establishment. "'And where the deuce have you been?' was Mrs. Joe's Christmas salutation, when I and my conscience showed ourselves. I said I had been down to hear the carols. "'Ah, well,' observed Mrs. Joe, "'you might have done worse. Not a doubt of that, I thought. "'Perhaps if I warn't a blacksmith's wife, and, what's the same thing, a slave with her apron never off, I should have been to hear the carols,' said Mrs. Joe. I'm rather partial to carols myself, and that's the best of reasons for my never hearing any. 
Joe, who had ventured into the kitchen after me, as the dustpan had retired before us, drew the back of his hand across his nose with a conciliatory air, when Mrs. Joe darted a look at him, and, when her eyes were withdrawn, secretly crossed his two forefingers, and exhibited them to me, as our token that Mrs. Joe was in a cross temper. This was so much her normal state, that Joe and I would often, for weeks together, be, as to our fingers, like monumental crusaders as to their legs. We were to have a superb dinner, consisting of a leg of pickled pork and greens, and a pair of roast-stuffed fowls. A handsome mince-pie had been made yesterday morning, which accounted for the mince-meat not being missed, and the pudding was already on the boil. These extensive arrangements occasioned us to be cut off unceremoniously in respect of breakfast. "'For I ain't,' said Mrs. Joe, "'I ain't a-going to have no formal cramming and busting and washing up now, with what I've got before me, I promise you.' So we had our slices served out, as if we were two thousand troops on a forced march instead of a man and boy at home, and we took gulps of milk and water, with apologetic countenances, from a jug on the dresser. In the meantime, Mrs. Joe put clean white curtains up, and tacked a new flowered flounce across the wide chimney to replace the old one, and uncovered the little state parlour across the passage, which was never uncovered at any other time, but passed the rest of the year in a cool haze of silver paper, which even extended to the four little white crockery poodles on the mantel-shelf, each with a black nose and a basket of flowers in his mouth, and each the counterpart of the other. Mrs. Joe was a very clean housekeeper, but had an exquisite art of making her cleanliness more uncomfortable and unacceptable than dirt itself. Cleanliness is next to godliness, and some people do the same by their religion. My sister, having so much to do, was going to church vicariously. That is to say, Joe and I were going. In his working clothes, Joe was a well-knit, characteristic-looking blacksmith. In his holiday clothes, he was more like a scarecrow in good circumstances than anything else. Nothing that he wore then fitted him or seemed to belong to him, and everything that he wore then grazed him. On the present festive occasion, he emerged from his room, when the blithe bells were going, the picture of misery, in a full suit of Sunday penitentials. As to me, I think my sister must have had some general idea that I was a young offender whom an accoucheur policeman had taken up on my birthday and delivered over to her, to be dealt with according to the outraged majesty of the law. I was always treated as if I had insisted on being born in opposition to the dictates of reason, religion, and morality, and against the dissuading arguments of my best friends. Even when I was taken to have a new suit of clothes, the tailor had orders to make them like a kind of reformatory, and on no account to let me have the free use of my limbs. Joe and I going to church, therefore, must have been a moving spectacle for compassionate minds. Yet, what I suffered outside was nothing to what I underwent within. The terrors that had assailed me whenever Mrs. Joe had gone near the pantry, or out of the room, were only to be equalled by the remorse with which my mind dwelt on what my hands had done. Under the weight of my wicked secret, I pondered whether the church would be powerful enough to shield me from the vengeance of the terrible young man, if I divulged to that establishment. I conceived the idea that the time when the bands were read, and when the clergyman said, "'You are now to declare it,' would be the time for me to rise and propose a private conference in the vestry. I am far from being sure that I might not have astonished our small congregation by resorting to this extreme measure, but for its being Christmas Day and no Sunday. Mr. Wopsle, the clerk at church, was to dine with us, and Mr. Hubble the wheelwright, and Mrs. Hubble, and Uncle Pumblechook, Joe's uncle, but Mrs. Joe appropriated him, who was a well-to-do corn-chandler in the nearest town, and drove his own chaise cart. The dinner hour was half past one. When Joe and I got home, we found the table laid, and Mrs. Joe dressed, and the dinner dressing, and the front door unlocked, it never was at any other time, 
for the company to enter by, and everything most splendid, and still not a word of the robbery. The time came, without bringing with it any relief to my feelings, and the company came. Mr. Wopsle, united to a Roman nose and a large shining bald forehead, had a deep voice, which he was uncommonly proud of. Indeed, it was understood among his acquaintance that if you could only give him his head, he would read the clergyman into fits. He himself confessed that if the church was thrown open, meaning to competition, he would not despair of making his mark in it. The church not being thrown open, he was, as I have said, our clerk. But he punished the amens tremendously, and when he gave out the psalm, always giving the whole verse, he looked all round the congregation first as much as to say, "'You have heard my friend overhead. Oblige me with your opinion of this style.' I opened the door to the company, making believe that it was a habit of ours to open that door, and I opened it first to Mr. Wopsle, next to Mr. and Mrs. Hubble, and last of all to Uncle Pumblechook. N.B. I was not allowed to call him Uncle under the severest penalties. And Mrs. Joe, said Uncle Pumblechook, a large, hard-breathing, middle-aged, slow man, with a mouth like a fish, dull staring eyes, and sandy hair standing upright on his head, so that he looked as if he had just been all but choked, and had that moment come to. I have brought you as the compliments of the season. I have brought you, Mum, a bottle of sherry wine, and I have brought you, Mum, a bottle of port wine. Every Christmas day he presented himself as a profound novelty, with exactly the same words, and carrying the two bottles like dumbbells. Every Christmas day Mrs. Joe replied, as she now replied, "'Oh, Uncle Pumble Chook, this is kind!' Every Christmas day he retorted, as he now retorted, "'It's no more than your merits, and now are you all bobbish?' and how's sixpenworth of halfpence, meaning me. We dined on these occasions in the kitchen, and adjourned, for the nuts and oranges and apples, to the parlour, which was a change very like Joe's change from his working clothes to his Sunday dress. My sister was uncommonly lively on the present occasion, and indeed was generally more gracious in the society of Mrs. Hubble than in other company. I remember Mrs. Hubble as a little curly, sharp-edged person in sky-blue, who held a conventionally juvenile position, because she had married Mr. Hubble, I don't know at what remote period, when she was much younger than he. I remember Mr. Hubble as a tough, high-shouldered, stooping old man, of a sawdusty fragrance, with his legs extraordinarily wide apart so that in my short days I always saw some miles of open country between them when I met him coming up the lane. Among this good company I should have felt myself, even if I hadn't robbed the pantry, in a false position. Not because I was squeezed in at an acute angle of the tablecloth, with the table in my chest, and the pumblechookian elbow in my eye, nor because I was not allowed to speak, I didn't want to speak, nor because I was regaled with the scaly tips of the drumsticks of the fowls, and with those obscure corners of pork of which the pig, when living, had had the least reason to be vain. No, I should not have minded that, if they would only have left me alone. But they wouldn't leave me alone. They seemed to think the opportunity lost, if they failed to point the conversation at me, every now and then, and stick the point into me. I might have been an unfortunate little bull in a Spanish arena, I got so smartingly touched up by these moral goads. It began the moment we sat down to dinner. Mr. Wopsle said grace with theatrical declamation, as it now appears to me, something like a religious cross of the ghost in Hamlet with Richard the Third, and ended with the very proper aspiration that we might be truly grateful upon which my sister fixed me with her eye, and said in a low reproachful voice, "'Do you hear that? Be grateful!' "'Especially,' said Mr. Pumblechook, 
be grateful, boy, to them which brought you up by hand. Mrs. Hubble shook her head, and contemplating me with a mournful presentiment that I should come to no good, asked, Why is it that the young are never grateful? This moral mystery seemed too much for the company, until Mr. Hubble tersely solved it by saying, Naturally vicious. Everybody then murmured, True, and looked at me in a particularly unpleasant and personal manner. Joe's station and influence were something feebler, if possible, when there was company, than when there was none. But he always aided and comforted me when he could, in some way of his own, and he always did so at dinner-time by giving me gravy, if there were any. There being plenty of gravy to-day, Joe spooned into my plate at this point about half a pint. A little later on in the dinner Mr. Wopsle reviewed the sermon with some severity, and intimated— in the usual hypothetical case of the church being thrown open, what kind of sermon he would have given them. After favouring them with some heads of that discourse, he remarked that he considered the subject of the day's homily ill-chosen, which was the less excusable, he added, when there were so many subjects going about. "'True again,' said Uncle Pumblechook. "'You've hit it, sir. Plenty of subjects going about.' for them that know how to put salt upon their tails. That's what's wanted. A man needn't go far to find a subject, if he's ready with his salt-box. Mr. Pumblechook added, after a short interval of reflection, Look at poor Cologne. There's a subject. If you want a subject, look at pork. True, sir. Many a moral for the young returned Mr. Wopsle, and I knew he was going to lug me in before he said it. Might be deduced from that text. "'You listen to this,' said my sister to me, in a severe parenthesis. Joe gave me some more gravy. "'Swine,' pursued Mr. Wopsle, in his deepest voice, and pointing his fork at my blushes, as if he were mentioning my Christian name, Swine were the comparisons of the prodigal. The gluttony of swine is put before us, as an example to the young. I thought this pretty well in him, who had been praising up the pork for being so plump and juicy. What is detestable in a pig is more detestable in a boy. Or girl, suggested Mr. Hubble. Of course, or girl, Mr. Hubble assented Mr. Wopsle, rather irritably. "'But there is no girl present.' "'Besides,' said Mr. Pumblechook, turning sharp on me, "'think what you've got to be grateful for, if you'd been born a squeaker.' "'He was, if ever a child was,' said my sister, most emphatically. Joe gave me some more gravy." "'Well, I mean a four-footed squeaker,' said Mr. Pumblechook. "'If you had been born such, would you have been here now? Not you?' "'Unless in that form,' said Mr. Wopsle, nodding towards the dish. "'But I don't mean in that form, sir,' returned Mr. Pumblechook, who had an objection to being interrupted. "'I mean—' enjoying himself with his elders and betters, and improving himself with their conversation, and rolling in the lap of luxury. Would he have been doing that? No, he wouldn't. And what would have been your destination? Turning on me again. You would have been disposed of for so many shillings, according to the market price of the article, and Dunstable the butcher would have come up to you as you lay in your straw, and he would have whipped you under his left arm, and with his right he would have tucked up his frock to get a penknife from out of his waistcoat pocket, and he would have shed your blood and had your life. No bringing up by hand then, not a bit of it. Joe offered me more gravy, which I was afraid to take. "'He was a world of trouble to you, ma'am,' said Mrs. Hubble, commiserating my sister. "'Trouble?' echoed my sister. 
trouble, and then entered on a fearful catalogue of all the illnesses I had been guilty of, and all the acts of sleeplessness I had committed, and all the high places I had tumbled from, and all the low places I had tumbled into, and all the injuries I had done myself, and all the times she had wished me in my grave, and I had contumaciously refused to go there. I think the Romans must have aggravated one another very much with their noses. Perhaps they became the restless people they were in consequence. Anyhow, Mr. Wopsle's Roman nose so aggravated me, during the recital of my misdemeanours, that I should have liked to pull it until he howled. But all I had endured up to this time was nothing in comparison with the awful feelings that took possession of me, when the pause was broken which ensued upon my sister's recital, and in which pause everybody had looked at me, as I felt painfully conscious, with indignation and abhorrence. Yet, said Mr. Pumblechook, leading the company gently back to the theme from which they had strayed, pork, regarded as wild, is rich too, ain't it? Have a little brandy, uncle said my sister. Oh, heavens, it had come at last. He would find it was weak. He would say it was weak, and I was lost. I held tight to the leg of the table under the cloth with both hands, and awaited my fate. My sister went for the stone bottle, came back with the stone bottle, and poured his brandy out, no one else taking any. The wretched man trifled with his glass, took it up, looked at it through the light put it down, prolonged my misery. All this time Mrs. Joe and Joe were briskly clearing the table for the pie and pudding. I couldn't keep my eyes off him. Always holding tight by the leg of the table with my hands and feet, I saw the miserable creature finger his glass playfully, take it up, smile, throw his head back, and drink the brandy off. Instantly afterwards, the company were seized with unspeakable consternation, owing to his springing to his feet, turning round several times in an appalling spasmodic whooping-cough dance, and rushing out at the door. He then became visible through the window, violently plunging and expectorating, making the most hideous faces, and apparently out of his mind. I held on tight while Mrs. Joe and Joe ran to him. I didn't know how I had done it, but I had no doubt I had murdered him somehow. In my dreadful situation it was a relief when he was brought back, and surveying the company all round as if they had disagreed with him, sank down into his chair with one significant gasp. Tar! I had filled up the bottle from the tar-water jug. I knew he would be worse by and by. I moved the table like a medium of the present day, by the vigour of my unseen hold upon it. "'Tar!' cried my sister, in amazement. "'Why, how could ever Tar come there?' But Uncle Pumblechook, who was omnipotent in that kitchen, wouldn't hear the word, wouldn't hear of the subject, imperiously waved it all away with his hand, and asked for hot gin and water. My sister, who had begun to be alarmingly meditative, had to employ herself actively in getting the gin, the hot water, the sugar, and the lemon peel, and mixing them. For the time being, at least, I was saved. I still held on to the leg of the table, but clutched it now with the fervour of gratitude. By degrees I became calm enough to release my grasp and partake of pudding. Mr. Pumblechook partook of pudding. All partook of pudding. The course terminated, and Mr. Pembelchuk had begun to beam under the genial influence of gin and water. I began to think I should get over the day, when my sister said to Joe, "'Clean plates! Cold!' I clutched the leg of the table again immediately, and pressed it to my bosom, as if it had been the companion of my youth and friend of my soul. I foresaw what was coming, and I felt that this time I really was gone." "'You must taste,' said my sister, addressing the guests with her best grace, "'you must taste, to finish with, such a delightful and delicious present of Uncle Pumblechook's.' "'Must they?' 
let them not hope to taste it. "'You must know,' said my sister, rising, "'it's a pie, a savoury pork pie.' The company murmured their compliments. Uncle Pumblechook, sensible of having deserved well of his fellow-creatures, said, quite vivaciously, all things considered, "'Well, Mrs. Joe, we'll do our best endeavours. Let us have a cut at this same pie.' My sister went out to get it. I heard her steps proceed to the pantry. I saw Mr. Pumblechook balance his knife. I saw reawakening appetite in the Roman nostrils of Mr. Wopsle. I heard Mr. Hubble remark that a bit of savoury pork pie would lay atop of anything you could mention and do no harm. And I heard Joe say, You shall have some, Pip. I have never been absolutely certain whether I uttered a shrill yell of terror, merely in spirit, or in the bodily hearing of the company. I felt that I could bear no more, and that I must run away. I released the leg of the table, and ran for my life. But I ran no farther than the house door, for there I ran head foremost into a party of soldiers with their muskets, one of whom held out a pair of handcuffs to me, saying, here you are. Look sharp. Come on. End of chapter. Chapter Five of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens Chapter 5 The apparition of a file of soldiers ringing down the butt-ends of their loaded muskets on our doorstep caused the dinner-party to rise from table in confusion, and caused Mrs. Joe re-entering the kitchen empty-handed to stop short and stare, and her wondering lament of, "'Gracious goodness, gracious me! What's gone with the pie?' The sergeant and I were in the kitchen when Mrs. Joe stood staring, at which crisis I partially recovered the use of my senses. It was the sergeant who had spoken to me, and he was now looking round at the company, with his handcuffs invitingly extended towards them in his right hand, and his left on my shoulder. "'Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen,' said the sergeant. But as I have mentioned at the door to this smart young shaver, which he hadn't, I am on a chase in the name of the king, and I want the blacksmith. And pray what might you want with him? retorted my sister, quick to resent his being wanted at all. Missus, returned the gallant sergeant, speaking for myself, I should reply, the honour and pleasure of his fine wife's acquaintance, speaking for the king, I answer, a little job done. This was received as rather neat in the sergeant, insomuch that Mr. Pumblechook cried audibly, Good again! You'll see, blacksmith, said the sergeant, who had by this time picked out Joe with his eye. We have had an accident with these, and I find the lock of one of them goes wrong, and the coupling don't act pretty. As they are wanted for immediate service, will you throw your eye over them? Joe threw his eye over them, and pronounced that the job would necessitate the lighting of his forge-fire, and would take nearer two hours than one. "'Will it? Then will you set about it at once, blacksmith?' said the off-hand sergeant, "'as it's on His Majesty's service. And if my men can bear a hand anywhere, they'll make themselves useful.' With that he called to his men, who came trooping into the kitchen one after another, and piled their arms in a corner and then they stood about, as soldiers do, now with their hands loosely clasped before them, now resting a knee or a shoulder, now easing a belt or a pouch, now opening the door to spit stiffly over their high stocks out into the yard. All these things I saw without then knowing that I saw them, for I was in an agony of apprehension, but beginning to perceive that the handcuffs were not for me, and that the military had so far got the better of the pie as to put it in the background, I collected a little more of my scattered wits. "'Will you give me the time?' said the sergeant, addressing himself to Mr. Pumblechook, 
as to a man whose appreciative powers justified the inference that he was equal to the time. "'It's just gone half-past two. "'That's not so bad,' said the sergeant, reflecting. "'Even if I was forced to halt here nigh two hours, that'll do. "'How far might you call yourselves from the marshes hereabout? "'Not above a mile, I reckon?' "'Just a mile,' said Mrs. Joe. "'That'll do. "'We begin to close in upon em about dusk. "'A little before dusk, my orders are. "'That'll do.' "'Convicts, Sergeant?' asked Mr. Wopsle, in a matter-of-course way. "'Aye,' returned the sergeant. Two. They're pretty well known to be out on the marshes still, and they won't try to get clear of them before dusk. Anybody here seen anything of any such game? Everybody, myself excepted, said no with confidence. Nobody thought of me. Well, said the sergeant, they'll find themselves trapped in a circle, I expect, sooner than they count on. Now, blacksmith, if you're ready, His Majesty the King is. Joe had got his coat and waistcoat and cravat off, and his leather apron on, and passed into the forge. One of the soldiers opened its wooden windows, another lighted the fire, another turned to at the bellows, the rest stood round the blaze, which was soon roaring. Then Joe began to hammer and clink, hammer and clink, and we all looked on. The interest of the impending pursuit not only absorbed the general attention, but even made my sister liberal. She drew a pitcher of beer from the cask for the soldiers, and invited the sergeant to take a glass of brandy. But Mr. Pumblechook said sharply, "'Give him wine, Mum. I'll engage there's no tar in that.' So the sergeant thanked him, and said that as he preferred his drink without tar, he would take wine if it was equally convenient. When it was given him, he drank His Majesty's health and compliments of the season, and took it all at a mouthful, and smacked his lips. "'Good stuff, eh, Sergeant?' said Mr. Pumblechook. "'I'll tell you something,' returned the Sergeant. "'I suspect that stuff's of your providing.' Mr. Pumblechook, with a fat sort of laugh, said, "'Ay, ay, why?' "'Because,' returned the sergeant, clapping him on the shoulder, "'you're a man that knows what's what.' "'Do you think so?' said Mr. Pumblechook, with his former laugh. <laughs> "'Have another glass.' "'With you, hob and knob,' returned the sergeant. "'The top of mine to the foot of yours. The foot of yours to the top of mine. Ring once, ring twice. The best tune on the musical glasses. Your health.' May you live a thousand years, and never be a worse judge of the right sort than you are at the present moment of your life. The sergeant tossed off his glass again, and seemed quite ready for another glass. I noticed that Mr. Pumblechook, in his hospitality, appeared to forget that he had made a present of the wine, but took the bottle from Mrs. Joe, and had all the credit of handing it about in a gush of joviality. Even I got some and he was so very free of the wine that he even called for the other bottle, and headed that about with the same liberality when the first was gone. As I watched them, while they all stood clustering about the forge, enjoying themselves so much, I thought what terrible good sauce for a dinner my fugitive friend on the marshes was. They had not enjoyed themselves a quarter so much, before the entertainment was brightened with the excitement he furnished. And now, when they were all in lively anticipation of the two villains being taken, and when the bellows seemed to roar for the fugitives, the fire to flare for them, the smoke to hurry away in pursuit of them, Joe to hammer and clink for them, and all the murky shadows on the wall to shake at them in menace as the blaze rose and sank, and the red-hot sparks dropped and died, the pale afternoon outside almost seemed in my pitying young fancy to have turned pale on their account, poor wretches. At last Joe's job was done, and the ringing and roaring stopped. As Joe got on his coat, he mustered courage to propose that some of us should go down with the soldiers, and see what came of the hunt. Mr. Pumblechook and Mr. Hubble declined, on the plea of a pipe and lady's society. But Mr. Wopsle said he would go, if Joe would. 
Joe said he was agreeable, and would take me, if Mrs. Joe approved. We never should have got leave to go, I am sure, but for Mrs. Joe's curiosity to know all about it and how it ended. As it was, she merely stipulated, "'If you bring the boy back with his head blown to bits by a musket, don't look to me to put it together again.' The sergeant took a polite leave of the ladies, and parted from Mr. Pumblechook, as from a comrade, though I doubt if he were quite as fully sensible of that gentleman's merits under arid conditions as when something moist was going. His men resumed their muskets and fell in. Mr. Wopsle, Joe, and I received strict charge to keep in the rear, and to speak no word after we reached the marshes. When we were all out in the raw air and were steadily moving towards our business, I treasonably whispered to Joe, "'I hope, Joe, we shan't find them.' And Joe whispered to me, "'I'd give a shilling if they had cut and run, Pip.' We were joined by no stragglers from the village, for the weather was cold and threatening, the way dreary, the footing bad, darkness coming on, and the people had good fires indoors and were keeping the day. A few faces hurried to glowing windows and looked after us, but none came out. We passed the finger-post and held straight on to the churchyard. There we were stopped a few minutes by a signal from the sergeant's hand, while two or three of his men dispersed themselves among the graves, and also examined the porch. They came in again without finding anything, and then we struck out on the open marshes, through the gate at the side of the churchyard. A bitter sleet came rattling against us here on the east wind, and Joe took me on his back. Now that we were out upon the dismal wilderness, where they little thought I had been within eight or nine hours, and had seen both men hiding, I considered for the first time, with great dread, if we should come upon them, would my particular convict suppose that it was I who had brought the soldiers here? He had asked me if I was a deceiving imp and he had said I should be a fierce young hound if I joined the hunt against him. Would he believe that I was both imp and hound in treacherous earnest, and had betrayed him? It was of no use asking myself this question now. There I was, on Joe's back, and there was Joe beneath me, charging at the ditches like a hunter, and stimulating Mr. Wopsle not to tumble on his Roman nose, and to keep up with us. The soldiers were in front of us, extending in a pretty wide line with an interval between man and man. We were taking the course I had begun with, and from which I had diverged in the mist. Either the mist was not out again yet, or the wind had dispelled it. Under the low red glare of sunset, the beacon and the gibbet and the mound of the battery, and the opposite shore of the river, were plain, though all of a watery lead colour. With my heart thumping like a blacksmith at Joe's broad shoulder, I looked all about for any sign of the convicts. I could see none. I could hear none. Mr. Wopsle had greatly alarmed me more than once, by his blowing and hard breathing, but I knew the sounds by this time, and could dissociate them from the object of pursuit. I got a dreadful start, when I thought I heard the file still going, but it was only a sheep-bell. The sheep stopped in their eating and looked timidly at us, and the cattle, their heads turned from the wind and sleet, stared angrily as if they held us responsible for both annoyances. But except these things, and the shudder of the dying day in every blade of grass, there was no break in the bleak stillness of the marshes. The soldiers were moving on in the direction of the old battery, and we were moving on a little way behind them, when all of a sudden we all stopped for there had reached us on the wings of the wind and rain a long shout. It was repeated. It was at a distance towards the east, but it was long and loud. Nay, there seemed to be two or more shouts raised together, if one might judge from a confusion in the sound. To this effect the sergeant and the nearest men were speaking under their breath when Joe and I came up. After another moment's listening, Joe, who was a good judge, agreed, and Mr. Wopsle, who was a bad judge, agreed. The sergeant, a decisive man, ordered that the sound should not be answered, but that the course should be changed, and that his men should make towards it at the double. So we slanted to the right, where the east was, 
and Joe pounded away so wonderfully that I had to hold on tight to keep my seat. It was a run indeed now, and what Joe called, in the only two words he spoke all the time, a winder. Down banks and up banks and over gates and splashing into dikes and breaking among coarse rushes, no man cared where he went. As we came nearer to the shouting, it became more and more apparent that it was made by more than one voice. Sometimes it seemed to stop altogether, and then the soldiers stopped. When it broke out again, the soldiers made for it at a greater rate than ever, and we after them. After a while we had so run it down that we could hear one voice calling, Murder! And another voice, Convicts! Runaways! Guard! This way for the runaway convicts! Then both voices would seem to be stifled in a struggle, and then would break out again. And when it had come to this, the soldiers ran like deer, and Joe too. The sergeant ran in first when we had run the noise quite down, and two of his men ran in close upon them. Their pieces were cocked and leveled when we all ran in. "'Here are both men,' panted the sergeant, struggling at the bottom of a ditch. "'Surrender, you two, and confound you for two wild beasts! Come asunder!' Water was splashing, and mud was flying, and oaths were being sworn, and blows were being struck, when some more men went down into the ditch to help the sergeant, and dragged out, separately, my convict and the other one. Both were bleeding and panting and execrating and struggling, but of course I knew them both directly. "'Mind!' said my convict, wiping blood from his face with his ragged sleeves, and shaking torn hair from his fingers. "'I took him! I give him up to you! Mind that!' "'It's not much to be particular about,' said the sergeant. It'll do you small good, my man, being in the same plight yourself. Handcuffs there. Oh, I don't expect it to do me any good. I don't want it to do me more good than it does now, said my convict, with a greedy laugh. I took him. He knows it. That's enough for me. The other convict was livid to look at, and in addition to the old bruised left side of his face, seemed to be bruised and torn all over. He could not so much as get his breath to speak, until they were both separately handcuffed, but leaned upon a soldier to keep himself from falling. Eh, "'Take, take notice, guard. He tried to murder me,' were his first words. "'Tried to murder him,' said my convict disdainfully. "'Try, and not do it. I took him, and give him up. That's what I'd done.' I not only prevented him getting off the marshes, but I dragged him here, dragged him this far on his way back. He's a gentleman, if you please, this villain. Now the hulks has got its gentleman again, through me. Murder him! <laughs> Worth my while, too, to murder him, when I could do worse and drag him back. The other one still gasped. He tried, he tried to murder me. Bear, bear witness. "'Looky here,' said my convict to the sergeant. "'Single-handed I got clear of the prison ship. I made a dash, and I'd done it. I could have got clear of these death-cold flats likewise. Look at my leg. You won't find much iron on it, if I hadn't made the discovery that he was here. Let him go free. Let him profit by the means as I found out. Let him make a tool of me afresh and again. Once more?' No, no, no. If I had died at the bottom there, and he made an emphatic swing at the ditch with his manacled hands, I'd have held to him with that grip that you should have been safe to find him in my hold. The other fugitive, who was evidently in extreme horror of his companion, repeated, He tried to murder me. I should have been a dead man if you had not come up. He lies, said my convict with fierce energy. He's a liar born, and he'll die a liar. Look at his face. Ain't it written there? Let him turn those eyes of his on me. I defy him to do it. The other, with an effort at a scornful smile, which could not, however, collect the nervous working of his mouth into any set expression, looked at the soldiers and looked about at the marshes and at the sky, but certainly did not look at the speaker. Did you see him? 
pursued my convict, "'do you see what a villain he is? Do you see those groveling and wandering eyes? That's how he looked when we were tried together. He never looked at me.' The other, always working and working his dry lips, and turning his eyes restlessly about him, far and near, did at last turn them for a moment on the speaker, with the words, "'You are not much to look at,' and with a half-taunting glance at the bound hands. At that point my convict became so frantically exasperated that he would have rushed upon him but for the interposition of the soldiers. "'Didn't I tell you,' said the other convict then, that he would murder me if he could, and any one could see that he shook with fear, and that there broke out upon his lips curious white flakes, like thin snow. "'Enough of this parsley,' said the sergeant. "'Light those torches!' As one of the soldiers, who carried a basket in lieu of a gun, went down on his knee to open it, my convict looked round him for the first time, and saw me. I had alighted from Joe's back on the brink of the ditch when we came up, and had not moved since. I looked at him eagerly when he looked at me, and slightly moved my hands and shook my head. I had been waiting for him to see me, that I might try to assure him of my innocence. It was not at all expressed to me that he even comprehended my intention, for he gave me a look that I did not understand, and it all passed in a moment." but if he had looked at me for an hour or for a day, I could not have remembered his face ever afterwards as having been more attentive. The soldier with the basket soon got a light, and lighted three or four torches, and took one himself and distributed the others. It had been almost dark before, but now it seemed quite dark, and soon afterwards very dark. Before we departed from that spot, four soldiers standing in a ring fired twice into the air. Presently we saw other torches kindled at some distance behind us, and others on the marshes on the opposite bank of the river. "'All right,' said the sergeant. "'March!' We had not gone far when three cannon were fired ahead of us with a sound that seemed to burst something inside my ear. "'You are expected on board,' said the sergeant to my convict. "'They know you are coming. Don't straggle, my man. Close up here.' The two were kept apart, and each walked surrounded by a separate guard. I had hold of Joe's hand now, and Joe carried one of the torches. Mr. Wopsle had been for going back, but Joe was resolved to see it out, so we went on with the party. There was a reasonably good path now, mostly on the edge of the river, with a divergence here and there where a dike came, with a miniature windmill on it, and a muddy sluice-gate. When I looked round, I could see the other lights coming in after us. The torches we carried dropped great blotches of fire upon the track, and I could see those, too, lying smoking and flaring. I could see nothing else but black darkness. Our lights warmed the air about us with their pitchy blaze, and the two prisoners seemed rather to like that, as they limped along in the midst of the muskets. We could not go fast, because of their lameness, and they were so spent that two or three times we had to halt while they rested. After an hour or so of this travelling we came to a rough wooden hut and a landing-place. There was a guard in the hut, and they challenged, and the sergeant answered. Then we went into the hut, where there was a smell of tobacco and whitewash, and a bright fire, and a lamp, and a stand of muskets, and a drum, and a low wooden bedstead, like an overgrown mangle without the machinery capable of holding about a dozen soldiers all at once. Three or four soldiers who lay upon it in their greatcoats were not much interested in us, but just lifted their heads and took a sleepy stare, and then lay down again. The sergeant made some kind of report, and some entry in a book, and then the convict who I called the other convict was drafted off with his guard to go on board first. My convict never looked at me except that once. While we stood in the hut, he stood before the fire looking thoughtfully at it, or putting up his feet by turns upon the hob, and looking thoughtfully at them as if he pitied them for their recent adventures. Suddenly he turned to the sergeant and remarked, "'I wish to say something respecting this escape. It may prevent some persons laying under suspicion a longer me.' "'You can say what you like,' 
returned the sergeant, standing coolly looking at him with his arms folded, "'but you have no call to say it here. You'll have opportunity enough to say about it, and hear about it, before it's done with, you know.' Oh, "'I know, but this is another point, a separate matter. A man can't starve, at least I can't. I took some vittles, up at the village over yonder, where the church stands almost out on the marshes.' "'You mean stole,' said the sergeant. "'And I'll tell you where from, from the blacksmiths.' "'Hallo,' said the sergeant, staring at Joe. "'Hallo, Pip,' said Joe, staring at me. "'It was some broken fiddles, that's what it was, and a dram of liquor and a pie.' "'Have you happened to miss such an article as a pie, blacksmith?' asked the sergeant, confidentially. "'My wife did, at the very moment when you came in. Don't you know, Pip?' "'So,' said my convict, turning his eyes on Joe in a moody manner, and without the least glance at me, "'So you're the blacksmith, are you? Then I'm sorry to say I've eat your pie.' "'God knows you're welcome to it, so far as it was ever mine.' returned Joe, with a saving remembrance of Mrs. Joe. "'We don't know what you have done, but we wouldn't have you starved to death for it, poor miserable fellow-creature. Would us, Pip?' The something that I had noticed before clicked in the man's throat again, and he turned his back. The boat had returned, and his guard was ready, so we followed him to the landing-place, made of rough stakes and stones, and saw him put into the boat which was rowed by a crew of convicts like himself. No one seemed surprised to see him, or interested in seeing him, or glad to see him, or sorry to see him, or spoke a word, except that somebody in the boat growled as if to dogs, "'Give way, you!' which was the signal for the dip of the oars. By the light of the torches we saw the black hulk lying out a little way from the mud of the shore, like a wicked Noah's Ark." Cribbed and barred and moored by massive rusty chains, the prison ship seemed to my young eyes to be ironed like the prisoners. We saw the boat go alongside, and we saw him taken up the side and disappear. Then the ends of the torches were flung hissing into the water, and went out, as if it were all over with him. End of chapter Chapter Six of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter Six. My state of mind regarding the pilfering from which I had been so unexpectedly exonerated did not impel me to frank disclosure, but I hope it had some dregs of good at the bottom of it. I do not recall that I felt any tenderness of conscience in reference to Mrs. Joe, when the fear of being found out was lifted off me. But I loved Joe, perhaps for no better reason in those early days than because the dear fellow let me love him, and as to him— my inner self was not so easily composed. It was much upon my mind, particularly when I first saw him looking about for his file, that I ought to tell Joe the whole truth. Yet I did not, and for the reason that I mistrusted that if I did, he would think me worse than I was. The fear of losing Joe's confidence, and of thenceforth sitting in the chimney-corner at night staring drearily at my forever lost companion and friend, tied up my tongue. I morbidly represented to myself that if Joe knew it, I never afterwards could see him at the fireside feeling his fair whisker, without thinking that he was meditating on it. That if Joe knew it, I never afterwards could see him glance, however casually, at yesterday's meat or pudding when it came on to-day's table, without thinking that he was debating whether I had been in the pantry. That if Joe knew it, and at any subsequent period of our joint domestic life, remarked that his beer was flat or thick, the conviction that he suspected tar in it, 
would bring a rush of blood to my face. In a word, I was too cowardly to do what I knew to be right, as I had been too cowardly to avoid doing what I knew to be wrong. I had had no intercourse with the world at that time, and I imitated none of its many inhabitants who act in this manner. Quite an untaught genius, I made the discovery of the line of action for myself. As I was sleepy before we were far away from the prison ship, Joe took me on his back again and carried me home. He must have had a tiresome journey of it, for Mr. Wopsle, being knocked up, was in such a very bad temper that if the church had been thrown open, he would probably have excommunicated the whole expedition, beginning with Joe and myself. In his lay capacity, he persisted in sitting down in the damp to such an insane extent that when his coat was taken off to be dried at the kitchen fire, the circumstantial evidence on his trousers would have hanged him if it had been a capital offence. By that time I was staggering on the kitchen floor like a little drunkard, having been newly set upon my feet, and through having been fast asleep, and through waking in the heat and lights and noise of tongues, as I came to myself, with the aid of a heavy thump between the shoulders, and the restorative exclamation, "'Yah! Was there ever such a boy as this?' from my sister. I found Joe telling them about the convict's confession, and all the visitors suggesting different ways by which he had got into the pantry. Mr. Pumblechook made out, after carefully surveying the premises, that he had first got upon the roof of the forge, and had then got upon the roof of the house, and had then let himself down the kitchen chimney by a rope made of his bedding, cut into strips. And as Mr. Pumblechook was very positive, and drove his own chaise-cart, over everybody, it was agreed that it must be so. Mr. Wopsle, indeed, widely cried out, No! with the feeble malice of a tired man, but as he had no theory, and no coat on, he was unanimously set at naught, not to mention his smoking hard behind, as he stood with his back to the kitchen fire to draw the damp out, which was not calculated to inspire confidence. This was all I heard that night before my sister clutched me, as a slumberous offence to the company's eyesight, and assisted me up to bed with such a strong hand that I seemed to have fifty boots on, and to be dangling them all against the edges of the stairs. My state of mind, as I have described it, began before I was up in the morning, and lasted long after the subject had died out, and had ceased to be mentioned, saving on exceptional occasions. End of chapter. Chapter 7 of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens, Chapter 7. At the time when I stood in the churchyard reading the family tombstones, I had just enough learning to be able to spell them out. My construction even of their simple meaning was not very correct, for I read Wife of the Above as a complimentary reference to my father's exaltation to a better world, and if any one of my deceased relatives had been referred to as Below, I have no doubt I should have formed the worst opinions of that member of the family. Neither were my notions of the theological positions to which my catechism bound me at all accurate for I have a lively remembrance that I supposed my declaration that I was to walk in the same all the days of my life, laid me under an obligation always to go through the village from our house in one particular direction, and never to vary it by turning down by the wheelwrights or up by the mill. When I was old enough, I was to be apprenticed to Joe, and until I could assume that dignity I was not to be what Mrs. Joe called pompied or, as I render it, pampered. Therefore, I was not only odd boy about the forge, but if any neighbor happened to want an extra boy to frighten birds, or pick up stones, or do any such job, I was favored with the employment. In order, however, that our superior position might not be compromised thereby, 
a money-box was kept on the kitchen mantel-shelf, into which it was publicly made known that all my earnings were dropped. I have an impression that they were to be contributed eventually towards the liquidation of the national debt, but I know I had no hope of any personal participation in the treasure. Mr. Wopsle's great-aunt kept an evening school in the village. That is to say, she was a ridiculous old woman of limited means and unlimited infirmity, who used to go to sleep from six to seven every evening, in the society of youth who paid two pence per week each, for the improving opportunity of seeing her do it. She rented a small cottage, and Mr. Wopsle had the room upstairs, where we students used to overhear him reading aloud in a most dignified and terrific manner, and occasionally bumping on the ceiling. There was a fiction that Mr. Wopsle examined the scholars once a quarter. What he did on those occasions was to turn up his cuffs, stick up his hair, and give us Mark Antony's oration over the body of Caesar. This was always followed by Collins' Ode on the Passions, wherein I particularly venerated Mr. Wopsle as revenge throwing his blood-stained sword in thunder down, and taking the war-denouncing trumpet with a withering look. It was not with me then, as it was in later life, when I fell into the society of the passions, and compared them with Collins and Wopsle, rather to the disadvantage of both gentlemen. Mr. Wopsle's great aunt, besides keeping this educational institution, kept in the same room a little general shop. She had no idea what stock she had, or what the price of anything in it was, but there was a little greasy memorandum book kept in a drawer, which served as a catalogue of prices, and by this oracle Biddy arranged all the shop transaction. Biddy was Mr. Wopsle's great-aunt's granddaughter. I confess myself quiet, unequal to the working out of the problem, what relation she was to Mr. Wopsle. She was an orphan like myself, like me, too, had been brought up by hand. She was most noticeable, I thought, in respect of her extremities, for her hair always wanted brushing, her hands always wanted washing, and her shoes always wanted mending and pulling up at heel. This description must be received with a weekday limitation. On Sundays she went to church, elaborated. Much of my unassisted self, and more by the help of Biddy than of Mr. Wopsle's great-aunt, I struggled through the alphabet as if it had been a bramble-bush, getting considerably worried and scratched by every letter. After that I fell among those thieves, the nine figures, who seemed every evening to do something new to disguise themselves and baffle recognition. But, at last I began, in a purblind groping way, to read, write, and cipher, on the very smallest scale. One night I was sitting in the chimney-corner with my slate, expending great efforts on the production of a letter to Joe. I think it must have been a full year after our hunt upon the marshes, for it was a long time after, and it was winter, and a hard frost. With an alphabet on the hearth at my feet for reference, I contrived in an hour or two to print and smear this epistle, which is spelled very badly. My dear Joe, I hope you are care white well. I hope I shall son be able for to teach you, Joe, and then we shall be so glad, and when I'm prentice to you, Joe, what larks and believe me infix and pip. <sighs> There was no indispensable necessity for my communicating with Joe by letter, inasmuch as he sat beside me and we were alone. But I delivered this written communication, slate and all, with my own hand, and Joe received it as a miracle of erudition. "'I say, Pip, old chap!' cried Joe, opening his blue eyes wide. "'What a scholar you are, ain't you?' "'I should like to be.' said I, glancing at the slate as he held it, with a misgiving that the writing was rather hilly. "'Why, here's a J,' said Joe, "'and a O equal to anything. Here's a J, and an O, Pip, and a J-O, Joe.' 
I had never heard Joe read aloud to any greater extent than this monosyllable, and I had observed at church last Sunday, when I accidentally held our prayer-book upside down, that it seemed to suit his convenience quite as well as if it had been all right. Wishing to embrace the present occasion of finding out whether in teaching Joe I should have to begin quite at the beginning, I said, "Ha! Ah, but read the rest, Joe. Uh, the rest, eh, Pip? said Joe, looking at it with a slow, searching eye. One, two, three. Why, here's three J's, and three O's, and three J-O, Joe's in it, Pip. I leaned over Joe, and with the aid of my forefinger read him the whole letter. Astonishing, said Joe, when I had finished. You are a scholar. How do you spell Gargery, Joe? I asked him with a modest patronage. I don't spell it at all, said Joe. But supposing you did? It can't be supposed, said Joe, though I'm uncommon fond of reading, too. Are you, Joe? Uncommon. Give me, said Joe, a good book or a good newspaper, and sit me down afore a good fire, and I ask no better. Lord! he continued, after rubbing his knees a little. When you do come to a J and an O, and says you, here at last is a J-O, Joe, how interesting reading is! I derive from this that Joe's education, like steam, was yet in its infancy. Pursuing the subject, I inquired, Didn't you ever go to school, Joe, when you were as little as me? No, Pip. Why didn't you ever go to school, Joe, when you were as little as me? Well, Pip, said Joe, taking up the poker, and settling himself to his usual occupation when he was thoughtful, of slowly raking the fire between the lower bars. I'll tell you. My father, Pip, he was given to drink, and when he was overtook with drink, he hammered away at my mother, most unmerciful. It was almost the only hammering he did, indeed, except it at myself, and he hammered at me with a vigour only to be equalled by the vigour with which he didn't hammer at his anvil. You're a listening and understanding, Pip? Yes, Joe. Consequence, my mother and me, we ran away from my father several times, and then my mother, she'd go out to work, and she'd say, Joe, she'd say, now, please God, you shall have some schooling, child, and she'd put me to school. But my father were that good in his heart that he couldn't abear to be without us, so he'd come with a most tremendous crowd and make such a row at the doors of the houses where we was, that they used to be obligated to have no more to do with us and to give us up to him. And then he took us home and hammered us. Which you see, Pip— said Joe, pausing in his meditative raking of the fire, and looking at me, were a drawback on my learning. Certainly, poor Joe. Though mind you, Pip, said Joe, with a judicial touch or two of the poker on the top bar, rendering under all their due, and maintaining equal justice twixt man and man, my father were that good in his heart, don't you see? I didn't see, but I didn't say so. Well, Joe pursued, somebody must keep the pot a boiling, Pip, or the pot won't boil, don't you know? I saw that, and I said so. Consequence, my father didn't make objections to my going to work, so I went to work, to work at my present calling, which were his too, if he would have followed it, and I worked tolerable hard, I assure you, Pip. In time I were able to keep him, and I kept him till he went off in a purpleptic fit. And in it were my intention to have had put upon his tombstone that, whatsoever the failings on his part, remember, reader, he were that good in his heart. Joe recited this couplet with such manifest pride and careful perspicuity, that I asked him if he had made it himself. 
"'I made it,' said Joe, "'my own self. I made it in a moment. It was like striking out a horseshoe complete, in a single blow. I never was so much surprised in all my life. Couldn't credit my own Ed. To tell you the truth, hardly believed it were my own Ed. As I was saying, Pip, it were my intention to have had it cut over him, but poetry costs money. Cut it how you will, small or large, and it were not done. Not to mention bearers, all the money that could be spared were wanted for my mother. She were in poor elf, and quite broke. She weren't long a following, poor soul, and her share of peace come round at last. Joe's blue eyes turned a little watery. He rubbed first one of them, and then the other, in a most uncongenial and uncomfortable manner, with a round knob on the top of the poker. "'It were but lonesome, then,' said Joe, "'living here alone, and I got acquainted with your sister. Now, Pip,' Joe looked firmly at me, as if he knew I was not going to agree with him, "'your sister is a fine figure of a woman.' I could not help looking at the fire in an obvious state of doubt. "'Whatever family opinions, or whatever the world's opinions on that subject may be, Pip, your sister is,' Joe tapped the top bar with a poker after every word following, "'a fine figure of a woman.' I could think of nothing better to say than, "'I'm glad you think so, Joe.' "'So am I,' returned Joe, catching me up. "'I am glad I think so, Pip. "'A little redness or a little matter of bone here or there, "'what does it signify to me?' "'I sagaciously observed, if it didn't signify to him, "'to whom did it signify?' "'Certainly,' assented Joe. "'That's it. You're right, old chap. "'When I got acquainted with your sister,' It were the talk how she was bringing you up by hand. Very kind of her, too, all the folks said. And I said, along with all the folks. As to you, Joe pursued with a countenance expressive of seeing something very nasty indeed, if you could have been aware how small and flabby and mean you was, dear me, you'd have formed the most contemptible opinion of yourself. Not exactly relishing this, I said, "'Never mind me, Joe.' "'But I did mind you, Pip,' he returned with tender simplicity. "'When I offered to your sister to keep company, and to be asked in church at such times as she was willing and ready to come to the forge, I said to her, "'And bring the poor little child. God bless the poor little child,' I said to your sister, there's room for him at the forge. I broke out crying and begging pardon, and hugged Joe round the neck, who dropped the poker to hug me, and to say, Ever the best of friends, ain't us, Pip? Don't cry, old chap. When this little interruption was over, Joe resumed, Well, you see, Pip, and here we are. That's about where it lights. Here we are. Now, when you take me in hand in my learning, Pip, and I tell you beforehand I am awful dull, most awful dull, Mrs. Joe mustn't see too much of what we're up to. It must be done, as I may say, on the sly. And why on the sly? I'll tell you why, Pip. He had taken up the poker again, without which I doubt if he could have proceeded in his demonstration. Your sister is given to government. Given to government, Joe? I was startled, for I had some shadowy idea, and I'm afraid I must add, hope, that Joe had divorced her in a favour of the Lords of the Admiralty or Treasury. Given to government, said Joe. What I means to say, the government of you and myself. Oh! "'And she ain't over-partial to having scholars on the premises,' Joe continued, "'and in particular would not be over-partial to my being a scholar, for fear as I might rise. 
like a sort of rebel, don't you see? I was going to retort with an inquiry, and had got as far as, Why? when Joe stopped me. Stay a bit. I know what you're going to say, Pip. Stay a bit. I don't deny that your sister comes the mogul over us now and again. I don't deny that she do throw us back falls, and that she do drop down upon us heavy. At such times as when your sister is on the rampage, Pip. Joe sank his voice to a whisper and glanced at the door. Candor compels for to admit that she is a buster. Joe pronounced this word as if it began with at least twelve capital B's. Why don't I rise? That were your observation when I broke it off, Pip? Yes, Joe. Well, said Joe, passing the poker into his left hand, that he might feel his whisker and I had no hope of him whenever he took to that placid occupation. "'Your sister's a mastermind! A mastermind! "'What's that?' I asked, in some hope of bringing him to a stand, but Joe was readier with his definition than I had expected, and completely stopped me by arguing circularly, and answering with a fixed look, "'Her!' "'And I ain't a mastermind! Joe resumed, when he had unfixed his look, and got back to his whisker. "'And last of all, Pip, and this I want to say very serious to you, old chap, I see so much in my poor mother, of a woman drudging and slaving and breaking her honest heart, and never getting no peace in her mortal days, that I'm dead afeard of going wrong in the way of not doing what's right by a woman.' and I'd fur rather of the two go wrong that the other way, and be a little ill convenience myself. I wish it was only me that got put out, Pip. I wish there weren't no tickler for you, old chap. I wish I could take it all on myself. But this is the up and down and straight on it, Pip, and I hope you'll overlook shortcomings. Young as I was, I believe that I dated a new admiration of Joe from that night. We were equals afterwards, as we had been before, but afterwards at quiet times when I sat looking at Joe and thinking about him, I had a new sensation of feeling conscious that I was looking up to Joe in my heart. "'However,' said Joe, rising to replenish the fire, "'here's the Dutch clock a-working himself up to be an equal to strike eight of em and she's not come home yet. I hope Uncle Pumplechook's mare mayn't have had set a forefoot on a piece of ice and gone down. Mrs. Joe made occasional trips with Uncle Pumblechook on market days, to assist him in buying such household stuffs and goods as required a woman's judgment. Uncle Pumblechook being a bachelor, and reposing no confidence in his domestic servant. This was market day and Mrs. Joe was out on one of these expeditions. Joe made the fire, and swept the hearth, and then we went to the door to listen for the chaise cart. It was a dry, cold night, and the wind blew keenly, and the frost was white and hard. A man would die to-night of lying out on the marshes, I thought. And then I looked at the stars, and considered how awful it would be for a man to turn his face up to them as he froze to death, and see no help or pity in all the glittering multitude. "'Here comes the mare,' said Joe, "'ringing like a peal of bells.' The sound of her iron shoes upon the hard road was quite musical, as she came along at a much brisker trot than usual. We got a chair out, ready for Mrs. Joe's alighting, and stirred up the fire that they might see a bright window, and took a final survey of the kitchen that nothing might be out of its place. When we had completed these preparations, they drove up, wrapped to the eyes. Mrs. Joe was soon landed, and Uncle Pumblechook was soon down too, covering the mare with a cloth, and we were soon all in the kitchen, carrying so much cold air in with us that it seemed to drive all the heat out of the fire. "'Now,' said Mrs. Joe, unwrapping herself with haste and excitement, and throwing her bonnet back on her shoulders where it hung by the strings, if this boy ain't grateful this night, he never will be. 
I looked as grateful as any boy possibly could, who was wholly uninformed why he ought to assume that expression. "'It's only to be hoped,' said my sister, "'that he won't be pompied. But I have my fears.' "'She ain't in that line, Mum,' said Mr. Pumblechook. "'She knows better.' She. I looked at Joe, making the motion with my lips and eyebrows. She. Joe looked at me, and making the motion with his lips and eyebrows. She. My sister catching him in the act. He drew the back of his hand across his nose with his usual conciliatory air on such occasions, and looked at her. "'Well?' said my sister, in her snappish way. "'What are you staring at? Is the house a fire?' "'Which some individual,' Joe politely hinted, "'mentioned she.' "'And she is a she, I suppose,' said my sister. "'Unless you call Miss Havisham a he, and I doubt if even you'll go so far as that.' "'Miss Havisham uptown?' said Joe. "'Is there any Miss Havisham downtown?' returned my sister. "'She wants this boy to go and play there. And of course he's going, and he had better play there,' said my sister, shaking her head at me as an encouragement to be extremely light and sportive. "'Or I'll work him!' I had heard of Miss Havisham uptown. Everybody for miles round had heard of Miss Havisham uptown as an immensely rich and grim lady who lived in a large and dismal house, barricaded against robbers, and who led a life of seclusion. "'Well, to be sure,' said Joe, astounded, "'I wonder how she came to know Pip.' "'Noodle!' cried my sister. "'Who said she knew him?' "'Which some individual,' Joe again politely hinted, "'Mentioned that she wanted him to go and play there. "'And couldn't she ask Uncle Pumblechook "'if he knew of a boy to go and play there? "'Isn't it just barely possible that Uncle Pumblechook "'may be a tenant of hers, "'and that he may sometimes, "'we won't say quarterly or half-yearly, "'for that would be requiring too much of you, "'but sometimes go there to pay his rent? "'And couldn't she then ask Uncle Pumblechook, if he knew of a boy to go and play there? And couldn't Uncle Pumblechook, being always considerate and thoughtful for us, though you may not think it, Joseph, in a tone of the deepest reproach, as if he were the most callous of nephews, then mention this boy, standing prancing here, which I solemnly declare I was not doing, that I have for ever been a willing slave to? Good again, cried Uncle Pumblechook. "'Well put! Prettily pointed! Good indeed! Now, Joseph, you know the case.' "'No, Joseph,' said my sister, still in a reproachful manner, while Joe apologetically drew the back of his hand across and across his nose. "'You do not yet, though you may not think it, know the case. You may consider that you do, but you do not, Joseph, for you do not know that Uncle Pumblechook, being sensible that for anything we can tell, this boy's fortune may be made by his going to Miss Havisham's, has offered to take him into town to-night in his own chaise-cart, and to keep him to-night, and to take him with his own hands to Miss Havisham's to-morrow morning. And Laura must see me, cried my sister, casting off her bonnet in sudden desperation. Here I stand, talking to mere moon-calves, with Uncle Pumblechook waiting, and the mare catching cold at the door, and the boy grimed with crock and dirt from the hair of his head to the sole of his foot. With that she pounced upon me, like an eagle on a lamb, and my face was squeezed into wooden bowls and sinks, and my head was put under taps of water-butts, and I was soaped and kneaded and toweled and thumped and harrowed and rasped, until I really was quite beside myself. I may here remark that I suppose myself to be better acquainted than any living authority with the ridgy effect of a wedding-ring passing unsympathetically over the human countenance. When my ablutions were completed, I was put into clean linen of the stiffest character, like a young penitent into sackcloth, and was trussed up in my tightest and fearfullest suit. 
I was then delivered over to Mr. Pumblechook, who formally received me as if he were the sheriff, and who let off upon me the speech that I knew he had been dying to make all along. "'Boy, be forever grateful to all friends, but especially unto them which brought you up by hand.' "'Good-bye, Joe.' "'God bless you, Pip, old chap.' I had never parted from him before, and what with my feelings and what with soap-suds, I could at first see no stars from the chaise-cart. But they twinkled out one by one without throwing any light on the questions— why on earth I was going to play at Miss Havisham's, and what on earth I was expected to play at. End of chapter Chapter 8 of Great Expectations This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens Chapter 8 Mr. Pumblechook's premises in the high street of the market town were of a peppercorny and farinaceous character, as the premises of a corn-chandler and seedsman should be. It appeared to me that he must be a very happy man indeed, to have so many little drawers in his shop, and I wondered when I peeped into one or two on the lower tiers, and saw the tied-up brown paper packets inside, whether the flower-seeds and bulbs ever wanted of a fine day to break out of those jails and bloom. It was in the early morning after my arrival that I entertained the speculation. On the previous night, I had been sent straight to bed in an attic with a sloping roof, which was so low in the corner where the bedstead was, that I calculated the tiles as being within a foot of my eyebrows. In the same early morning I discovered a singular affinity between seeds and corduroys. Mr. Pumblechook wore corduroys, and so did his shopman, and somehow there was a general air and flavour about the corduroys, so much in the nature of seeds, and a general air and flavour about the seeds, so much in the nature of corduroys, that I hardly knew which was which. The same opportunity served me for noticing that Mr. Pumblechook appeared to conduct his business by looking across the street at the saddler, who appeared to transact his business by keeping an eye on the coachmaker, who appeared to get on in life by putting his hands in his pockets and contemplating the baker, who in his turn folded his arms and stared at the grocer, who stood at his door and yawned at the chemist. The watchmaker, always poring over a little desk with a magnifying glass at his eye, and always inspected by a group of smock-frocks poring over him through the glass of his shop-window, seemed to be about the only person in the high street whose trade engaged his attention. Mr. Pumblechook and I breakfasted at eight o'clock in the parlour behind the shop, while the shopman took his mug of tea and hunk of bread and butter on a sack of peas in the front premises. I considered Mr. Pumblechook wretched company. Besides being possessed by my sister's idea that a mortifying and penitential character ought to be imparted to my diet, besides giving me as much crumb as possible, in combination with as little butter, and putting such a quantity of warm water into my milk that it would have been more candid to have left the milk out altogether, his conversation consisted of nothing but arithmetic. On my politely bidding him good morning, he said pompously, Seven times nine, boy? And how should I be able to answer, dodged in that way, in a strange place on an empty stomach? I was hungry, but before I had swallowed a morsel, he began a running sum that lasted all through the breakfast. Seven? And four? And eight? and six, and two, and ten, and so on. And after each figure was disposed of, it was as much as I could do to get a bite or a sup before the next came, while he sat at his ease guessing nothing, and eating bacon and hot roll, in, if I may be allowed the expression, a gorging and gormandizing manner. 
For such reasons I was very glad when ten o'clock came and we started for Miss Havisham's, though I was not at all at my ease regarding the manner in which I should acquit myself under that lady's roof. Within a quarter of an hour we came to Miss Havisham's house, which was of old brick and dismal, and had a great many iron bars to it. Some of the windows had been walled up. Of those that remained, all the lower were rustily barred. There was a courtyard in front, and that was barred, so we had to wait, after ringing the bell, until someone should come to open it. While we waited at the gate, I peeped in. Even then Mr. Pumblechook said, "'And fourteen, but I pretended not to hear him, and saw that at the side of the house there was a large brewery. No brewing was going on in it, and none seemed to have gone on for a long, long time. A window was raised, and a clear voice demanded, "'What name?' To which my conductor replied, "'Pumblechook!' The voice returned, "'Quite right,' and the window was shut again, and a young lady came across the courtyard with keys in her hand. "'This,' said Mr. Pumblechook, "'is Pip.' "'This is Pip, is it?' returned the young lady, who was very pretty, and seemed very proud. "'Come in, Pip.' Mr. Pumblechook was coming in also, when she stopped him with the gate. "'Oh,' she said, "'did you wish to see Miss Havisham?' "'If Miss Havisham wished to see me,' returned Mr. Pumblechook, discomfited. "'Ah,' said the girl, "'but you see, she don't.' She said it so finally, and in such an undiscussable way, that Mr. Pumblechook, though in a condition of ruffled dignity, could not protest. But he eyed me severely, as if I had done anything to him, and departed with the words reproachfully delivered, "'Boy, let your behaviour here be a credit unto them which brought you up by hand.' I was not free from apprehension that he would come back to propound through the gate, "'And sixteen, But he didn't. My young conductress locked the gate, and we went across the courtyard. It was paved and clean, but grass was growing in every crevice. The brewery buildings had a little lane of communication with it, and the wooden gates of that lane stood open, and all the brewery beyond stood open, away to the high enclosing wall, and all was empty and disused. The cold wind seemed to blow colder there than outside the gate, and it made a shrill noise in howling in and out at the open sides of the brewery, like the noise of wind in the rigging of a ship at sea. She saw me looking at it, and she said, "'You could drink without hurt all the strong beer that's brewed there now, boy.' "'I should think I could, miss,' said I, in a shy way. "'Better not try to brew beer there now.' or it would turn out sour, boy. Don't you think so? It looks like it, miss. Not that anybody means to try, she added, for that's all done with, and the place will stand as idle as it is till it falls. As to strong beer, there's enough of it in the cellars already to drown the manor-house. Is that the name of this house, miss? One of its names, boy. "'It has more than one, then, miss?' "'One more. Its other name was Satis, which is Greek, or Latin, or Hebrew, or all three, or all one to me, for enough.' "'Enough house,' said I. "'That's a curious name, miss.' "'Yes,' she replied. "'But it meant more than it said. It meant when it was given.' that whoever had this house could want nothing else. They must have been easily satisfied in those days, I should think. But don't loiter, boy. Though she called me boy so often, and with a carelessness that was far from complimentary, she was of about my own age. She seemed much older than I, of course, being a girl, and beautiful and self-possessed, and she was as scornful of me as if she had been one in twenty and a queen. We went into the house by a side door. The great front entrance had two chains across it outside, and the first thing I noticed was that the passages were all dark, and that she had left a candle burning there. She took it up, and we went through more passages, and up a staircase, 
and still it was all dark, and only the candle lighted us. At last we came to the door of a room, and she said, "'Go in.' I answered, more in shyness than politeness, "'After you, miss.' To this she returned, "'Don't be ridiculous, boy, I am not going in,' and scornfully walked away, and, what was worse, took the candle with her. This was very uncomfortable, and I was half afraid. However, the only thing to be done being to knock at the door, I knocked, and was told from within to enter. I entered, therefore, and found myself in a pretty large room, well lighted with wax candles. No glimpse of daylight was to be seen in it. It was a dressing-room, as I supposed from the furniture, though much of it was of forms and uses then quite unknown to me but prominent in it was a draped table with a gilded looking-glass, and that I made out at first sight to be a fine lady's dressing-table. Whether I should have made out this object so soon, if there had been no fine lady sitting at it, I cannot say. In an armchair, with an elbow resting on the table, and her head leaning on that hand, sat the strangest lady I have ever seen, or shall ever see. She was dressed in rich materials satins and lace and silks, all of white. Her shoes were white, and she had a long white veil dependent from her hair, and she had bridal flowers in her hair, but her hair was white. Some bright jewels sparkled on her neck and on her hands, and some other jewels lay sparkling on the table. Dresses, less splendid than the dress she wore, and half-packed trunks were scattered about. She had not quite finished dressing, for she had but one shoe on, the other was on the table near her hand. Her veil was but half arranged, her watch and chain were not put on, and some lace for her bosom lay with those trinkets, and with her handkerchief, and gloves, and some flowers, and a prayer-book, all confusedly heaped about the looking-glass. It was not in the first few moments that I saw all these things, though I saw more of them in the first moments than might be supposed but I saw that everything within my view which ought to be white had been white long ago, and had lost its luster and was faded and yellow. I saw that the bride within the bridal dress had withered like the dress, and like the flowers, and had no brightness left but the brightness of her sunken eyes. I saw that the dress had been put upon the rounded figure of a young woman, and that the figure upon which it now hung loose had shrunk to skin and bone. Once I had been taken to see some ghastly waxwork at the fair, representing I know not what impossible personage lying in state. Once I had been taken to one of our old marsh churches to see a skeleton in the ashes of a rich dress that had been dug out of a vault under the church pavement. Now waxwork and skeleton seemed to have dark eyes that moved and looked at me. I should have cried out if I could. "'What is it?' said the lady at the table. "'Pip, ma'am.' "'Pip?' "'Mr. Pumblechook's boy, ma'am, come to play.' "'Come nearer. Let me look at you. Come close.' It was when I stood before her, avoiding her eyes, that I took note of the surrounding objects in detail, and saw that her watch had stopped at twenty minutes to nine, and then a clock in the room had stopped at twenty minutes to nine. "'Look at me,' said Miss Havisham. "'You are not afraid of a woman who has never seen the sun since you were born?' I regret to state that I was not afraid of telling the enormous lie comprehended in the answer, no. "'Do you know what I touch here?' she said, laying her hands one upon the other on her left side. "'Yes, ma'am.' It made me think of the young man. "'What do I touch?' "'Your heart?' "'Broken.' She uttered the word with an eager look, and with strong emphasis, and with a weird smile that had a kind of boast in it. Afterwards she kept her hands there for a little while, and slowly took them away as if they were heavy. "'I am tired,' said Miss Havisham. I want diversion, and I have done with men and women. Play. 
I think it will be conceded, by my most disputatious reader, that she could hardly have directed an unfortunate boy to do anything in the wide world more difficult to be done under the circumstances. "'I sometimes have sick fancies,' she went on, "'and I have a sick fancy that I want to see some play. There, there,' with an impatient movement of the fingers of her right hand, "'Play, play, play!' For a moment, with the fear of my sisters working me before my eyes, I had a desperate idea of starting round the room in the assumed character of Mr. Pumblechook's chaise-cart. But I felt myself so unequal to the performance that I gave it up, and stood looking at Miss Havisham in what I suppose she took for a dogged manner, inasmuch as she said, when we had taken a good look at each other, "'Are you sullen and obstinate?' "'No, ma'am. I'm very sorry for you. Very sorry I can't play just now. If you complain of me, I shall get into trouble with my sister, so I would do it if I could. But it's so new here, and so strange, and so fine, and melancholy.' I stopped, fearing I might say too much, or had already said it, and we took another look at each other. Before she spoke again she turned her eyes from me, and looked at the dress she wore, and at the dressing-table, and finally at herself in the looking-glass. "'So new to him,' she muttered, "'so old to me, so strange to him, so familiar to me, so melancholy to both of us. Call Estella.' As she was still looking at the reflection of herself, I thought she was still talking to herself, and kept quiet. "'Call Estella,' she repeated, flashing a look at me. "'You can do that. Call Estella. At the door.' To stand in the dark, in a mysterious passage of an unknown house, bawling Estella to a scornful young lady neither visible nor responsive, and feeling it a dreadful liberty so to roar out her name, was almost as bad as playing to order. But she answered at last, and her light came along the dark passage like a star. Miss Havisham beckoned her to come close, and took a jewel from the table, and tried its effect upon her fair young bosom, and against her pretty brown hair. "'Your own one day, my dear, and you will use it well.' Let me see you play cards with this boy. With this boy? Why, he is a common labouring boy. I thought I overheard Miss Havisham answer, only it seemed so unlikely. Well, you can break his heart. What do you play, boy? asked Estella of myself, with the greatest disdain. Nothing but beggar my neighbour miss beggar him said miss havisham to estella so we sat down to cards it was then i began to understand that everything in the room had stopped like the watch and the clock a long time ago i noticed that miss havisham put down the jewel exactly on the spot from which she had taken it up as estella dealt the cards i glanced at the dressing-table again and saw that the shoe upon it, once white, now yellow, had never been worn. I glanced down at the foot from which the shoe was absent, and saw that the silk stocking on it, once white, now yellow, had been trodden ragged. Without this arrest of everything, this standing still of all the pale decayed objects, not even the withered bridal dress on the collapsed form could have looked so like grave clothes or the long veil so like a shroud. So she sat, corpse-like, as we played at cards, the frillings and trimmings on her bridal dress looking like earthy paper. I knew nothing then of the discoveries that are occasionally made of bodies buried in ancient times, which fall to powder in the moment of being distinctly seen, but I have often thought since that she must have looked as if the admission of the natural light of day would have struck her to dust. "'He calls the knaves jacks, this boy,' said Estella with disdain, before our first game was out. "'And what coarse hands he has, 
and what thick boots. I had never thought of being ashamed of my hands before, but I began to consider them a very indifferent pair. Her contempt for me was so strong that it became infectious, and I caught it. She won the game, and I dealt. I misdealt, as was only natural, when I knew she was lying in wait for me to do wrong, and she denounced me for a stupid, clumsy labouring boy. "'You say nothing of her,' remarked Miss Havisham to me, as she looked on. "'She says many hard things of you, but you say nothing of her. What do you think of her?' "'I, I don't like to say.' I stammered. "'Tell me in my ear,' said Miss Havisham, bending down. "'I think she is very proud,' I replied in a whisper. "'Anything else?' "'I think she is very pretty.' "'Anything else?' "'I think she is very insulting.' She was looking at me then with a look of supreme aversion. "'Anything else?' "'I think I should like to go home.' "'And never see her again, though she is so pretty?' "'I am not sure that I shouldn't like to see her again, but I should like to go home now.' "'You shall go soon,' said Miss Havisham aloud. "'Play the game out.' Saving for the one weird smile at first, I should have felt almost sure that Miss Havisham's face could not smile. It had dropped into a watchful and brooding expression, most likely when all the things about her had become transfixed, and it looked as if nothing could ever lift it up again. Her chest had dropped so that she stooped, and her voice had dropped so that she spoke low and with a dead lull upon her, altogether, she had the appearance of having dropped body and soul, within and without, under the weight of a crushing blow. I played the game to an end with Estella, and she beggared me. She threw the cards down on the table when she had won them all, as if she despised them for having been one of me. "'When shall I have you here again?' said Miss Havisham. "'Let me think.' I was beginning to remind her that to-day was Wednesday, when she checked me with her former impatient movements of the fingers of her right hand. "'There, there, I know nothing of days of the week. I know nothing of weeks of the year. Come again after six days. You hear?' "'Yes, ma'am.' "'Estella, take him down. Let him have something to eat, and let him roam and look about him while he eats.' Go, Pip. I followed the candle down, as I had followed the candle up, and she stood it in the place where we had found it. Until she opened the side entrance, I had fancied, without thinking about it, that it must necessarily be night-time. The rush of the daylight quite confounded me, and made me feel as if I had been in the candlelight of the strange room many hours. "'You are to wait here, you boy.' said Estella, and disappeared and closed the door. I took the opportunity of being alone in the courtyard to look at my coarse hands and my common boots. My opinion of those accessories was not favourable. They had never troubled me before, but they troubled me now, as vulgar appendages. I determined to ask Joe why he had ever taught me to call those picture-cards jacks, which ought to be called knaves. I wish Joe had been rather more genteelly brought up, and then I should have been so too. She came back with some bread and meat and a little mug of beer. She put the mug down on the stones of the yard, and gave me the bread and meat without looking at me, as insolently as if I were a dog in disgrace. I was so humiliated, hurt, spurned, offended, angry, sorry. I cannot hit upon the right name for the smart. God knows what its name was. The tears started to my eyes. The moment they sprang there, the girl looked at me with a quick delight in having been the cause of them. This gave me power to keep them back and to look at her. So she gave me a contemptuous toss. But with a sense, I thought, of having made too sure that I was so wounded, and left me. 
but when she was gone I looked about me for a place to hide my face in, and got behind one of the gates in the brewery lane, and leaned my sleeve against the wall there, and leaned my forehead on it, and cried. As I cried I kicked the wall, and took a hard twist at my hair, so bitter were my feelings, and so sharp was the smart without a name that needed counteraction. My sister's bringing up had made me sensitive. In the little world in which children have their existence, whosoever brings them up, there is nothing so finely perceived and so finely felt as injustice. It may be only small injustice that the child can be exposed to, but the child is small, and its world is small, and its rocking-horse stands as many hands high, according to scale, as a big-boned Irish hunter. Within myself I had sustained from my babyhood a perpetual conflict with injustice. I had known, from the time when I could speak, that my sister, in her capricious and violent coercion, was unjust to me. I had cherished a profound conviction that her bringing me up by hand gave her no right to bring me up by jerks. Through all my punishments, disgraces, fasts, and vigils, and other penitential performances, I had nursed this assurance, and to my communing so much with it, in a solitary and unprotected way, I in great part refer the fact that I was morally timid and very sensitive. I got rid of my injured feelings for the time by kicking them into the brewery wall, and twisting them out of my hair, and then I smoothed my face with my sleeve and came from behind the gate. The bread and meat were acceptable, and the beer was warming and tingling, and I was soon in spirits to look about me. To be sure, it was a deserted place, down to the pigeon-house in the brewery-yard, which had been blown crooked on its pole by some high wind, and would have made the pigeons think themselves at sea if there had been any pigeons there to be rocked by it. But there were no pigeons in the dovecot, no horses in the stable, no pigs in the sty no malt in the storehouse, no smells of grains and beer in the copper or the vat. All the uses and scents of the brewery might have evaporated with its last reek of smoke. In a by-yard there was a wilderness of empty casks, which had a certain sour remembrance of better days lingering about them, but it was too sour to be accepted as a sample of the beer that was gone and in this respect I remember those recluses as being like most others. Behind the farthest end of the brewery was a rank garden with an old wall, not so high but that I could struggle up and hold on long enough to look over it, and see that the rank garden was the garden of the house, and that it was overgrown with tangled weeds, but that there was a track upon the green and yellow paths, as if someone sometimes walked there and that Estella was walking away from me even then. But she seemed to be everywhere, for when I yielded to the temptation presented by the casks, and began to walk on them, I saw her walking on them at the end of the yard of casks. She had her back towards me, and held her pretty brown hair spread out in her two hands, and never looked round, and passed out of my view directly. So, in the brewery itself, by which I mean the large paved lofty space in which they used to make the beer, and where the brewing utensils still were. When I first went into it, and, rather oppressed by its gloom, stood near the door looking about me, I saw her pass among the extinguished fires, and ascend some light iron stairs, and go out by a gallery high overhead, as if she were going out into the sky. It was in this place, and at this moment, that a strange thing happened to my fancy. I thought it a strange thing then, and I thought it a stranger thing long afterwards. I turned my eyes, a little dimmed by looking up at the frosty light, towards a great wooden beam in a low nook of the building near me on my right hand, and I saw a figure hanging there by the neck, a figure all in yellow-white, with but one shoe to the feet, and it hung so, that I could see that the faded trimmings of the dress were like earthy paper, and that the face was Miss Havisham's, with a movement going over the whole countenance as if she were trying to call to me. In the terror of seeing the figure, and in the terror of being certain that it had not been there a moment before, 
I at first ran from it, and then ran towards it, and my terror was greatest of all when I found no figure there. Nothing less than the frosty light of the cheerful sky, the sight of people passing beyond the bars of the courtyard gate, and the reviving influence of the rest of the bread and meat and beer, would have brought me round. Even with those aids I might not have come to myself as soon as I did, but that I saw Estella approaching with the keys, to let me out. She would have some fair reason for looking down upon me, I thought, if she saw me frightened, and she would have no fair reason. She gave me a triumphant glance in passing me, as if she rejoiced that my hands were so coarse and my boots were so thick, and she opened the gate and stood holding it. I was passing out without looking at her when she touched me with a taunting hand. "'Why don't you cry?' "'Because I don't want to.' "'You do,' said she. "'You have been crying till you are half blind, and you are near crying again now.' She laughed contemptuously, pushed me out, and locked the gate upon me. I went straight to Mr. Pumblechook's, and was immensely relieved to find him not at home. So, leaving word with the shopman on what day I was wanted at Miss Havisham's again, I set off on the four-mile walk to our forge, pondering, as I went along, on all I had seen, and deeply revolving that I was a common labouring boy, that my hands were coarse, that my boots were thick, that I had fallen into a despicable habit of calling knaves jacks, that I was much more ignorant than I had considered myself last night, and generally that I was in a low-lived bad way. End of chapter Chapter 9 of Great Expectations This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens Chapter 9 When I reached home, my sister was very curious to know all about Miss Havisham's, and asked a number of questions. And I soon found myself getting heavily bumped from behind in the nape of the neck and the small of the back, and having my face ignominiously shoved against the kitchen wall, because I did not answer those questions at sufficient length. If a dread of not being understood be hidden in the breasts of other young people to anything like the extent to which it used to be hidden in mine, which I consider probable, as I have no particular reason to suspect myself of having been a monstrosity, it is the key to many reservations. I felt convinced that if I described Miss Havisham's as my eyes had seen it, I should not be understood. Not only that, but I felt convinced that Miss Havisham, too, would not be understood, and although she was perfectly incomprehensible to me, I entertained an impression that there would be something coarse and treacherous in my dragging her as she really was, to say nothing of Miss Estella, before the contemplation of Mrs. Joe. Consequently, I said as little as I could, and had my face shoved against the kitchen wall. The worst of it was that the bullying old Pumblechook, preyed upon by a devouring curiosity to be informed of all I had seen and heard, came gaping over in his chaise-cart at tea-time, to have the details divulged to him and the mere sight of the torment, with his fishy eyes and mouth open, his sandy hair inquisitively on end, and his waistcoat heaving with windy arithmetic, made me vicious in my reticence. "'Well, boy,' Uncle Pumblechook began, as soon as he was seated in the chair of honour by the fire, "'how did you get on uptown?' I answered, "'Pretty well, sir,' and my sister shook her fist at me. "'Pretty well,' Mr. Pumblechook repeated. "'Pretty well is no answer. Tell us what you mean by pretty well, boy.' Whitewash on the forehead hardens the brain into a state of obstinacy, perhaps. Anyhow, with whitewash from the wall on my forehead, my obstinacy was adamantine. I reflected for some time, and then answered as if I had discovered a new idea. "'I mean pretty well.' 
My sister, with an exclamation of impatience, was going to fly at me. I had no shadow of defence, for Joe was busy in the forge, when Mr. Pumblechook interposed with, "'No, don't lose your temper. Leave this lad to me, ma'am. Leave this lad to me.' Mr. Pumblechook then turned me towards him, as if he were going to cut my hair, and said, First, to get our thoughts in order, forty-three pence. I calculated the consequence of replying, four hundred pound, and finding them against me, went as near the answer as I could, which was somewhere about eight pence off. Mr. Pumblechook then put me through my pence table from, twelve pence make one shilling, up to, forty pence make three and four pence and then triumphantly demanded, as if he had done for me, "'Now, how much is forty-three pence?' To which I replied, after a long interval of reflection, "'I don't know.' And I was so aggravated that I almost doubt if I did know. Mr. Pumblechook worked his head like a screw to screw it out of me, and said, "'Is forty-three pence seven and sixpence, three farthings, for instance?' "'Yes,' said I, and although my sister instantly boxed my ears, it was highly gratifying to me to see that the answer spoiled his joke, and brought him to a dead stop. "'Boy, what like is Miss Havisham?' Mr. Pumblechook began again when he had recovered, folding his arms tight on his chest and applying the screw. "'Very tall and dark,' I told him. "'Is she, uncle?' asked my sister. Mr. Pumblechook winked assent, from which I at once inferred that he had never seen Miss Havisham, for she was nothing of the kind. "'Good,' said Mr. Pumblechook, conceitedly. "'This is the way to have him. We are beginning to hold our own, I think, Mum.' "'I am sure, Uncle,' returned Mrs. Joe. "'I wish you had him always. You know so well how to deal with him.' "'Now, boy,' "'What was she a-doing of when you went in to-day? asked Mr. Pumblechook. "'She was sitting,' I answered, "'in a black velvet coach.' Mr. Pumblechook and Mrs. Joe stared at one another, as they well might, and both repeated, "'In a black velvet coach?' "'Yes,' said I, "'and Miss Estella, that's her niece, I think.' handed her in cake and wine at the coach-window on a gold plate, and we all had cake and wine on gold plates, and I got up behind the coach to eat mine because she told me to. "'Was anybody else there?' asked Mr. Pumblechook. Four dogs,' said I. "'Large or small?' "'Immense,' said I. "'And they fought for veal cutlets out of a silver basket.' Mr. Pumblechook and Mrs. Joe stared at one another again, in utter amazement. I was perfectly frantic, a reckless witness under the torture, and would have told them anything. "'Where was this coach, in the name of gracious?' asked my sister. "'In Miss Havisham's room.' They stared again. "'But there weren't any horses to it.' I added this saving clause, in the moment of rejecting four richly caparisoned coursers, which I had had wild thoughts of harnessing. "'Can this be, uncle?' asked Mrs. Joe. "'What can the boy mean?' "'I'll tell you, mum,' said Mr. Pumblechook. "'My opinion is, it's a sedan-chair. She's flighty, you know. Very flighty. Quite flighty enough to pass her days in a sedan-chair.' "'Did you ever see her in it, uncle?' asked Mrs. Joe. "'How could I?' he returned, forced to the admission. "'When I never see her in my life, never clapped eyes upon her.' "'Goodness, uncle! And yet you have spoken to her?' "'Why, don't you know,' said Mr. Pumblechook testily, "'that when I have been there I have been took up to the outside of her door, and the door has stood ajar.' and she has spoke to me that way. Don't say you don't know that, Mum. Howsoever, the boy went there to play. What did you play at, boy?' "'We played with flags,' I said. 
I beg to observe that I think of myself with amazement when I recall the lies I told on this occasion. "'Flags!' echoed my sister. "'Yes,' said I. "'Estella waved a blue flag, and I waved a red one, and Miss Havisham waved one sprinkled all over with little gold stars out at the coach-window, and then we all waved our swords and hurrahed. "'Swords!' repeated my sister. "'Where did you get swords from?' out of a cupboard said i and i saw pistols in it and jam and pills and there was no daylight in the room but it was all lighted up with candles that's true mum said mr pumblechook with a grave nod that's the state of the case for that much i've seen myself and then they both stared at me and i with an obtrusive show of artlessness on my countenance stared at them and plaited the right leg of my trousers with my right hand. If they had asked me any more questions, I should undoubtedly have betrayed myself, for I was even then on the point of mentioning that there was a balloon in the yard, and should have hazarded the statement, but for my invention being divided between that phenomenon and a bear in the brewery. They were so much occupied, however, in discussing the marvels I had already presented for their consideration, that I escaped. The subject still held them when Joe came in from his work to have a cup of tea. To whom my sister, more for the relief of her own mind than for the gratification of his, related my pretended experiences. Now, when I saw Joe open his blue eyes and roll them all round the kitchen in helpless amazement, I was overtaken with penitence, and only as regarded him, not in the least as regarded the other two, Towards Joe, and Joe only, I considered myself a young monster, while they sat debating what results would come to me from Miss Havisham's acquaintance and favour. They had no doubt that Miss Havisham would do something for me, their doubts related to the form that something would take. My sister stood out for property. Mr. Pumblechook was in favour of a handsome premium for binding me apprentice to some genteel trade say, the corn and seed trade, for instance. Joe fell into the deepest disgrace with both, for offering the bright suggestion that I might only be presented with one of the dogs who had fought for the veal cutlets. "'If a fool's head can't express better opinions than that,' said my sister, "'and you have got any work to do, you had better go and do it.' So he went. After Mr. Pumblechook had driven off, and when my sister was washing up, I stole into the forge to Joe, and remained by him until he had done for the night. Then I said, "'Before the fires go out, Joe, I should like to tell you something.' "'Should you, Pip?' said Joe, drawing his shoeing-stool near the forge. "'Then tell us. What is it, Pip?' "'Joe,' said I, taking hold of his rolled-up shirt-sleeve, and twisting it between my finger and thumb, you remember all that about Miss Havisham's? Remember, said Joe. I believe you. Wonderful. It's a terrible thing, Joe. It ain't true. What are you telling of, Pip? cried Joe, falling back in the greatest amazement. You don't mean to say it's— Yes, I do. It's lies, Joe. But not all of it. "'Why, sure you don't mean to say, Pip, that there was no black velvet coach?' For I stood shaking my head. "'But at least there were dogs, Pip?' "'Come, Pip,' said Joe persuasively. "'If there weren't no veal cutlets, at least there was dogs?' "'No, Joe.' "'A dog,' said Joe. "'A puppy? Come?' "'No, Joe. There was nothing at all of the kind.' As I fixed my eyes hopelessly on Joe, Joe contemplated me in dismay. "'Pip, old chap, this won't do, old fellow. I say, where do you expect to go to?' "'It's terrible, Joe, ain't it?' "'Terrible!' cried Joe. "'Awful! What possessed you?' "'I don't know what possessed me, Joe,' I replied, letting his shirt-sleeve go, and sitting down in the ashes at his feet, hanging my head. "'But I wish you hadn't taught me to call knaves at cards jacks. 
and I wish my boots weren't so thick nor my hands so coarse. And then I told Joe that I felt very miserable, and that I hadn't been able to explain myself to Mrs. Joe and Pumblechook, who were so rude to me, and that there had been a beautiful young lady at Miss Havisham's who was dreadfully proud, and that she had said I was common, and that I knew I was common, and that I wished I was not common, and that the lies had come out of it somehow, though I didn't know how. This was a case of metaphysics, at least as difficult for Joe to deal with as for me. But Joe took the case altogether out of the region of metaphysics, and by that means vanquished it. "'There's one thing you may be sure of, Pip,' said Joe, after some rumination, "'namely, that lies is lies. Howsoever they come, they didn't ought to come, and they come from the father of lies, and work round to the same. Don't you tell no more of em, Pip. That ain't the way to get out of being common, old chap. And as to being common, I don't make it out at all clear. You are uncommon in some things. You're uncommon small. Likewise, you're an uncommon scholar. No, I, I am ignorant and backward, Joe. Why, see what a letter you wrote last night. Wrote in print, even. I've seen letters. Ah! and from gentlefolks, that I'll swear weren't wrote in print," said Joe. "'I have learnt next to nothing, Joe. You think much of me. It's only that.' "'Well, Pip,' said Joe, "'be it so, or be it so -ant. You must be a common scholar afore you can be an uncommon one, I should hope. The king upon his throne, with his crown upon his head, can't sit and write his acts of parliament in print without having begun when he was an unpromoted prince with the alphabet ah added joe with a shake of the head that was full of meaning and begun at a too and worked his way to z and i know what that is to do though i can't say i've exactly done it there was some hope in this piece of wisdom and it rather encouraged me whether common ones as to callings and earnings, pursued Joe, reflectively, mightn't be the better of continuing for to keep company with common ones, instead of going out to play with uncommon ones, which reminds me to hope that there was a flag, perhaps? No, Joe. I'm sorry there weren't a flag, Pip. Whether that might be or mightn't be, is a thing as can't be looked into now, without putting your sister on the rampage, and that's a thing not to be thought of as being done intentional. Looky here, Pip, at what is said to you by a true friend, which this to you the true friends say. If you can't get to be uncommon through going straight, you'll never get to do it through going crooked. So don't tell no more on em, Pip, and live well and die happy." You are not angry with me, Joe? No, old chap. But bearing in mind that them were which I mean to say of a stunning and outdacious sort, alluding to them which bordered on veal cutlets and dog-fighting, a sincere well-wisher would advise, Pip, their being dropped into your meditations when you go upstairs to bed. That's all, old chap, and don't never do it no more. When I got up to my little room and said my prayers, I did not forget Joe's recommendation, and yet my young mind was in that disturbed and unthankful state that I thought long after I laid me down, how common Estella would consider Joe, a mere blacksmith, how thick his boots, and how coarse his hands. I thought how Joe and my sister were then sitting in the kitchen, and how I had come up to bed from the kitchen, and how Miss Havisham and Estella never sat in a kitchen, but were far above the level of such common doings. I fell asleep recalling what I used to do when I was at Miss Havisham's, as though I had been there weeks or months instead of hours, and as though it were quite an old subject of remembrance, instead of one that had arisen only that day. That was a memorable day to me, for it made great changes in me, but it is the same with any life. Imagine one selected day, struck out of it, 
and think how different its course would have been. Pause you who read this, and think for a moment of the long chain of iron or gold, of thorns or flowers, that would never have bound you, but for the formation of the first link on one memorable day. End of chapter Chapter Ten of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter Ten. The felicitous idea occurred to me a morning or two later when I woke, that the best step I could take towards making myself uncommon was to get out of Biddy everything she knew. In pursuance of this luminous conception I mentioned to Biddy when I went to Mr. Wopsle's great aunt's at night, that I had a particular reason for wishing to get on in life, and that I should feel very much obliged to her if she would impart all her learning to me. Biddy, who was the most obliging of girls, immediately said she would, and indeed began to carry out her promise within five minutes. The educational scheme or course established by Mr. Wopsle's great aunt may be resolved into the following synopsis. The pupils ate apples and put straws down one another's backs, until Mr. Wopsle's great aunt collected her energies and made an indiscriminate totter at them with a birch rod. After receiving the charge with every mark of derision, the pupils formed in line and buzzingly passed a ragged book from hand to hand. The book had an alphabet in it, some figures and tables, and a little spelling. That is to say, it had had once. As soon as this volume began to circulate, Mr. Wopsle's great aunt fell into a state of coma, arising either from sleep or a rheumatic paroxysm. The pupils then entered among themselves upon a competitive examination on the subject of boots, with the view of ascertaining who could tread the hardest upon whose toes. This mental exercise lasted until Biddy made a rush at them, and distributed three defaced Bibles, shaped as if they had been unskillfully cut off the chump end of something, more illegibly printed at the best than any curiosities of literature I have since met with speckled all over with iron mould, and having various specimens of the insect world smashed between their leaves. This part of the course was usually lightened by several single combats between Biddy and refractory students. When the fights were over, Biddy gave out the number of a page, and then we all read aloud what we could, or what we couldn't, in a frightful chorus. Biddy leading with a high, shrill, monotonous voice, and none of us having the least notion of— or reverence for, what we were reading about. When this horrible din had lasted a certain time, it mechanically awoke Mr. Wopsle's great aunt, who staggered at a boy fortuitously and pulled his ears. This was understood to terminate the course for the evening, and we emerged into the air with shrieks of intellectual victory. It is fair to remark that there was no prohibition against any pupils entertaining himself with a slate or even with the ink, when there was any, but that it was not easy to pursue that branch of study in the winter season, on account of the little general shop in which the classes were holden, and which was also Mr. Wopsle's great-aunt's sitting-room and bedchamber, being but faintly illuminated through the agency of one low-spirited clip-candle and no snuffers. It appeared to me that it would take time to become uncommon under these circumstances. Nevertheless, I resolved to try it, and that very evening Biddy entered on our special agreement by imparting some information from her little catalogue of prices, under the head of moist sugar, and leading me to copy at home a large old English D, which she had imitated from the heading of some newspaper, and which I supposed, until she told me what it was, to be a design for a buckle. Of course there was a public house in the village, and of course Joe liked sometimes to smoke his pipe there. I had received strict orders from my sister to call for him at the three jolly bargemen that evening, on my way from school, and bring him home at my peril. 
To the three jolly bargemen, therefore, I directed my steps. There was a bar at the jolly bargemen, with some alarmingly long chalk scores in it, on the wall at the side of the door, which seemed to me to be never paid off. They had been there ever since I could remember, and had grown more than I had. But there was a quantity of chalk about our country, and perhaps the people neglected no opportunity of turning it to account. It being Saturday night, I found the landlord looking rather grimly at these records, but as my business was with Joe and not with him, I merely wished him good evening, and passed into the common room at the end of the passage, where there was a bright large kitchen fire, and where Joe was smoking his pipe in company with Mr. Wopsle and a stranger. Joe greeted me as usual with, "'Hallo, Pip, old chap!' and the moment he said that the stranger turned his head and looked at me. He was a secret-looking man, whom I have never seen before. His head was all on one side, and one of his eyes was half shut up, as if he were taking aim at something with an invisible gun. He had a pipe in his mouth, and he took it out, and, after slowly blowing all his smoke away and looking hard at me all the time, nodded. So I nodded, and then he nodded again, and made room on the settle beside him that I might sit down there. But as I was used to sit beside Joe, whenever I entered that place of resort, I said, "'No, thank you, sir,' and fell into the space Joe made for me on the opposite settle. The strange man, after glancing at Joe and seeing that his attention was otherwise engaged, nodded to me again when I had taken my seat, and then rubbed his leg in a very odd way, as it struck me. "'You was saying,' said the strange man, turning to Joe, "'that you was a blacksmith.' "'Yes, I said it, you know,' said Joe. "'What'll you drink, mister? You didn't mention your name, by the by.' Joe mentioned it now, and the strange man called him by it. "'What'll you drink, mister Gargery, at my expense, to top up with?' "'Well,' said Joe, "'to tell you the truth, I ain't much in the habit of drinking at anybody's expense but my own.' "'Habit? No,' returned the stranger. "'But once in a way, and on a Saturday night, too. Come, put a name to it, Mr. Gargery.' "'I wouldn't wish to be stiff company,' said Joe. "'Rum.' "'Rum,' repeated the stranger. "'And will the other gentlemen originate a sentiment?' "'Rum,' said Mr. Wopsle. Three rums,' cried the stranger, calling to the landlord. "'Glasses round!' "'This other gentleman,' observed Joe, by way of introducing Mr. Wopsle, "'is a gentleman that you would like to hear give it out, our clerk at church.' "'Aha!' said the stranger quickly, and cocking his eye at me. THE LONELY CHURCH, RIGHT OUT ON THE MARSHES, WITH GRAVES ROUND IT. THAT'S IT, SAID JOE. THE STRANGER, WITH A COMFORTABLE KIND OF GRUNT OVER HIS PIPE, PUT HIS LEGS UP ON THE SETTLE THAT HE HAD TO HIMSELF. HE WORE A FLAPPING, BROAD-BRIMMED TRAVELER'S HAT, AND UNDER IT A HANDKERCHIEF TIED OVER HIS HEAD IN THE MANNER OF A CAP, SO THAT HE SHOWED NO HAIR. AS HE LOOKED AT THE FIRE, I THOUGHT I SAW A CUNNING EXPRESSION followed by a half-laugh, come into his face. "'I am not acquainted with this country, gentlemen, but it seems a solitary country, towards the river.' "'Most marshes is solitary,' said Joe. "'No doubt, no doubt. Do you find any gypsies now, or tramps, or vagrants of any sort, out there?' "'No,' said Joe. "'None but a runaway convict now and then.' and we don't find them easy, eh, Mr. Wopsle? Mr. Wopsle, with a majestic remembrance of old discomfiture, assented, but not warmly. "'Seems you have been out after such,' asked the stranger. "'Once,' returned Joe. "'Not that we wanted to take them, you understand. We went out as lookers-on, me and Mr. Wopsle and Pip. Didn't us, Pip?' "'Yes, Joe.' The stranger looked at me again, still cocking his eye, as if he were expressly taking aim at me with his invisible gun, and said, "'He's a likely young parcel of bones, that. What is it you call him?' 
"'Pip,' said Joe. "'Christened Pip?' "'No, not christened Pip.' "'Surname Pip.' "'No,' said Joe. "'It's a kind of family name that he gave himself when an infant, and is called by. "'Son of yours?' "'Well,' said Joe, meditatively, "'not of course that it could be in any wise necessary to consider about it, "'but because it was the way at the Jolly Bargeman "'to seem to consider deeply about everything that was discussed over pipes. "'Well, no. No, he ain't.' "'Nevy?' said the strange man. "'Well,' said Joe, with the same appearance of profound cogitation, "'he is not, no, not to deceive you, he is not my nevy.' "'What the blue blazes is he?' asked the stranger, which appeared to me to be an inquiry of unnecessary strength. Mr. Wopsle struck in upon that, as one who knew all about relationships, having professional occasion to bear in mind what female relations a man might not marry, and expounded the ties between me and Joe. Having his hand in, Mr. Wopsle finished off with a most terrifically snarling passage from Richard the Third, and seemed to think he had done quite enough to account for it when he added, "'As the poet says.' And here I may remark that when Mr. Wopsle referred to me— he considered it a necessary part of such reference to rumple my hair and poke it into my eyes. I cannot conceive why everybody of his standing who visited at our house should always have put me through the same inflammatory process under similar circumstances. Yet I do not call to mind that I was ever in my earlier youth the subject of remark in our social family circle, but some large-handed person took some such ophthalmic steps to patronize me. All this while the strange man looked at nobody but me, and looked at me as if he were determined to have a shot at me at last, and bring me down. But he said nothing after offering his blue blazes observation, until the glasses of rum and water were brought, and then he made his shot, and a most extraordinary shot it was. It was not a verbal remark, but a proceeding in dumb show, and was pointedly addressed to me. He stirred his rum and water pointedly at me, and he tasted his rum and water pointedly at me, and he stirred it, and he tasted it, not with a spoon that was brought to him, but with a file. He did this so that nobody but I saw the file, and when he had done it he wiped the file and put it in a breast pocket. I knew it to be Joe's file, and I knew that he knew my convict the moment I saw the instrument. I sat gazing at him, spellbound, but he now reclined on his saddle, taking very little notice of me, and talking principally about turnips. There was a delicious sense of cleaning up and making a quiet pause before going on in life afresh, in our village on Saturday nights, which stimulated Joe to dare to stay out half an hour longer on Saturdays than at other times the half-hour and the rum and water running out together, Joe got up to go, and took me by the hand. "'Stop half a moment, Mr. Gargery," said the strange man. "'I think I've got a bright new shilling somewhere in my pocket, and if I have, the boy shall have it.' He looked it out from a handful of small change, folded it in some crumpled paper, and gave it to me. "'Yours,' said he. "'Mind, your own. I thanked him, staring at him far beyond the bounds of good manners, and holding tight to Joe. He gave Joe good night, and he gave Mr. Wopsle good night, who went out with us, and he gave me only a look with his aiming eye. No, not a look, for he shut it up, but wonders may be done with an eye by hiding it. On the way home, if I had been in a humour for talking, the talk must have been all on my side, for Mr. Wopsle parted from us at the door of the Jolly Bargeman, and Joe went all the way home with his mouth wide open, to rinse the rum out with as much air as possible. But I was in a manner stupefied by this turning up of my old misdeed and old acquaintance, and could think of nothing else. My sister was not in a very bad temper when we presented ourselves in the kitchen, and Joe was encouraged by that unusual circumstance to tell her about the bright shilling. "'A bad un, I'll be bound,' 
said Mrs. Joe triumphantly, or he wouldn't have given it to the boy. Let's look at it. I took it out of the paper, and it proved to be a good one. But what's this? said Mrs. Joe, throwing down the shilling and catching up the paper. Two one-pound notes! Nothing less than two fat, sweltering, one-pound notes that seem to have been on terms of the warmest intimacy with all the cattle markets in the county. Joe caught up his hat again, and ran with them to the jolly bargeman to restore them to their owner. While he was gone, I sat down on my usual stool and looked vacantly at my sister, feeling pretty sure that the man would not be there. Presently Joe came back, saying that the man was gone, but that he, Joe, had left word at the three jolly bargemen concerning the notes. Then my sister sealed them up in a piece of paper, and put them under some dried rose-leaves in an ornamental teapot, on the top of a press in the state parlour. There they remained, a nightmare to me, many and many a night and day. I had sadly broken sleep when I got to bed, through thinking of the strange man taking aim at me with his invisible gun, and of the guiltily coarse and common thing it was to be on secret terms of conspiracy with convicts, a feature in my low career that I had previously forgotten. I was haunted by the file, too. A dread possessed me that when I least expected it, the file would reappear. I coaxed myself to sleep by thinking of Miss Havisham's next Wednesday, and in my sleep I saw the file coming at me out of a door, without seeing who held it, and I screamed myself awake. End of chapter Chapter 11 of Great Expectations this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens Chapter 11 At the appointed time I returned to Miss Havisham's, and my hesitating ring at the gate brought out Estella. She locked it after admitting me, as she had done before, and again preceded me into the dark passage where her candle stood. She took no notice of me until she had the candle in her hand, when she looked over her shoulder, superciliously saying, "'You are to come this way to-day,' and took me to quite another part of the house. The passage was a long one, and seemed to pervade the whole square basement of the manor-house. We traversed but one side of the square, however, and at the end of it she stopped and put her candle down and opened a door. Here the daylight reappeared, and I found myself in a small paved courtyard, the opposite side of which was formed by a detached dwelling-house that looked as if it had once belonged to the manager or head clerk of the extinct brewery. There was a clock in the outer wall of this house, like the clock in Miss Havisham's room, and like Miss Havisham's watch, it had stopped at twenty minutes to nine. We went in the door, which stood open, and into a gloomy room with a low ceiling, on the ground floor at the back. There was some company in the room, and Estella said to me as she joined it, "'You are to go and stand there, boy, till you are wanted.' There, being the window, I crossed to it, and stood there, in a very uncomfortable state of mind, looking out. It opened to the ground, and looked into a most miserable corner of the neglected garden, upon a rank ruin of cabbage-stalks, and one box-tree that had been clipped round long ago, like a pudding, and had a new growth at the top of it, out of shape and of a different colour, as if that part of the pudding had stuck to the saucepan and got burnt. This was my homely thought, as I contemplated the box-tree. There had been some light snow overnight, and it lay nowhere else to my knowledge, but it had not quite melted from the cold shadow of this bit of garden, and the wind caught it up in little eddies and threw it at the window, as if it pelted me for coming there. I divined that my coming had stopped conversation in the room, and that its other occupants were looking at me. I could see nothing of the room except the shining of the fire in the window-glass, 
but I stiffened in all my joints with the consciousness that I was under close inspection. There were three ladies in the room, and one gentleman. Before I had been standing at the window five minutes, they somehow conveyed to me that they were all toadies and humbugs, but that each of them pretended not to know that the others were toadies and humbugs, because the admission that he or she did know it would have made him or her out to be a toady and humbug. They all had a listless and dreary air of waiting somebody's pleasure, and the most talkative of the ladies had to speak quite rigidly to repress a yawn. This lady, whose name was Camilla, very much reminded me of my sister, with the difference that she was older, and, as I found out when I caught sight of her, of a blunter cast of features. Indeed, when I knew her better, I began to think it was a mercy she had any features at all, so very blank and high was the dead wall of her face. "'Poor dear soul!' said this lady, with an abruptness of manner quite my sister's. "'Nobody's enemy but his own.' "'It would be much more commendable to be somebody else's enemy,' said the gentleman. "'Far more natural.' "'Cousin Raymond,' observed another lady, "'we are to love our neighbour. "'Sarah Pocket,' returned Cousin Raymond, "'if a man is not his own neighbour, who is?' Miss Pocket laughed, and Camilla laughed, and said, checking a yawn, "'The idea!' But I thought they seemed to think it rather a good idea, too. The other lady, who had not spoken yet, said gravely and emphatically, "'Very true.' "'Poor soul!' Camilla presently went on. I knew they had all been looking at me in the meantime. "'He is so very strange. Would anyone believe that when Tom's wife died he actually could not be induced to see the importance of the children's having the deepest of trimmings in their mourning? "'Good Lord!' says he. "'Camilla, what can it signify so long as the poor bereaved little things are in black? So like, Matthew, the idea!' "'Good points in him, good points in him,' said Cousin Raymond. Heaven forbid I should deny good points in him, but he never had, and he never will have, any sense of the proprieties. "'You know I was obliged,' said Camilla. "'I was obliged to be firm. I said, it will not do, for the credit of the family. I told him that, without deep trimmings, the family was disgraced. I cried about it from breakfast till dinner. I injured my digestion.' and at last he flung out in his violent way and said with a d then do as you like thank goodness it will always be a consolation to me to know that i instantly went out in a pouring rain and bought the things he paid for them did he not asked estella it's not the question my dear child who paid for them returned camilla i bought them and i shall often think of that with peace when i wake up in the night the ringing of a distant bell, combined with the echoing of some cry or call along the passage by which I had come, interrupted the conversation, and caused Estella to say to me, "'Now, boy!' On my turning round, they all looked at me with the utmost contempt, and as I went out I heard Sarah Pocket say, "'Well, I am sure. What next?' And Camilla add, with indignation, "'Was there ever such a fancy, the idea?' As we were going with our candle along the dark passage, Estella stopped all of a sudden, and facing round, said in her taunting manner, with her face quite close to mine, "'Well?' "'Well, miss?' I answered, almost falling over her and checking myself. She stood looking at me, and of course I stood looking at her. "'Am I pretty?' "'Yes, I think you are very pretty.' "'Am I insulting?' "'Not so much so as you were last time,' said I. "'Not so much so? No.' She fired when she asked the last question, and she slapped my face with such force as she had when I answered it. "'Now,' said she, "'you little coarse monster, what do you think of me now?' "'I shall not tell you.' "'Because you are going to tell upstairs, is that it?' "'No,' said I. 
that's not it. Why don't you cry again, you little wretch? Because I'll never cry for you again, said I, which was, I suppose, as false a declaration as ever was made, for I was inwardly crying for her then, and I know what I know of the pain she cost me afterwards. We went on our way upstairs after this episode, and as we were going up, we met a gentleman groping his way down. "'Home have we here?' asked the gentleman, stopping and looking at me. "'A boy?' said Estella. He was a burly man of an exceedingly dark complexion, with an exceedingly large head, and a corresponding large hand. He took my chin in his large hand, and turned up my face to have a look at me by the light of the candle. He was prematurely bald on the top of his head, and had bushy black eyebrows that wouldn't lie down, but stood up bristling. His eyes were set very deep in his head, and were disagreeably sharp and suspicious. He had a large watch-chain, and strong black dots where his beard and whiskers would have been if he had let them. He was nothing to me, and I could have had no foresight then that he ever would be anything to me. But it happened that I had this opportunity of observing him well. "'Boy of the neighbourhood, hey?' said he. "'Yes, sir,' said I. "'How do you come here?' "'Miss Havisham sent for me, sir,' I explained. "'Well?' "'Behave yourself. I have a pretty large experience of boys, and you're a bad set of fellows. Now mind,' said he, biting the side of his great forefinger as he frowned at me, "'you behave yourself.' With these words he released me, which I was glad of, for his hand smelt of scented soap, and went his way downstairs. I wondered whether he could be a doctor. But no, I thought, he couldn't be a doctor or he would have a quieter and more persuasive manner. There was not much time to consider the subject, for we were soon in Miss Havisham's room, where she and everything else were just as I had left them. Estella left me standing near the door, and I stood there until Miss Havisham cast her eyes upon me from the dressing-table. So, she said, without being startled or surprised, "'The days have worn away, have they?' "'Yes, ma'am, to-day is—' "'There, there, there,' with the impatient movement of her fingers. "'I don't want to know. Are you ready to play?' I was obliged to answer in some confusion. "'I don't think I am, ma'am.' "'Not at cards again,' she demanded, with a searching look. "'Yes, ma'am, I could do that if I was wanted.' "'Since this house strikes you old and grave, boy,' said Miss Havisham impatiently, "'and you are unwilling to play, are you willing to work?' I could answer this inquiry with a better heart than I had been able to find for the other question, and I said I was quite willing. "'Then go into that opposite room,' said she, pointing at the door behind me with her withered hand, "'and wait there till I come.' I crossed the staircase landing, and entered the room she indicated. From that room, too, the daylight was completely excluded, and it had an airless smell that was oppressive. A fire had been lately kindled in the damp, old-fashioned grate, and it was more disposed to go out than to burn up, and the reluctant smoke which hung in the room seemed colder than the clearer air, like our own marsh mist. Certain wintry branches of candles on the high chimney-piece faintly lighted the chamber, or it would be more expressive to say, faintly troubled its darkness. It was spacious, and I dare say had once been handsome, but every discernible thing in it was covered with dust and mould, and dropping to pieces. The most prominent object was a long table with a tablecloth spread on it, as if a feast had been in preparation when the house and the clocks all stopped together and a pern, or centerpiece of some kind, was in the middle of this cloth. It was so heavily overhung with cobwebs that its form was quite indistinguishable, and as I looked along the yellow expanse out of which I remember it seeming to grow, like a black fungus, I saw speckle-legged spiders with blotchy bodies running home to it, and running out from it, 
as if some circumstances of the greatest public importance had just transpired in the spider community. I heard the mice, too, rattling behind the panels, as if the same occurrence were important to their interests. But the black beetles took no notice of the agitation, and groped about the hearth in a ponderous elderly way, as if they were short-sighted and hard of hearing, and not on terms with one another. These crawling things had fascinated my attention, and I was watching them from a distance, when Miss Havisham laid a hand upon my shoulder. In her other hand she had a crutch-headed stick on which she leaned, and she looked like the witch of the place. "'This,' said she, pointing to the long table with her stick, "'is where I will be laid when I am dead. They shall come and look at me here.' With some vague misgiving that she might get upon the table then and there, and die at once, the complete realization of the ghastly waxwork at the fair, I shrank under her touch. "'What do you think that is?' she asked me, again pointing with her stick. "'That, where those cobwebs are?' "'I can't guess what it is, ma'am. "'It's a great cake, a bride cake, mine!' She looked all round the room in a glaring manner, and then said, leaning on me while her hand twitched my shoulder, "'Come, come, come! Walk me! Walk me!' I made out from this that the work I had to do was to walk Miss Havisham round and round the room. Accordingly I started at once, and she leaned upon my shoulder, and we went away at a pace that might have been an imitation, founded on my first impulse under that roof, of Mr. Pumblechook's chaise-cart. She was not physically strong, and after a little time said, "'Slower!' Still we went at an impatient fitful speed, and as we went she twitched the hand upon my shoulder and worked her mouth, and led me to believe that we were going fast because her thoughts went fast. After a while she said, "'Call Estella!' So I went out on the landing and roared that name as I had done on the previous occasion. When her light appeared, I returned to Miss Havisham, and we started away again round and round the room. If only Estella had come to be a spectator of our proceedings, I should have felt sufficiently discontented, but as she brought with her the three ladies and the gentlemen whom I had seen below, I didn't know what to do. In my politeness I would have stopped— but Miss Havisham twitched my shoulder, and we posted on, with a shame-faced consciousness on my part that they would think it was all my doing. "'Dear Miss Havisham,' said Miss Sarah Pocket, "'how well you look!' "'I do not,' returned Miss Havisham. "'I am yellow skin and bone.' Camilla brightened when Miss Pocket met with this rebuff, and she murmured, as she plaintively contemplated Miss Havisham, "'Poor dear soul! Certainly not to be expected to look well, poor thing! The idea!' "'And how are you?' said Miss Havisham to Camilla. As we were close to Camilla, then, I would have stopped as a matter of course, only Miss Havisham wouldn't stop. We swept on, and I felt that I was highly obnoxious to Camilla. "'Thank you, Miss Havisham,' she returned. "'I am as well as can be expected.' "'Why, what's the matter with you?' asked Miss Havisham, with exceeding sharpness. "'Nothing worth mentioning,' replied Camilla. "'I don't wish to make a display of my feelings, but I have habitually thought of you more in the night than I am quite equal to.' "'Then don't think of me,' retorted Miss Havisham. "'Very easily said,' remarked Camilla, amiably repressing a sob while a hitch came into her upper lip, and her tears overflowed. "'Raymond is a witness what ginger and sal volatile I am obliged to take in the night. Raymond is a witness what nervous jerkings I have in my legs. Chokings and nervous jerkings, however, are nothing new to me when I think with anxiety of those I love. If I could be less affectionate and sensitive, I should have a better digestion and an iron set of nerves. I am sure I wish it could be so. But as to not thinking of you in the night, the idea! Here a burst of tears. The Raymond referred to, I understood to be the gentleman present, 
and him I understood to be Mr. Camilla. He came to the rescue at this point, and said in a consolatory and complimentary voice, "'Camilla, my dear, it is well known that your family feelings are gradually undermining you, to the extent of making one of your legs shorter than the other.' "'I am not aware,' observed the grave lady whose voice I had heard but once, "'that to think of any person is to make a great claim upon that person, my dear.' Miss Sarah Pocket, whom I now saw to be a little dry, brown, corrugated old woman, with a small face that might have been made of walnut shells, and a large mouth like a cat's without the whiskers, supported this position by saying, uh, "'No, indeed, my dear, hen. "'Thinking is easy enough,' said the grave lady. "'What is easier, you know?' assented Miss Sarah Pocket. "'Oh, yes, yes!' cried Camilla, whose fermenting feelings appeared to rise from her legs to her bosom. "'It's all very true. It's a weakness to be so affectionate, but I can't help it. No doubt my health would be much better if it were otherwise. Still I wouldn't change my disposition if I could. It's the cause of much suffering, but it's a consolation to know I possess it when I wake up in the night.' Here another burst of feeling. Miss Havisham and I had never stopped all this time, and kept going round and round the room, now brushing against the skirts of the visitors, now giving them the whole length of the dismal chamber. "'There's Matthew,' said Camilla, "'never mixing with any natural ties, never coming here to see how Miss Havisham is. I have taken to the sofa with my stay-lace cut, and have lain there hours insensible, with my head over the side, and my hair all down, and my feet I don't know where. "'Much higher than your head, my love,' said Mr. Camilla. "'I have gone off into that state hours and hours on account of Matthew's strange and inexplicable conduct, and nobody has thanked me.' "'Really, I must say, I should think not,' interposed the grave lady. "'You see, my dear,' added Miss Sarah Pocket, a blandly vicious personage, the question to put to yourself is, who do you expect to thank you, my love? Without expecting any thanks or anything of the sort, resumed Camilla, I have remained in that state hours and hours, and Raymond is a witness of the extent to which I have choked, and what the total inefficacy of ginger has been, and I have been heard at the pianoforte tuners across the street, where the poor mistaken children have even supposed it to be pigeons cooing at a distance. And now to be told— Here Camilla put her hand to her throat, and began to be quite chemical as to the formation of new combinations there. When this same Matthew was mentioned, Miss Havisham stopped me and herself, and stood looking at the speaker. This change had a great influence in bringing Camilla's chemistry to a sudden end. "'Matthew will come and see me at last,' said Miss Havisham sternly. "'When I am laid on that table, that will be his place there,' striking the table with her stick, "'at my head, and yours will be there, and your husband's there, and Sarah Pocket's there.' and Georgiana's there. Now you all know where to take your stations when you come to feast upon me. And now go. At the mention of each name she had struck the table with her stick in a new place. She now said, Walk me, walk me, and we went on again. I suppose there's nothing to be done, exclaimed Camilla, but comply and depart. It's something to have seen the object of one's love and duty for even so short a time. I shall think of it with a melancholy satisfaction when I wake up in the night. I wish Matthew could have that comfort, but he sets it at defiance. I am determined not to make a display of my feelings, but it's very hard to be told one wants to feast on one's relations, as if one was a giant, and to be told to go, the bare idea." Mr. Camilla interposing, as Mrs. Camilla laid her hands upon her heaving bosom, 
that lady assumed an unnatural fortitude of manner which I supposed to be expressive of an intention to drop and choke when out of view, and kissing her hand to Miss Havisham, was escorted forth. Sarah Pocket and Georgiana contended who shall remain last, but Sarah was too knowing to be outdone, and ambled round Georgiana with that artful slipperiness that the latter was obliged to take precedence. Sarah Pocket then made her separate effect of departing with, "'Bless you, Miss Havisham, dear,' and with a smile of forgiving pity on her walnut-shell countenance for the weaknesses of the rest. While Estella was away lighting them down, Miss Havisham still walked with her hand on my shoulder, but more and more slowly. At last she stopped before the fire, and said, after muttering and looking at it some seconds, "'This is my birthday, Pip.' I was going to wish her many happy returns, when she lifted her stick. "'I don't suffer it to be spoken of. I don't suffer those who were here just now, or any one, to speak of it. They come here on the day, but they dare not refer to it.' Of course I made no further effort to refer to it. "'On this day of the year, long before you were born, this heap of decay,' stabbing with her crutched stick at the pile of cobwebs on the table, but not touching it, "'was brought here. It and I have worn away together. The mice have gnawed at it, and sharper teeth than teeth of mice have gnawed at me.' She held the head of her stick against her heart, as she stood looking at the table, she in her once white dress, all yellow and withered, the once white cloth all yellow and withered, everything around in a state to crumble under a touch. "'When the ruin is complete,' said she, with a ghastly look, "'and when they lay me dead, in my bride's dress on the bride's table, which shall be done, and which will be the finished curse upon him, so much the better if it is done on this day. She stood looking at the table as if she stood looking at her own figure lying there. I remained quiet. Estella returned, and she too remained quiet. It seemed to me that we continued thus for a long time. In the heavy air of the room, and the heavy darkness that brooded in its remoter corners, I even had an alarming fancy that Estella and I might presently begin to decay. At length, not coming out of her distraught state by degrees, but in an instant, Miss Avisham said, "'Let me see you two play cards. Why have you not begun?' With that we returned to her room, and sat down as before. I was beggared, as before, and again, as before, Miss Havisham watched us all the time, directing my attention to Estella's beauty, and made me notice it the more by trying her jewels on Estella's breast and hair. Estella, for her part, likewise treated me as before, except that she did not condescend to speak. When we had played some half-dozen games, a day was appointed for my return, and I was taken down into the yard to be fed in the former dog-like manner. There, too, I was again left to wander about as I liked." It is not much to the purpose whether a gate in that garden wall which I had scrambled up to peep over on the last occasion was, on that last occasion, open or shut. Enough that I saw no gate then, and that I saw one now. As it stood open, and as I knew that Estella had let the visitors out, for she had returned with the keys in her hand, I strolled into the garden and strolled all over it. It was quite a wilderness and there were old melon-frames and cucumber-frames in it, which seemed in their decline to have produced a spontaneous growth of weak attempts at pieces of old hats and boots, with now and then a weedy offshoot into the likeness of a battered saucepan. When I had exhausted the garden and a greenhouse with nothing in it but a fallen-down grapevine and some bottles, I found myself in the dismal corner upon which I had looked out of the window. Never questioning for a moment that the house was now empty, I looked in at another window, and found myself, to my great surprise, exchanging a broad stare with a pale young gentleman with red eyelids and light hair. This pale young gentleman quickly disappeared, and reappeared beside me. 
He had been at his books when I had found myself staring at him, and I now saw that he was inky. Hallo, said he, young fellow. Hallo, being a general observation, which I had usually observed to be best answered by itself, I said, Hallo, politely omitting young fellow. Who let you in? said he. Miss Estella. Who gave you leave to prowl about? Miss Estella. Come and fight, said the pale young gentleman. What could I do but follow him? I have often asked myself the question since, but what else could I do? His manner was so final, and I was so astonished that I followed where he led as if I had been under a spell. Stop a minute, though, he said, wheeling round before we had gone many paces. I ought to give you a reason for fighting, too. There it is. In a most irritating manner he instantly slapped his hands against one another, daintily flung one of his legs up behind him, pulled my hair, slapped his hands again, dipped his head, and butted it into my stomach. The bull-like proceedings last mentioned, besides that it was unquestionably to be regarded in the light of a liberty, was particularly disagreeable just after bread and meat. I therefore hit out at him, and was going to hit out again, when he said, "'Aha! Would you?' and began dancing backwards and forwards in a manner quite unparalleled within my limited experience. "'Laws of the game,' said he. Here he skipped from his left leg on to his right. "'Regular rules!' Here he skipped from his right leg on to his left. "'Come to the ground and go through the preliminaries!' Here he dodged backwards and forwards, and did all sorts of things while I looked helplessly at him. I was secretly afraid of him when I saw him so dexterous, but I felt morally and physically convinced that his light head of hair could have had no business in the pit of my stomach, and that I had a right to consider it irrelevant when so obtruded on my attention. Therefore I followed him without a word to a retired nook of the garden, formed by the junction of two walls and screened by some rubbish. On his asking me if I was satisfied with the ground, and on my replying yes, he begged my leave to absent himself for a moment, and quickly returned with a bottle of water and a sponge dipped in vinegar. "'Available for both,' he said, placing these against the wall, and then fell to pulling off not only his jacket and waistcoat, but his shirt, too, in a manner at once light-hearted, business-like, and bloodthirsty. Although he did not look very healthy, having pimples on his face and a breaking out at his mouth, these dreadful preparations quite appalled me. I judged him to be about my own age, but he was much taller, and he had a way of spinning himself about that was full of appearance. For the rest, he was a young gentleman in a grey suit, when not denuded for battle, with his elbows, knees, wrists, and heels considerably in advance of the rest of him, as to development. My heart failed me when I saw him squaring at me with every demonstration of mechanical nicety, and eyeing my anatomy as if he were minutely choosing his bone. I never have been so surprised in my life as I was when I let out the first blow, and saw him lying on his back, looking up at me with a bloody nose and his face exceedingly foreshortened. But he was on his feet directly, and after sponging himself with a great show of dexterity, began squaring again. The second greatest surprise I have ever had in my life was seeing him on his back again, looking up at me out of a black eye. His spirit inspired me with great respect. He seemed to have no strength, and he never once hit me hard, and he was always knocked down, but he would be up again in a moment, sponging himself or drinking out of the water-bottle, with the greatest satisfaction in seconding himself according to form and then came at me with an air and a show that made me believe he really was going to do for me at last. He got heavily bruised, for I am sorry to record that the more I hit him, the harder I hit him, but he came up again, and again, and again, until at last he got a bad fall with the back of his head against the wall. Even after that crisis in our affairs, he got up and turned round and round confusedly a few times, not knowing where I was, but finally went on his knees to his sponge, and threw it up, at the same time panting out, 
That means you have won. He seemed so brave and innocent, that although I had not proposed the contest, I felt but a gloomy satisfaction in my victory. Indeed, I go so far as to hope that I regarded myself while dressing as a species of savage young wolf or other wild beast. However, I got dressed, darkly wiping my sanguinary face at intervals, and I said, "'Can I help you?' And he said, "'No, thank ye. And I said, "'Good afternoon.' And he said, "'Same to you.' When I got into the courtyard, I found Estella waiting with the keys, but she neither asked me where I had been, nor why I kept her waiting, and there was a bright flush upon her face, as though something had happened to delight her. Instead of going straight to the gate, too, she stepped back into the passage and beckoned me. "'Come here. You may kiss me, if you like.' I kissed her cheek as she turned it to me. I think I would have gone through a great deal to kiss her cheek, but I felt that the kiss was given to the coarse common boy as a piece of money might have been, and that it was worth nothing. What with the birthday visitors, and what with the cards, and what with the fight, my stay had lasted so long that when I neared home the light on the spit of sand off the point on the marshes was gleaming against a black night sky and Joe's furnace was flinging a path of fire across the road. End of chapter Chapter 12 of Great Expectations This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens Chapter 12 My mind grew very uneasy on the subject of the pale young gentleman. The more I thought of the fight, and recalled the pale young gentleman on his back in various stages of puffy and encrimsoned countenance, the more certain it appeared that something would be done to me. I felt that the pale young gentleman's blood was on my head, and that the law would avenge it. But, without having any definite idea of the penalties I had incurred, it was clear to me that village boys could not go stalking about the country, ravaging the houses of gentlefolks, and pitching into the studious youth of England, without laying themselves open to severe punishment. For some days I even kept close at home, and looked out at the kitchen door with the greatest caution and trepidation, before going on an errand, lest the officers of the county jail should pounce upon me. The pale young gentleman's nose had stained my trousers, and I tried to wash out that evidence of my guilt in the dead of night. I had cut my knuckles against the pale young gentleman's teeth, and I twisted my imagination into a thousand tangles, as I devised incredible ways of accounting for that damnatory circumstance when I should be hailed before the judges. When the day came round for my return to the scene of the deed of violence, my terrors reached their height. Whether myrmidons of justice, specially sent down from London, would be lying in ambush behind the gate, whether Miss Havisham, preferring to take personal vengeance for an outrage done to her house, might rise in those grave clothes of hers, draw a pistol, and shoot me dead, whether suborned boys, a numerous band of mercenaries, might be engaged to fall upon me in the brewery, and cuff me until I was no more, it was high testimony to my confidence in the spirit of the pale young gentleman that I never imagined him accessory to these retaliations, they always came into my mind as the acts of injudicious relatives of his, goaded on by the state of his visage and an indignant sympathy with the family features. However, going to Miss Havisham's I must, and go I did. And behold, nothing came of the late struggle. It was not alluded to in any way and no pale young gentleman was to be discovered on the premises. I found the same gate open, and I explored the garden, and even looked in at the windows of the detached house, 
but my view was suddenly stopped by the closed shutters within, and all was lifeless. Only in the corner where the combat had taken place could I detect any evidence of the young gentleman's existence. There were traces of his gore in that spot, and I covered them with garden mould from the eye of man. On the broad landing between Miss Havisham's own room and that other room in which the long table was laid out, I saw a garden chair, a light chair on wheels, that you pushed from behind. It had been placed there since my last visit, and I entered, that same day, on a regular occupation of pushing Miss Havisham in this chair, when she was tired of walking with her hand upon my shoulder, round her own room, and across the landing, and round the other room. Over, and over, and over again, we would make these journeys, and sometimes they would last as long as three hours at a stretch. I insensibly fall into a general mention of these journeys as numerous, because it was at once settled that I should return every alternate day at noon for these purposes, and because I am now going to sum up a period of at least eight or ten months. As we began to be more used to one another, Miss Havisham talked more to me, and asked me such questions as what I had learnt, and what was I going to be. I told her I was going to be apprenticed to Joe, I believed, and I enlarged upon my knowing nothing, and wanting to know everything, in the hope that she might offer some help towards that desirable end. But she did not. On the contrary, she seemed to prefer my being ignorant. Neither did she ever give me any money, or anything but my daily dinner, nor ever stipulate that I should be paid for my services. Estella was always about, and always let me in and out, but never told me I might kiss her again. Sometimes she would coldly tolerate me, sometimes she would condescend to me, sometimes she would be quite familiar with me, sometimes she would tell me energetically that she hated me. Miss Havisham would often ask me in a whisper, or when we were alone, "'Does she grow prettier and prettier, Pip?' And when I said yes, for indeed she did, would seem to enjoy it greedily. Also, when we played at cards, Miss Havisham would look on with a miserly relish of Estella's moods, whatever they were. And sometimes, when her moods were so many and so contradictory of one another that I was puzzled what to say or do, Miss Havisham would embrace her with lavish fondness, murmuring something in her ear that sounded like, "'Break their hearts, my pride and hope! Break their hearts and have no mercy!' There was a song Joe used to hum fragments of at the forge, of which the burden was Old Clem. This was not a very ceremonious way of rendering homage to a patron saint, but I believe Old Clem stood in that relation towards Smith's. It was a song that imitated the measure of beating upon iron, and was a mere lyrical excuse for the introduction of old Clem's respected name. Thus you were to hammer boys around, old Clem, with a thump and a sound, old Clem, beat it out, beat it out, old Clem, with a click for the stout, old Clem, blow the fire, blow the fire, old Clem, roaring drier, soaring higher, old Clem. One day soon after the appearance of the chair, Miss Havisham suddenly saying to me, with the impatient movements of her fingers, There, 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 sing! I was surprised into crooning this ditty as I pushed her over the floor. It happened so to catch her fancy that she took it up in a low, brooding voice as if she were singing in her sleep. After that it became customary with us to have it as we moved about, and Estella would often join in, though the whole strain was so subdued, even when there were three of us, that it made less noise in the grim old house than the lightest breath of wind. What could I become with these surroundings? How could my character fail to be influenced by them? Is it to be wondered at if my thoughts were dazed, as my eyes were, when I came out into the natural light from the misty yellow rooms? Perhaps I might have told Joe about the pale young gentleman, if I had not previously been betrayed into those enormous inventions to which I had confessed. Under the circumstances, I felt that Joe could hardly fail to discern in the pale young gentleman 
an appropriate passenger to be put into the black velvet coach. Therefore, I said nothing of him. Besides, that shrinking from having Miss Havisham and Estella discussed, which had come upon me in the beginning, grew much more potent as time went on. I reposed complete confidence in no one but Biddy, but I told poor Biddy everything. Why it came natural to me to do so, and why Biddy had a deep concern in everything I told her, I did not know then, though I think I know now. Meanwhile, counsels went on in the kitchen at home, fraught with almost insupportable aggravation to my exaggerated spirit. That ass, Pumblechook, used often to come over of a night for the purpose of discussing my prospects with my sister, and I really do believe, to this hour with less penitence than I ought to feel, that if these hands could have taken a linchpin out of his chaise-cart, they would have done it. The miserable man was a man of that confined stolidity of mind that he could not discuss my prospects without having me before him, as it were, to operate upon, and he would drag me up from my stool, usually by the collar, when I was quiet in a corner, and putting me before the fire as if I were going to be cooked, would begin by saying, "'Now, Mum, here is this boy. Here is this boy which you have brought up by hand. Hold up your head, boy, and be forever grateful unto them which so did do. Now, Mum, with respections to this boy.' and then he would rumple my hair the wrong way, which from my earliest remembrance, as already hinted, I have in my soul denied the right of any fellow-creature to do, and would hold me before him by the sleeve, a spectacle of imbecility only to be equalled by himself. Then he and my sister would pair off in such nonsensical speculations about Miss Havisham, and about what she would do with me and for me, that I used to want— quite painfully, to burst into spiteful tears, fly at Pumblechook, and pummel him all over. In these dialogues my sister spoke to me as if she were morally wrenching one of my teeth out at every reference, while Pumblechook himself, self-constituted my patron, would sit supervising me with a depreciatory eye. Like the architect of my fortunes, who thought himself engaged on a very unremunerative job, in these discussions Joe bore no part, but he was often talked at, while they were in progress, by reason of Mrs. Joe's perceiving that he was not favourable to my being taken from the forge. I was fully old enough now to be apprenticed to Joe, and when Joe sat with a poker on his knees thoughtfully raking out the ashes between the lower bars, my sister would so distinctly construe that innocent action into opposition on his part that she would dive at him, take the poker out of his hands, shake him, and put it away. There was a most irritating end to every one of these debates. All in a moment, with nothing to lead up to it, my sister would stop herself in a yawn, and catching sight of me as if it were incidentally, would swoop upon me with, "'Come, there's enough of you. You get along to bed. You've given trouble enough for one night, I hope.' And— as if I had besought them as a favour to bother my life out. We went on in this way for a long time, and it seemed likely that we should continue to go on in this way for a long time, when one day Miss Havisham stopped short as she and I were walking, she leaning on my shoulder, and said with some displeasure, "'You are growing tall, Pip!' I thought it best to hint, through the medium of a meditative look, that this might be occasioned by circumstances over which I had no control. She said no more at the time, but she presently stopped and looked at me again, and presently again, and after that looked frowning and moody. On the next day of my attendance, when our usual exercise was over, and I had landed her at her dressing-table, she stayed me with a movement of her impatient fingers, "'Tell me the name again of that blacksmith of yours?' "'Joe Gargery, ma'am.' "'Meaning the master you were to be apprenticed to?' "'Yes, Miss Havisham.' "'You had better be apprenticed at once. 
"'Would Gargory come here with you, and bring your indentures, do you think?' I signified that I had no doubt he would take it as an honour to be asked. "'Then let him come.' "'At any particular time, Miss Havisham?' "'There, there, I know nothing about times. Let him come soon, and come along with you.' When I got home at night, and delivered this message for Joe, my sister went on the rampage, in a more alarming degree than at any previous period. She asked me and Joe whether we supposed she was doormats under our feet, and how we dared to use her so, and what company we graciously thought she was fit for. When she had exhausted a torrent of such inquiries, she threw a candlestick at Joe, burst into a loud sobbing got out the dustpan, which was always a very bad sign, put on her coarse apron, and began cleaning up to a terrible extent. Not satisfied with a dry cleaning, she took to a pail and scrubbing brush, and cleaned us out of house and home, so that we stood shivering in the back yard. It was ten o'clock at night before we ventured to creep in again, and then she asked Joe why he hadn't married a negress slave at once. Joe offered no answer, poor fellow, but stood feeling his whisker and looking dejectedly at me, as if he thought it really might have been a better speculation. End of chapter Chapter 13 of Great Expectations This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith, of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations, by Charles Dickens, Chapter 13 It was a trial to my feelings, on the next day but one, to see Joe arraying himself in his Sunday clothes to accompany me to Miss Havisham's. However, as he thought his court suit necessary to the occasion, it was not for me to tell him that he looked far better in his working dress, the rather, because I knew he made himself so dreadfully uncomfortable, entirely on my account, and that it was for me he pulled up his shirt-collar so very high behind, that it made the hair on the crown of his head stand up like a tuft of feathers. At breakfast-time my sister declared her intention of going to town with us, and being left at Uncle Pumblechook's, and called for, "'When we had done with our fine ladies,' a way of putting the case, from which Joe appeared inclined to augur the worst. The forge was shut up for the day, and Joe inscribed in chalk upon the door, as it was his custom to do on the very rare occasions when he was not at work, the monosyllable H-O-U-T accompanied by a sketch of an arrow, supposed to be flying in the direction he had taken. We walked to town, my sister leading the way in a very large beaver bonnet, and carrying a basket like the great seal of England in plated straw, a pair of patterns, a spare shawl, and an umbrella, though it was a fine bright day. I am not quite clear whether these articles were carried penitentially or ostentatiously, but I rather think they were displayed as articles of property, much as Cleopatra or any other sovereign lady on the rampage might exhibit her wealth in a pageant or procession. When we came to Pumblechook's, my sister bounced in and left us. As it was almost noon, Joe and I held straight on to Miss Havisham's house. Estella opened the gate as usual, and the moment she appeared, Joe took his hat off and stood weighing it by the brim in both his hands, as if he had some urgent reason in his mind for being particular to half a quarter of an ounce. Estella took no notice of either of us, but led us the way that I knew so well. I followed next to her, and Joe came last. When I looked back at Joe in the long passage, he was still weighing his hat with the greatest care, and was coming after us in long strides on the tips of his toes. Estella told me we were both to go in, so I took Joe by the coat-cuff and conducted him into Miss Havisham's presence. She was seated at her dressing-table, and looked round at us immediately. "'Oh!' said she to Joe. 
"'You are the husband of the sister of this boy?' I could hardly have imagined dear old Joe looking so unlike himself, or so like some extraordinary bird, standing as he did, speechless, with his tuft of feathers ruffled, and his mouth open, as if he wanted a worm. "'You are the husband,' repeated Miss Havisham, "'of the sister of this boy?' It was very aggravating, but, throughout the interview, Joe persisted in addressing me, instead of Miss Havisham. "'Which I mean to say, Pip,' Joe now observed, in a manner that was at once expressive of forcible argumentation, strict confidence, and great politeness, "'as I up and married your sister, and I were at the time what you might call, if you were anyways inclined, a single man.' "'Well,' said Miss Havisham, "'and you have reared the boy with the intention of taking him for your apprentice. Is that so, Mr. Goggery?' "'You know, Pip,' replied Joe, "'as you and me were ever friends, and it were looked forward to betwixt us, as being calculated to lead to larks. Not but what, Pip, if you ever had made objections to the business,' such as its being open to black and soot, and such like. Not but what they would have had been attended to, don't you see? "'Has the boy,' said Miss Havisham, "'ever made any objection? Does he like the trade?' "'Which it is well beknown to yourself, Pip,' returned Joe, strengthening his former mixture of argumentation, confidence, and politeness, that it were the wish of your own heart. I saw the idea suddenly break upon him that he would adapt his epitaph to the occasion, before he went on to say, "'And there weren't no objection on your part, and Pip it were the great wish of your heart.' It was quite in vain for me to endeavour to make him sensible that he ought to speak to Miss Havisham. The more I made faces and gestures to him to do it, the more confidential, argumentative, and polite he persisted in being to me. "'Have you brought his indentures with you?' asked Miss Havisham. "'Well, Pip, you know,' replied Joe, as if that were a little unreasonable, "'you yourself see me put em in my hat, and therefore you know as they are here.' With which he took them out and gave them, not to Miss Havisham, but to me. I am afraid I was ashamed of the dear good fellow. I know I was ashamed of him. When I saw that Estella stood at the back of Miss Havisham's chair, and that her eyes laughed mischievously, I took the indentures out of his hand and gave them to Miss Havisham. "'You expected,' said Miss Havisham, as she looked them over, "'no premium with the boy?' "'Joe,' I remonstrated, for he made no reply at all. "'Why don't you answer?' "'Pip,' returned Joe, cutting me short as if he were hurt, "'which I mean to say that were not a question requiring an answer betwixt yourself and me, and which you know the answer to be full well, no. You know it to be no, Pip, and wherefore should I say it?' Miss Havisham glanced at him, as if she understood what he really was better than I had thought possible, seeing what he was there and took up a little bag from the table beside her. "'Pip has earned a premium here,' she said, "'and here it is. There are five-and-twenty guineas in this bag. Give it to your master, Pip.' As if he were absolutely out of his mind with the wonder awakened in him by her strange figure and the strange room, Joe, even at this pass, persisted in addressing me. "'This is very liberal on your part, Pip,' said Joe, "'and it is as such received and grateful welcome, though never looked for, far nor near, nor nowheres. "'And now, old chap,' said Joe, conveying to me a sensation, first of burning and then of freezing, for I felt as if that familiar expression were applied to Miss Havisham, "'and now, old chap, may we do our duty.' May you and me do our duty, both on us, by one and another, and by them which your liberal present have conveyed to be 
for the satisfaction of mind of them as never here joe showed that he felt he had fallen into frightful difficulties until he triumphantly rescued himself with the words and from myself far be it these words had had such a round and convincing sound for him that he said them twice good-bye peep said miss havisham let them out estella am i to come again miss havisham i asked no gargery is your master now gargery one word thus calling him back as i went out of the door i heard her say to joe in a distinct emphatic voice the boy has been a good boy here and that is his reward of course as an honest man you will expect no other and no more how joe got out of the room i have never been able to determine but i know that when he did get out he was steadily proceeding upstairs instead of coming down and was deaf to all remonstrances until i went after him and laid hold of him in another minute we were outside the gate and it was locked and estella was gone when we stood in the daylight alone again joe backed up against a wall and said to me astonishing and there he remained so long saying astonishing at intervals so often that i began to think his senses were never coming back at length he prolonged his remark into pip i do assure you this is astonishing and so by degrees became conversational and able to walk away i have reason to think that joe's intellects were brightened by the encounter they had passed through and that on our way to pumblechook's he invented a subtle and deep design my reason is to be found in what took place in mr pumblechook's parlour where on our presenting ourselves my sister sat in conference with that detested seedsman well cried my sister addressing us both at once and what's happened to you i wonder you condescend to come back to such poor society as this i'm sure i do miss havisham said joe with a fixed look at me like an effort of remembrance made it very particular that we should give her were it compliments or respects pip compliments i said which that were my own belief answered joe her compliments to mrs j gargery much good they'll do me observed my sister but rather gratified too and wishing pursued joe with another fixed look at me like another effort of remembrance that the state of miss havisham's elf were such as would have allowed were it pip of her having the pleasure i added of ladies company said joe and drew a long breath well cried my sister with a mollified glance at mr pumblechook she might have had the politeness to send that message at first but it's better late than never and what did she give young rantipole here she give him said joe nothing mrs joe was going to break out but joe went on what she give said joe she give to his friends and by his friends were her explanation i mean into the hands of his sister mrs j gargery them were her words mrs j gargery she mayn't have knowed added joe with an appearance of reflection whether it were joe or george my sister looked at pumblechook who smoothed the elbows of his wooden armchair and nodded at her and at the fire as if he had known all about it beforehand and how much have you got asked my sister laughing positively laughing what would present company say to ten pound demanded joe they'd say returned my sister curtly pretty well not too much but pretty well it's more than that then said joe that fearful impostor pumblechook immediately nodded and said as he rubbed the arms of his chair it's more than that mum why you don't mean to say 
began my sister. "'Yes, I do, Mum," said Pumblechook. "'But wait a bit. Go on, Joseph. Good in you. Go on.' "'What would present company say?' proceeded Joe. "'To twenty pound.' "'Handsome would be the word,' returned my sister. "'Well, then,' said Joe, "'it's more than twenty pound. That abject hypocrite, Pumblechook, nodded again, and said with a patronizing laugh, "'It's more than that, Mum. Good again. Follow her up, Joseph.' "'Then to make an end of it,' said Joe, delightedly handing the bag to my sister, "'it's five and twenty pound.' "'It's five and twenty pound, Mum,' echoed that basest of swindlers, Pumblechook, rising to shake hands with her, and it's no more than your merits, as I said when my opinion was asked, and I wish you joy of the money. If the villain had stopped here, his case would have been sufficiently awful, but he blackened his guilt by proceeding to take me into custody, with a right of patronage that left all his formal criminality far behind. Now you'll see, Joseph and wife— said Pumblechook, as he took me by the arm above the elbow, I am one of them that always go right through with what they've begun. This boy must be bound out of hand. That's my way. Bound out of hand. Goodness knows, Uncle Pumblechook, said my sister, grasping the money, we're deeply beholden to you. Never mind me, Mum, returned that diabolical corn-chandler. A pleasure's a pleasure all the world over. But this boy, you know, we must have him bound. I said I'd see to it, to tell you the truth. The justices were sitting in the town hall near at hand, and we at once went over to have me bound apprentice to Joe in the magisterial presence. I say we went over, but I was pushed over by Pumblechook, exactly as if I had that moment picked a pocket or fired a rick, Indeed, it was the general impression in court that I had been taken red-handed, for, as Bumblechook shoved me before him through the crowd, I heard some people say, "'What's he done?' and others, "'He's a young un too, but looks bad, don't he?' One person of mild and benevolent aspect even gave me a tract ornamented with a woodcut of a malevolent young man fitted up with a perfect sausage shop of fetters, and entitled, "'To be read in my cell.' The hall was a queer place, I thought, with higher pews in it than a church, and with people hanging over the pews looking on, and with mighty justices, one with a powdered head, leaning back in chairs with folded arms, or taking snuff, or going to sleep, or writing, or reading the newspapers, and with some shining black portraits on the walls, which my unartistic eye regarded as a composition of hard bake and sticking plaster. Here, in a corner, my indentures were duly signed and attested, and I was bound, Mr. Pumblechook holding me all the while as if we had looked in on our way to the scaffold, to have those little preliminaries disposed of. When we had come out again, and had got rid of the boys who had been put into great spirits by the expectation of seeing me publicly tortured, and who were much disappointed to find that my friends were merely rallying round me, we went back to Pumblechook's, and there my sister became so excited by the twenty-five guineas that nothing would serve her but we must have a dinner out of that windfall at the Blue Boar, and that Pumblechook must go over in his chaise cart and bring the Hubbles and Mr. Wopsle. It was agreed to be done, and a most melancholy day I passed, for it inscrutably appeared to stand to reason in the minds of the whole company that I was an excrescence on the entertainment. And to make it worse, they all asked me from time to time, in short, whenever they had nothing else to do, why I didn't enjoy myself. And what could I possibly do then but say I was enjoying myself when I wasn't? However, they were grown up and had their own way, and they made the most of it. That swindling Pumblechook, exalted into the beneficent contriver of the whole occasion, actually took the top of the table, 
and, when he addressed them on the subject of my being bound, and had fiendishly congratulated them on my being liable to imprisonment if I played at cards, drank strong liquors, kept late hours or bad company, or indulged in other vagaries which the form of my indentures appeared to contemplate as next to inevitable, he placed me standing on a chair beside him to illustrate his remarks. My only other remembrances of the great festival are that they wouldn't let me go to sleep, but whenever they saw me dropping off, woke me up and told me to enjoy myself. That, rather late in the evening, Mr. Wopsle gave us Collins' ode, and threw his blood-stained sword in thunder down, with such effect that a waiter came in and said, "'The commercials underneath sent up their compliments, and it wasn't the tumbler's arms.' That, when they were all in excellent spirits on the road home, and sang, "'O oh, Lady Fair,' Mr. Wopsle taking the bass, and asserting with a tremendously strong voice, in reply to the inquisitive bore who leads that piece of music in a most impertinent manner, by wanting to know all about everybody's private affairs, that he was the man with his white locks flowing, and that he was upon the whole the weakest pilgrim going. Finally, I remember that when I got into my little bedroom, I was truly wretched, and had a strong conviction on me that I should never like Joe's trade. I had liked it once, but once was not now. End of chapter Chapter 14 of Great Expectations This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens Chapter 14 It is a most miserable thing to feel ashamed of home. There may be black ingratitude in the thing, and the punishment may be retributive and well-deserved but that it is a miserable thing I can testify. Home had never been a very pleasant place to me, because of my sister's temper. But Joe had sanctified it, and I had believed in it. I had believed in the best parlour as a most elegant saloon. I had believed in the front door, as a mysterious portal of the Temple of State, whose solemn opening was attended with a sacrifice of roast fowls. I had believed in the kitchen as a chaste, though not magnificent, apartment. I had believed in the forge as the glowing road to manhood and independence. Within a single year all this was changed. Now it was all coarse and common, and I would not have had Miss Havisham and Estella see it on any account. How much of my ungracious condition of mine may have been my own fault, how much Miss Havisham's, how much my sister's, is now of no moment to me or to any one. The change was made in me, the thing was done. Well or ill done, excusably or inexcusably, it was done. Once it had seemed to me that when I should at last roll up my shirt-sleeves and go into the forge, Joe's prentice, I should be distinguished and happy. Now the reality was in my hold, I only felt that I was dusty with the dust of small coal, and that I had a weight upon my daily remembrance to which the anvil was a feather. There have been occasions in my later life, I suppose as in most lives, when I have felt for a time as if a thick curtain had fallen on all its interest and romance, to shut me out from anything save dull endurance any more. Never has that curtain dropped so heavy and blank as when my way in life lay stretched out straight before me through the newly entered road of apprenticeship to Joe. I remember that at a later period of my time I used to stand about the churchyard on Sunday evenings when night was falling, comparing my own perspective with the windy marsh view, and making out some likeness between them by thinking how flat and low both were, and how on both there came an unknown way and a dark mist and then the sea. I was quite as dejected on the first working day of my apprenticeship as in that after-time, but I am glad to know that I never breathed a murmur to Joe while my indentures lasted. 
It is about the only thing I am glad to know of myself in that connection. For though it includes what I proceed to add, all the merit of what I proceed to add was Joe's. It was not because I was faithful, but because Joe was faithful, that I never ran away and went for a soldier or a sailor. It was not because I had a strong sense of the virtue of industry, but because Joe had a strong sense of the virtue of industry, that I worked with tolerable zeal against the grain. It is not possible to know how far the influence of any amiable, honest-hearted, duty-doing man flies out into the world, but it is very possible to know how it has touched one's self in going by, and I know right well that any good that intermixed itself with my apprenticeship came of plain, contented Joe, and not of restlessly aspiring, discontented me. What I wanted, who can say? How can I say, when I never knew? What I dreaded was, that in some unlucky hour I, being at my grimiest and commonest, should lift up my eyes and see Estella looking in at one of the wooden windows of the forge. I was haunted by the fear that she would, sooner or later, find me out, with a black face and hands, doing the coarsest part of my work, and would exult over me and despise me. Often after dark, when I was pulling the bellows for Joe, and we were singing old Clem, and when the thought how we used to sing it at Miss Havisham's would seem to show me Estella's face in the fire, with her pretty hair fluttering in the wind and her eyes scorning me. Often, at such a time, I would look towards those panels of black night in the wall, which the wooden windows then were, and would fancy that I saw her just drawing her face away, and would believe that she had come at last. After that, when we went in to supper, the place and the meal would have a more homely look than ever, and I would feel more ashamed of home than ever, in my own ungracious breast. End of chapter Chapter 15 of Great Expectations This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens Chapter 15 As I was getting too big for Mr. Wopsle's great-aunt's room, my education under that preposterous female terminated. Not, however, until Biddy had imparted to me everything she knew, from the little catalogue of prices, to a comic song she had once bought for a half-penny. Although the only coherent part of the latter piece of literature were the opening lines, When I went to Lunnon town, sirs, tooruluru, tooruluru, rule, wasn't I done very brown, sirs, tooruluru, tooruluru. Still in my desire to be wiser, I got this composition by heart with the utmost gravity, nor do I recollect that I question its merit, except that I thought, as I still do, the amount of two rules somewhat in excess of the poetry. In my hunger for information I made proposals to Mr. Wopsle to bestow some intellectual crumbs upon me, with which he kindly complied. As it turned out, however, that he only wanted me for a dramatic lay figure, to be contradicted and embraced, and wept over and bullied, and clutched and stabbed and knocked about in a variety of ways, I soon declined that course of instruction, though not until Mr. Wopsle and his poetic fury had severely mauled me. Whatever I acquired I tried to impart to Joe. This statement sounds so well that I cannot in my conscience let it pass unexplained. I wanted to make Joe less ignorant and common that he might be worthier of my society, and less open to Estella's reproach. The old battery out on the marshes was our place of study, and a broken slate and a short piece of slate pencil were our educational implements, to which Joe always added a pipe of tobacco. I never knew Joe to remember anything from one Sunday to another, or to acquire, under my tuition, any piece of information whatever. Yet he would smoke his pipe at the battery with a far more sagacious air than anywhere else, 
even with a learned air, as if he considered himself to be advancing immensely. Dear fellow, I hope he did. It was pleasant and quiet, out there with the sails on the river passing beyond the earthwork, and sometimes, when the tide was low, looking as if they belonged to sunken ships that were still sailing on at the bottom of the water. Whenever I watched the vessel standing out to sea with their white sails spread, I somehow thought of Miss Havisham and Estella, and whenever the light struck a slant, far off, upon a cloud or sail, or green hillside or water-line, it was just the same. Miss Havisham and Estella, and the strange house, and the strange life appeared to have something to do with everything that was picturesque. One Sunday when Joe, greatly enjoying his pipe, had so plumed himself on being most awful dull, that I had given him up for the day, I lay on the earthwork for some time with my chin on my hand, descrying traces of Miss Havisham and Estella all over the prospect, in the sky and in the water, until at last I resolved to mention a thought concerning them that had been much in my head. "'Joe,' said I, "'don't you think I ought to make Miss Havisham a visit?' "'Well, Pip,' returned Joe, slowly considering, "'what for?' "'What for, Joe? What is any visit made for?' "'There is some visits, perhaps,' said Joe, "'as forever remains open to the question, Pip. "'But in regard to visiting Miss Havisham, "'she might think you wanted something, expected something of her.' "'Don't you think I might say that I did not, Joe?' "'You might, old chap,' said Joe. "'And she might credit it. "'Similarly, she mightn't.' "'Joe felt, as I did, that he had made a point there, "'and he pulled hard at his pipe "'to keep himself from weakening it by repetition. "'You see, Pip,' Joe pursued, "'as soon as he was past that danger, "'Miss Havisham done the handsome thing by you. "'When Miss Havisham done the handsome thing by you, she called me back to say to me, as that were all. Yes, Joe, I heard her. All! Joe repeated very emphatically. Yes, Joe, I tell you, I heard her. Which I mean to say, Pip, it might be that her meaning were, Make an end on it, as you was, Me to the north and you to the south, Keepin' sunders. I had thought of that, too, and it was very far from comforting to me to find that he had thought of it, for it seemed to render it more probable. But, Joe— Yes, old chap? Here I am, getting on in the first year of my time, and since the day of my being bound I have never thanked Miss Havisham, or asked after her, or shown that I remember her. That's true, Pip, and unless you was to turn her out a set of shoes all four round— and which I mean to say, as even a set of shoes all four round might not be acceptable as a present, in a total vacancy of hoofs. I don't mean that sort of remembrance, Joe. I don't mean a present. But Joe had got the idea of a present in his head, and must harp upon it. Or even, said he, if you was helped to knocking her up a new chain for the front door— or say a gross or two of shark-headed screws for general use, or some light fancy article, such as a toasting-fork when she took her muffins, or a gridiron when she took a sprat or such like. "'I don't mean any present at all, Joe,' I interposed. "'Well,' said Joe, still harping on it, though I had particularly pressed it, "'if I was yourself, Pip, I wouldn't.' No, I would not, for what's a door-chain when she's got one always up? And shark-headers is open to misrepresentations. And if it was a toasting fork, you'd go into brass and do yourself no credit. And the uncommonest workman can't show himself uncommon in a gridiron, for a gridiron is a gridiron, said Joe, steadfastly impressing it upon me, as if he were endeavouring to rouse me from a fixed delusion. "'And you may ham at what you like, but a gridiron it will come out, "'either by your leave or against your leave, 
and you can't help yourself. My dear Joe, I cried in desperation, taking hold of his coat, don't go on in that way. I never thought of making Miss Havisham any present. No, Pip, Joe assented, as if he had been contending for that all along. And what I say to you is, you are right, Pip. Yes, Joe, but what I wanted to say was, that as we are rather slack just now, if you would give me a half-holiday to-morrow, I think I would go up-town and make a call on Miss S. Uh, Havisham. Which her name, said Joe gravely, ain't a Stavisham, Pip, unless she has been rechristened. I know, Joe, I know, it was a slip of mine. What do you think of it, Joe? In brief, Joe thought that if I thought well of it, he thought well of it. But he was particular in stipulating that if I were not received with cordiality, or if I were not encouraged to repeat my visit, as a visit which had no ulterior object but was simply one of gratitude for a favour received, then this experimental trip should have no successor. By these conditions I promised to abide. Now, Joe kept a journeyman at weekly wages whose name was Orlick. He pretended that his Christian name was Dolge, a clear impossibility, but he was a fellow of that obstinate disposition that I believe him to have been the prey of no delusion in this particular, but willfully to have imposed that name upon the village as an affront to its understanding. He was a broad-shouldered, loose-limbed, swarthy fellow of great strength, never in a hurry, and always slouching. He never even seemed to come to his work on purpose, but would slouch in as if by mere accident, and when he went to the jolly bargeman to eat his dinner, or went away at night, he would slouch out, like Cain or the wandering Jew, as if he had no idea where he was going, and no intention of ever coming back. He lodged at a sluice-keeper's out on the marshes, and on working days would come slouching from his hermitage, with his hands in his pockets and his dinner loosely tied in a bundle round his neck and dangling on his back. On Sundays he mostly lay all day on the sluice-gates, or stood against ricks and barns. He always slouched, locomotively, with his eyes on the ground, and, when accosted or otherwise required to raise them, he looked up in a half-resentful, half-puzzled way, as though the only thought he ever had was— that it was rather an odd and injurious fact that he should never be thinking. This morose journeyman had no liking for me. When I was very small and timid, he gave me to understand that the devil lived in a black corner of the forge, and that he knew the fiend very well, also that it was necessary to make up the fire, once in seven years, with a live boy, and that I might consider myself fuel. When I became Joe's prentice, Orlick was perhaps confirmed in some suspicion that I should displace him, howbeit he liked me still less. Not that he ever said anything, or did anything, openly importing hostility, I only noticed that he always beat his sparks in my direction, and that whenever I sang old Clem, he came in out of time. Dolge Orlick was at work and present next day, when I reminded Joe of my half-holiday. He said nothing at the moment, for he and Joe had just got a piece of hot iron between them, and I was at the bellows. But by and by he said, leaning on his hammer, "'Now, master, sure you're not a-going to favour only one of us. If young Pip has a half-holiday, do as much for old Orlick.' I suppose he was about five and twenty but he usually spoke of himself as an ancient person. "'Why, what'll you do with a half-holiday, if you get it?' said Joe. "'What'll I do with it? What'll he do with it? I'll do as much with it as him,' said Orlick. "'As to Pip, he's going uptown,' said Joe. "'Well, then, as to old Orlick, he's a-going uptown,' retorted that worthy. Two can go uptown.' "'Tain't only one what can go uptown.' "'Don't lose your temper,' said Joe. "'Shall if I like,' growled Orlick. "'Summon their uptowning. "'Now, master, come. "'No favouring in this shop. 
be a man. The master refusing to entertain the subject until the journeyman was in a better temper, Orlick plunged at the furnace, drew out a red-hot bar, made at me with it as if he was going to run it through my body, whisked it round my head, laid it on the anvil, hammered it out, as if it were I, I thought, and the sparks were my spurting blood, and finally said, when he had hammered himself hot and the iron cold, and he again leaned on his hammer, "'Now, master!' "'Are you all right now?' demanded Joe. "'Ah! I am all right,' said gruff old Orlick. "'Then, as in general, you stick to your work as well as most men,' said Joe. "'Let it be a half-holiday for all.' My sister had been standing silent in the yard, within hearing. She was a most unscrupulous spy and listener, and she instantly looked in at one of the windows. "'Like you, you fool!' said she to Joe. "'Giving holidays to great idle hulkers like that! You are a rich man, upon my life, to waste wages in that way. I wish I was his master.' "'You'd be everybody's master, if you durst,' retorted Orlick, with an ill-favoured grin. "'Let her alone,' said Joe. "'I'd be a match for all noodles and all rogues,' returned my sister, beginning to work herself into a mighty rage. "'And I couldn't be a match for the noodles without being a match for your master, who's the dunder-headed king of the noodles. And I couldn't be a match for the rogues without being a match for you,' "'who are the blackest-looking and the worst rogue between this and France, now!' "'You're a foul shrew, Mother Gargery,' growled the journeyman. "'If that makes a judge of rogues, you ought to be a good un.' "'Let her alone, will you?' said Joe. "'What did you say?' cried my sister, beginning to scream. "'What did you say? What did that fellow Orlick say to me, Pip? What did he call me, with my husband standing by?' Oh, oh, oh! Each of these exclamations was a shriek, and I must remark of my sister, what is equally true of all the violent women I have ever seen, that passion was no excuse for her, because it is undeniable that instead of lapsing into passion, she consciously and deliberately took extraordinary pains to force herself into it, and became blindly furious by regular stages. What was the name he gave me before the base man who swore to defend me? Oh, hold me! Oh! Ah! growled the journeyman between his teeth. I'd hold you if you was my wife. I'd hold you under the pump and choke it out of you. I tell you I'll let her alone, said Joe. Oh! To hear him! cried my sister, with a clap of her hands and a scream together, which was her next stage to hear the names he's giving me, that Orlick, in my own house, me, a married woman, with my husband standing by, oh, oh! Here my sister, after a fit of clappings and screamings, beat her hands upon her bosom and upon her knees, and threw her cap off, and pulled her hair down, which was the last stages on her road to frenzy. Being by this time a perfect fury and a complete success, she made a dash at the door which I had fortunately locked. What could the wretched Joe do now, after his disregarded parenthetical interruptions, but stand up to his journeyman and ask him what he meant by interfering betwixt himself and Mrs. Joe, and further whether he was man enough to come on? Old Orlick felt that the situation admitted of nothing less than coming on, and was on his defence straightway, so— Without so much as pulling off their singed and burnt aprons, they went at one another, like two giants. But if any man in that neighbourhood could stand up along against Joe, I never saw the man. Orlick, as if he had been of no more account than the pale young gentleman, was very soon among the coal-dust, and in no hurry to come out of it. Then Joe unlocked the door and picked up my sister, who had dropped insensible at the window but who had seen the fight first, I think, and who was carried into the house and laid down, and who was recommended to revive, and would do nothing but struggle and clench her hands in Joe's hair. Then came that singular calm and silence which succeed all uproars, and then, with the vague sensation which I have always connected with such a lull, 
namely, that it was Sunday and somebody was dead, I went upstairs to dress myself. When I came down again I found Joe and Orlick sweeping up, without any other traces of discomposure than a slit in one of Orlick's nostrils, which was neither expressive nor ornamental. A pot of beer had appeared from the jolly bargeman, and they were sharing it by turns in a peaceable manner. The lull had a sedative and philosophical influence on Joe, who followed me out into the road to say, as a parting observation that might do me good, "'On the rampage, Pip, and off the rampage, Pip, such is life.' With what absurd emotions, for we think the feelings that are very serious in a man quite comical in a boy, I found myself again going to Miss Havisham's, matters little here nor how I passed and repassed the gate many times before I could make up my mind to ring, nor how I debated whether I should go away without ringing, nor how I should undoubtedly have gone, if my time had been my own, to come back. Miss Sarah Pocket came to the gate. No Estella. "'How, then, you here again?' said Miss Pocket. "'What do you want?' When I said that I only came to see how Miss Havisham was, Sarah evidently deliberated whether or no she should send me about my business. But unwilling to hazard the responsibility, she let me in, and presently brought the sharp message that I was to come up. Everything was unchanged, and Miss Havisham was alone. "'Well,' said she, fixing her eyes upon me, "'I hope you want nothing. You'll get nothing.' "'No, indeed, Miss Havisham. I only wanted you to know that I am doing very well in my apprenticeship, and am always much obliged to you.' "'There, there,' with the old restless fingers. "'Come now and then. Come on your birthday. Ay, she cried suddenly, turning herself and her chair towards me. "'You were looking round for Estella, hey?' I had been looking round, in fact, for Estella and I stammered that I hoped she was well. "'Abroad,' said Miss Havisham, "'educating for a lady, far out of reach, prettier than ever, admired by all who see her. Do you feel that you have lost her?' There was such a malignant enjoyment in her utterance of the last words, and she broke into such a disagreeable laugh, that I was at a loss what to say. She spared me the trouble of considering, by dismissing me. When the gate was closed upon me by Sarah of the walnut-shell countenance, I felt more than ever dissatisfied with my home, and with my trade, and with everything, and that was all I took by that motion. As I was loitering along the high street, looking in disconsolately at the shop windows, and thinking what I would buy if I were a gentleman, who should come out of the bookshop but Mr. Wopsle? Mr. Wopsle had in his hand the affecting tragedy of George Barnwell, in which he had that moment invested sixpence, with the view of heaping every word on it on the head of Pumblechook, with whom he was going to drink tea. No sooner did he see me than he appeared to consider that a special providence had put a prentice in his way to be read at, and he laid hold of me, and insisted on my accompanying him to the Pumblechookian parlour as I knew it would be miserable at home, and as the nights were dark and the way was dreary, and almost any companionship on the road was better than none, I made no great resistance. Consequently, we turned into Pumblechooks, just as the street and the shops were lighting up. As I never assisted at any other representation of George Barnwell, I don't know how long it may usually take, but I know very well that it took until half-past nine o'clock that night and that when Mr. Wopsle got into Newgate, I thought he never would go to the scaffold, he became so much slower than at any former period of his disgraceful career. I thought it a little too much that he should complain of being cut short in his flower after all, as if he had not been running to seed, leaf after leaf, ever since his course began. This, however, was a mere question of length and wearisomeness. What stung me, was the identification of the whole affair with my unoffending self. When Barnwell began to go wrong, I declared that I felt positively apologetic, 
Pumblechook's indignant stare so taxed me with it. Wopsle, too, took pains to present me in the worst light. At once ferocious and maudlin, I was made to murder my uncle with no extenuating circumstances whatever. Millwood put me down in argument, on every occasion. It became sheer monomania in my master's daughter to care a button for me, and all I can say for my gasping and procrastinating conduct on the fatal morning is that it was worthy of the general feebleness of my character. Even after I was happily hanged and Wopsle had closed the book, Pumblechook sat staring at me, and shaking his head, and saying, "'Take warning, boy, take warning,' as if it were a well-known fact that I contemplated murdering a near relation, provided I could only induce one to have the weakness to become my benefactor. It was a very dark night when it was all over, and when I set out with Mr. Wopsle on the walk home. Beyond town we found a heavy mist out, and it fell wet and thick. The turnpike lamp was a blur, quite out of the lamp's usual place, apparently, and its rays looked solid substance on the fog. We were noticing this, and saying how that the mist rose with a change of wind from a certain quarter of our marshes, when we came upon a man slouching under the lee of the turnpike house. Hallo! we said, stopping. Orlick there? Ah, he answered, slouching out. I was standing by a minute on the chance of company. You are late, I remarked. Orlick not unnaturally answered, "'Well, and you're late.' "'We have been,' said Mr. Wopsle, exalted with his late performance, "'we have been indulging Mr. Orlick in an intellectual evening.' Old Orlick growled, as if he had nothing to say about that, and we all went on together. I asked him presently whether he had been spending his half-holiday up and down town. "'Yes,' said he, "'all of it. I come in behind yourself.' I didn't see you, but I must have been pretty close behind you. By and by, the guns is going again. At the hulks, said I. Hi, there's some of the birds flown from the cages. The guns have been going since dark, about. You'll hear one presently. In effect, we had not walked many yards further when the well-remembered boom came towards us, deafened by the mist, and heavily rolled away along the low grounds by the river as if it were pursuing and threatening the fugitives. "'A good night for cutting off in,' said Orlick. "'We'd be puzzled how to bring down a jailbird on the wing to-night.' The subject was a suggestive one to me, and I thought about it in silence. Mr. Wopsle, as the ill-requited uncle of the evening's tragedy, fell to meditating aloud in his garden at Camberwell. Orlick, with his hands in his pockets, slouched heavily at my side. It was very dark, very wet, very muddy, and so we splashed along. Now and then the sound of the signal cannon broke upon us again, and again rolled sulkily along the course of the river. I kept myself to myself and my thoughts. Mr. Wopsle died amiably at Camberwell, and exceedingly game on Bosworth Field, and in the greatest agonies at Glastonbury. Orlick sometimes growled, Beat it out, beat it out, old Clem, with a clink for the stout, old Clem. I thought he had been drinking, but he was not drunk. Thus we came to the village. The way by which we approached it took us past the three jolly bargemen, which we were surprised to find, it being eleven o'clock, in a state of commotion, with the door wide open, and unwanted lights that had been hastily caught up and put down scattered about. Mr. Wopsle dropped in to ask what was the matter, surmising that a convict had been taken, but came running out in a great hurry. "'There's something wrong,' said he, without stopping. "'Up at your place, Pip. Run all!' "'What is it?' I asked, keeping up with him. So did Orlick at my side. "'I can't quite understand. The house seems to have been violently entered when Joe Gargery was out. Supposed by convicts.' Somebody has been attacked and hurt. We were running too fast to admit of more being said, and we made no stop until we got into our kitchen. It was full of people. The whole village was there, or in the yard, and there was a surgeon, 
and there was Joe, and there were a group of women all on the floor in the midst of the kitchen. The unemployed bystanders drew back when they saw me, and so I became aware of my sister, lying without sense or movement on the bare boards where she had been knocked down by a tremendous blow in the back of the head, dealt by some unknown hand when her face was turned towards the fire, destined never to be on the rampage again while she was the wife of Joe. End of chapter Chapter Sixteen of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter Sixteen. With my head full of George Barnwell. I was at first disposed to believe that I must have had some hand in the attack upon my sister, or at all events that as her near relation, popularly known to be under obligations to her, I was a more legitimate object of suspicion than any one else. But when, in the clearer light of the next morning, I began to reconsider the matter, and to hear it discussed around me on all sides, I took another view of the case, which was more reasonable. Joe had been at the Three Jolly Bargemen, smoking his pipe, from a quarter after eight o'clock to a quarter before ten. While he was there, my sister had been seen standing at the kitchen door, and had exchanged good night with a farm labourer going home. The man could not be more particular as to the time at which he saw her, he got into dense confusion when he tried to be, than that it must have been before nine. When Joe went home at five minutes before ten, he found her struck down on the floor, and promptly called in assistance. The fire had not then burnt unusually low, nor was the snuff of the candle very long. The candle, however, had been blown out. Nothing had been taken away from any part of the house, neither beyond the blowing out of the candle, which stood on the table between the door and my sister, and was behind her when she stood facing the fire and was struck, was there any disarrangement of the kitchen, excepting such as she herself had made, in falling and bleeding. But there was one remarkable piece of evidence on the spot. She had been struck with something blunt and heavy, on the head and spine. After the blows were dealt, something heavy had been thrown down at her with considerable violence, as she lay on her face. And on the ground beside her, when Joe picked her up, was a convict's leg-iron, which had been filed asunder. Now Joe, examining this iron with a smith's eye, declared it to have been filed asunder some time ago. The hue and cry going off to the hulks, and people coming thence to examine the iron, Joe's opinion was corroborated. They did not undertake to say when it had left the prison ships, to which it undoubtedly had once belonged, but they claimed to know for certain that that particular manacle had not been worn by either of the two convicts who had escaped last night. Further, one of those two was already retaken, and had not freed himself of his iron. Knowing what I knew, I set up an inference of my own here. I believed the iron to be my convict's iron, the iron I had seen and heard him filing at, on the marshes. But my mind did not accuse him of having put it to its latest use, for I believe one of two other persons to have become possessed of it, and to have turned it to this cruel account either Orlick, or the strange man who had shown me the file. Now, as to Orlick, he had gone to town exactly as he told us when we picked him up at the turnpike. He had been seen about town all the evening, he had been in divers companies in several public houses, and he had come back with myself and Mr. Wopsle. There was nothing against him, save the quarrel, and my sister had quarrelled with him, and with everybody else about her, ten thousand times. As to the strange man, if he had come back for his two bank-notes, there could have been no dispute about them, because my sister was fully prepared to restore them. Besides, there had been no altercation. The assailant had come in so silently and suddenly that she had been felled before she could look round. It was horrible to think that I had provided the weapon, however undesignedly, 
but I could hardly think otherwise. I suffered unspeakable trouble while I considered and reconsidered whether I should at last dissolve that spell of my childhood and tell Joe all the story. For months afterwards I every day settled the question finally in the negative, and reopened and re-argued it next morning. The contention came, after all, to this. The secret was such an old one now, had so grown into me and become a part of myself, that I could not tear it away. In addition to the dread that, having led up to so much mischief, it would be now more likely than ever to alienate Joe from me if he believed it, I had a further restraining dread that he would not believe it, but would assort it with the fabulous dogs and veal cutlets as a monstrous invention. However, I temporized with myself, of course, for was I not wavering between right and wrong when the thing is always done? and resolved to make a full disclosure if I should see any such new occasion as a new chance of helping in the discovery of the assailant. The constables and the Bow Street men from London, for this happened in the days of the extinct red-waistcoated police, were about the house for a week or two, and did pretty much what I have heard and read of like authorities doing in other such cases. They took up several obviously wrong people, and they ran their heads very hard against wrong ideas, and persisted in trying to fit the circumstances to the ideas, instead of trying to extract ideas from the circumstances. Also, they stood about the door of the jolly bargeman, with knowing and reserved looks that filled the whole neighborhood with admiration, and they had a mysterious manner of taking their drink that was almost as good as taking the culprit. But not quite for they never did it. Long after these constitutional powers had dispersed, my sister lay very ill in bed. Her sight was disturbed, so that she saw objects multiplied, and grasped at visionary teacups and wine-glasses instead of the realities. Her hearing was greatly impaired, her memory also, and her speech was unintelligible. When at last she came round so far as to be helped downstairs, it was still necessary to keep my slate always by her, that she might indicate in writing what she could not indicate in speech. As she was, very bad handwriting apart, a more than indifferent speller, and as Joe was a more than indifferent reader, extraordinary complications arose between them which I was always called in to solve. The administration of mutton instead of medicine, the substitution of tea for Joe, and the baker for bacon, were among the mildest of my own mistakes. However, her temper was greatly improved, and she was patient. A tremulous uncertainty of the action of all her limbs soon became a part of her regular state, and afterwards, at intervals of two or three months, she would often put her hands to her head, and would then remain for about a week at a time in some gloomy aberration of mind. We were at a loss to find a suitable attendant for her, until a circumstance happened conveniently to relieve us. Mr. Wopsle's great-aunt conquered a confirmed habit of living into which she had fallen, and Biddy became a part of our establishment. It may have been about a month after my sister's reappearance in the kitchen, when Biddy came to us with a small speckled box containing the whole of her worldly effects, and became a blessing to the household. Above all, she was a blessing to Joe, for the dear old fellow was sadly cut up by the constant contemplation of the wreck of his wife, and had been accustomed, while attending on her of an evening, to turn to me every now and then and say, with his blue eyes moistened, "'Such a fine figure of a woman as she once were, Pip!' Biddy instantly taking the cleverest charge of her, as though she had studied her from infancy, Joe became able in some sort to appreciate the greater quiet of his life, and to get down to the jolly bargeman now and then for a change that did him good. It was characteristic of the police people that they had all more or less suspected poor Joe, though he never knew it, and that they had to a man concurred in regarding him as one of the deepest spirits they had ever encountered. Biddy's first triumph in her new office was to solve a difficulty that had completely vanquished me. I had tried hard at it, but it made nothing of it. Thus it was. Again, and again, and again, my sister had traced upon the slate a character that looked like a curious tea, 
and then with utmost eagerness had called our attention to it as something she particularly wanted. I had in vain tried everything producible that began with a tea, from tar to toast and tub. At length it had come into my head that the sign looked like a hammer, and on my lustily calling that word in my sister's ear, she had begun to hammer on the table and had expressed a qualified assent. Thereupon I had brought in all our hammers, one after another, but without avail. Then I bethought me of a crutch, the shape being much the same, and I borrowed one in the village and displayed it to my sister with considerable confidence. But she shook her head to that extent when she was shown it, that we were terrified lest in her weak and shattered state she should dislocate her neck. When my sister found that Biddy was very quick to understand her, this mysterious sign reappeared on the slate. Biddy looked thoughtfully at it, heard my explanation, looked thoughtfully at my sister, looked thoughtfully at Joe, who was always represented on the slate by his initial letter, and ran into the forge, followed by Joe and me. "'Why, of course!' cried Biddy, with an exultant face. "'Don't you see? It's him!' Orlick, without a doubt. She had lost his name, and could only signify him by his hammer. We told him why we wanted him to come into the kitchen, and he slowly laid down his hammer, wiped his brow with his arm, took another wipe at it with his apron, and came slouching out, with a curious loose vagabond bend in the knees that strongly distinguished him. I confess that I expected to see my sister denounce him, and that I was disappointed by the different result she manifested the greatest anxiety to be on good terms with him, was evidently much pleased by his being at length produced, and motioned that she would have him given something to drink. She watched his countenance as if she were particularly wishful to be assured that he took kindly to his reception. She showed every possible desire to conciliate him, and there was an air of humble propitiation in all she did, such as I have seen pervade the bearing of a child towards a hard master. After that day, a day rarely passed without her drawing the hammer on her slate, and without Orlick slouching in and standing doggedly before her, as if he knew no more than I did what to make of it. End of chapter Chapter Seventeen of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter Seventeen. I now fell into a regular routine of apprenticeship life which was very beyond the limits of the village and the marshes, by no more remarkable circumstance than the arrival of my birthday and my paying another visit to Miss Havisham. I found Miss Sarah Pocket still on duty at the gate. I found Miss Havisham just as I had left her, and she spoke of Estella in the very same way, if not in the very same words. The interview lasted but a few minutes, and she gave me a guinea when I was going, and told me to come again on my next birthday. I may mention at once that this became an annual custom. I tried to decline taking the guinea on the first occasion, but with no better effect than causing her to ask me very angrily if I expected more. Then, and after that, I took it. So unchanging was the dull old house, the yellow light in the darkened room, the faded spectre in the chair by the dressing-table glass, that I felt as if the stopping of the clocks had stopped time in that mysterious place, and while I and everything else outside it grew older, it stood still. Daylight never entered the house as to my thoughts and remembrances of it, any more than as to the actual fact. It bewildered me, and under its influence I continued at heart to hate my trade and to be ashamed of home. Imperceptibly I became conscious of a change in Biddy, however, her shoes came up at the heel, her hair grew bright and neat, her hands were always clean. She was not beautiful, she was common, and could not be like Estella, but she was pleasant and wholesome and sweet-tempered. 
She had not been with us more than a year. I remember her being newly out of mourning at the time it struck me, when I observed to myself one evening that she had curiously thoughtful and attentive eyes, eyes that were very pretty and very good. It came of my lifting up my own eyes from a task I was poring at, writing some passages from a book, to improve myself in two ways at once by a sort of stratagem, and seeing Biddy observant of what I was about. I laid down my pen, and Biddy stopped in her needlework without laying it down. "'Biddy,' said I, "'how do you manage it? Either I am very stupid, or you are very clever.' "'What is it that I manage? I don't know,' returned Biddy, smiling. She managed our whole domestic life, and wonderfully, too. But I did not mean that, though that made what I did mean more surprising. "'How do you manage, Biddy?' said I, "'to learn everything that I learn, and always to keep up with me. I was beginning to be rather vain of my knowledge, for I spent my birthday guineas on it and set aside the greater part of my pocket-money for similar investment, though I have no doubt now that the little I knew was extremely dear at the price. "'I might as well ask you,' said Biddy, "'how do you manage?' "'No, because when I came in from the forge of a night, any one can see me turning to at it. But you never turn to at it, Biddy.' "'I suppose I must catch it like a cough,' said Biddy, quietly and went on with her sewing. Pursuing my idea, as I leaned back in my wooden chair, and looked at Biddy sewing away with her head on one side, I began to think her rather an extraordinary girl. For I called to mind now that she was equally accomplished in the terms of our trade, and the names of our different sorts of work, and our various tools. In short, whatever I knew, Biddy knew. Theoretically, she was already as good a blacksmith as I, or better. "'You are one of those, Biddy,' said I, "'who make the most of every chance. You never had a chance before you came here, and see how improved you are.' Biddy looked at me for an instant, and went on with her sewing. "'I was your first teacher, though, wasn't I?' said she, as she sewed. "'Biddy!' I exclaimed in amazement. "'Why, you are crying!' "'No, I am not,' said Biddy, looking up and laughing. "'What put that in your head?' "'What could have put it in my head but the glistening of a tear as it dropped on her work?' I sat silent, recalling what a drudge she had been until Mr. Wopsle's great aunt successfully overcame that bad habit of living, so highly desirable to be got rid of by some people. I recalled the hopeless circumstances by which she had been surrounded in the miserable little shop, and the miserable little noisy evening-school, with that miserable old bundle of incompetence always to be dragged and shouldered. I reflected that even in these untoward times there must have been latent in Biddy what was now developing, for in my first uneasiness and discontent I had turned to her for help as a matter of course. Biddy sat quietly sewing, shedding no more tears, and while I looked at her and thought about it all, it occurred to me that perhaps I had not been sufficiently grateful to Biddy. I might have been too reserved, and should have patronized her more, though I did not use that precise word in my meditations, with my confidence. "'Yes, Biddy,' I observed, when I had done turning it over, "'you were my first teacher, and that at a time when we little thought of ever being together like this, in this kitchen.' "'Ah, poor thing!' replied Biddy. It was like her self-forgetfulness to transfer the remark to my sister, and to get up and be busy about her, making her more comfortable. "'That's sadly true.' "'Well,' said I, "'we must talk together a little more, as we used to do. And I must consult you a little more, as I used to do. Let us have a quiet walk on the marshes next Sunday, Biddy, and a long chat.' My sister was never left alone now, but Joe more than readily undertook the care of her on that Sunday afternoon, and Biddy and I went out together. It was summer-time, and lovely weather. When we had passed the village and the church and the churchyard, and were out on the marshes and began to see the sails of the ships as they sailed on, I began to combine Miss Havisham and Estella 
with the prospect in my usual way. When we came to the riverside and sat down on the bank, with the water rippling at our feet, making it all more quiet than it would have been without that sound, I resolved that it was a good time and place for the admission of Biddy into my inner confidence. Biddy, said I, after binding her to secrecy, I want to be a gentleman. Oh, I wouldn't if I was you, she returned. I don't think it would answer. Biddy, said I with some severity, I have particular reasons for wanting to be a gentleman. You know best, Pip, but don't you think you are happier as you are? Biddy, I exclaimed impatiently, I am not at all happy as I am. I am disgusted with my calling and with my life. I have never taken to either since I was bound. Don't be absurd. Was I absurd? said Biddy, quietly raising her eyebrows. I am sorry for that. I didn't mean to be. I only want you to do well and to be comfortable. Well, then, understand once for all that I never shall or can be comfortable, or anything but miserable. There, Biddy, unless I can lead a very different sort of life from the life I lead now. That's a pity, said Biddy, shaking her head with a sorrowful air. Now I, too, had often thought it a pity, in the regular kind of quarrel with myself which I was always carrying on, I was half inclined to shed tears of vexation and distress when Biddy gave utterance to her sentiment and my own. I told her she was right, and I knew it was much to be regretted, but still it was not to be helped. "'If I could have settled down,' I said to Biddy, plucking up the short grass within reach, much as I had once upon a time pulled my feelings out of my hair and kicked them into the brewery wall, if I could have settled down and been but half as fond of the forge as I was when I was little, I know it would have been much better for me. You and I and Joe would have wanted nothing then, and Joe and I would perhaps have gone partners when I was out of my time, and I might even have grown up to keep company with you, and we might have sat on this very bank on a fine Sunday, quite different people. I should have been good enough for you, shouldn't I, Biddy? Biddy sighed as she looked at the ship sailing on, and returned for answer, "'Yes, I am not over-particular.' It scarcely sounded flattering, but I knew she meant well. "'Instead of that,' said I, plucking up more grass and chewing a blade or two, "'see how I am going on. Dissatisfied, and uncomfortable, and what would it signify to me, being coarse and common, if nobody had told me so?' Biddy turned her face suddenly towards mine, and looked far more attentively at me than she had looked at the sailing-ships. "'It was neither a very true nor a very polite thing to say,' she remarked, directing her eyes to the ships again. "'Who said it?' I was disconcerted, for I had broken away without quite seeing where I was going to. It was not to be shuffled off now, however, and I answered, "'The beautiful young lady at Miss Havisham's, and she's more beautiful than anybody ever was, and I admire her dreadfully, and I want to be a gentleman on her account. Having made this lunatic confession, I began to throw my torn-up grass into the river, as if I had some thoughts of following it. "'Do you want to be a gentleman, to spite her, or to gain her over?' Biddy quietly asked me, after a pause. "'I don't know,' I mutely answered. "'Because if it is to spite her,' Biddy pursued, "'I should think, but you know best, "'that might be better and more independently done "'by caring nothing for her words. "'And if it is to gain her over, I should think, "'but you know best, she was not worth gaining over.' "'Exactly what I myself had thought many times. "'Exactly what was perfectly manifest to me at the moment.' But how could I, a poor dazed village lad, avoid that wonderful inconsistency into which the best and wisest of men fall every day? It may be all quite true, said I to Biddy, but I admire her dreadfully. In short, I turned over on my face when I came to that, and got a good grasp on the hair on each side of my head, 
and wrenched it well. All the while knowing the madness of my heart to be so very mad and misplaced, that I was quite conscious it would have served my face right, if I had lifted it up by my hair, and knocked it against the pebbles as a punishment for belonging to such an idiot. Biddy was the wisest of girls, and she tried to reason no more with me. She put her hand, which was a comfortable hand, though roughened by work, upon my hands, one after another, and gently took them out of my hair. Then she softly patted my shoulder in a soothing way, while with my face upon my sleeve I cried a little, exactly as I had done in the brewery yard, and felt vaguely convinced that I was very much ill-used by somebody, or by everybody, I can't say which. "'I am glad of one thing,' said Biddy, "'and that is that you have felt you could give me your confidence, Pip. And I am glad of another thing, and that is, that of course you know you may depend upon my keeping it, and always so far deserving it. If your first teacher, dear, such a poor one, and so much in need of being taught herself, had been your teacher at the present time, she thinks she knows what lessons she would set, but it would be a hard one to learn, and you have got beyond her, and it's of no use now. So, with a quiet sigh for me, Biddy rose from the bank, and said, with a fresh and pleasant change of voice, "'Shall we walk a little farther, or go home?' "'Biddy,' I cried, getting up, putting my arms round her neck, and giving her a kiss, "'I shall always tell you everything.' "'Till you're a gentleman,' said Biddy. "'You know I never shall be, so that's always. Not that I have any occasion to tell you anything, for you know everything I know, as I told you at home the other night.' said Biddy, quite in a whisper, as she looked away at the ships, and then repeated, with her former pleasant change, "'Shall we walk a little farther, or go home?' I said to Biddy we would walk a little farther, and we did so, and the summer afternoon toned down into the summer evening, and it was very beautiful. I began to consider whether I was not more naturally and wholesomely situated, after all, in these circumstances, than playing beggar my neighbour by candlelight in the room with the stop clocks, and being despised by Estella. I thought it would be very good for me if I could get her out of my head, with all the rest of those remembrances and fancies, and could go to work determined to relish what I had to do, and stick to it, and make the best of it. I asked myself the question whether I did not surely know that if Estella were beside me at that moment, instead of Biddy, she would make me miserable. I was obliged to admit that I did know it for a certainty, and I said to myself, Pip, what a fool you are! We talked a good deal as we walked, and all that Biddy said seemed right. Biddy was never insulting, or capricious, or Biddy to-day and somebody else to-morrow. She would have derived only pain and no pleasure from giving me pain she would far rather have wounded her own breast than mine. How could it be, then, that I did not like her much the better of the two? "'Biddy,' said I, when we were walking homeward, "'I wish you could put me right.' "'I wish I could,' said Biddy. "'If I could only get myself to fall in love with you—you you don't mind my speaking so openly to such an old acquaintance.' "'Oh, dear, not at all,' said Biddy. Don't mind me. If I could only get myself to do it, that would be the thing for me. But you never will, you see, said Biddy. It did not appear quite so unlikely to me that evening, as it would have done if we had discussed it a few hours before. I therefore observed I was not quite sure of that. But Biddy said she was, and she said it decisively. In my heart I believed her to be right, and yet I took it rather ill, too, that she should be so positive on the point. When we came near the churchyard we had to cross an embankment, and get over a stile near a sluice-gate. There started up from the gate, or from the rushes, or from the ooze, which was quite in his stagnant way, old Orlick. Hallo! he growled. "'Where are you two going?' "'Where should we be going but home?' "'Well, then,' said he, I'm jiggered if I don't see a home. 
This penalty of being jiggered was a favourite, suppositious case of his. He attached no definite meaning to the word that I am aware of, but used it, like his own pretended Christian name, to affront mankind, and convey an idea of something savagely damaging. When I was younger, I had had a general belief that if he had jiggered me personally, he would have done it with a sharp and twisted hook. Biddy was much against his going with us, and said to me in a whisper, "'Don't let him come. I don't like him.' As I did not like him either, I took the liberty of saying that we thanked him, but we didn't want seeing home. He received that piece of information with a yell of laughter, and dropped back but came slouching after us at a little distance. Curious to know whether Biddy suspected him of having had a hand in that murderous attack, of which my sister had never been able to give any account, I asked her why she did not like him. "'Oh,' she replied, glancing over her shoulder as he slouched after us, "'because I... I'm afraid he likes me.' "'Did he ever tell you he liked you?' I asked indignantly. No, said Biddy, glancing over her shoulder again. He never told me so, but he dances at me whenever he can catch my eye. However novel and peculiar this testimony of attachment, I did not doubt the accuracy of the interpretation. I was very hot indeed upon old Orlick's daring to admire her, as hot as if it were an outrage on myself. But it makes no difference to you, you know said Biddy, calmly. "'No, Biddy, it makes no difference to me. Only I don't like it. I don't approve of it.' "'Nor I either,' said Biddy, "'though that makes no difference to you.' "'Exactly,' said I. "'But I must tell you I should have no opinion of you, Biddy, if he danced at you with your own consent.' I kept an eye on Orlick after that night, and whenever circumstances were favourable to his dancing at Biddy, got before him to obscure that demonstration. He had struck root in Joe's establishment, by reason of my sister's sudden fancy for him, or I should have tried to get him dismissed. He quite understood and reciprocated my good intentions, as I had reason to know thereafter. And now, because my mind was not confused enough before, I complicated its confusion fifty thousandfold, by having states and seasons when I was clear that Biddy was immeasurably better than Estella, and that the plain honest working life to which I was born had nothing in it to be ashamed of, but offered me sufficient means of self-respect and happiness. At those times I would decide conclusively that my disaffection to dear old Joe and the forge was gone, and that I was growing up in a fair way to be partners with Joe, and to keep company with Biddy, when all in a moment some confounding remembrance of the Havisham days would fall upon me like a destructive missile, and scatter my wits again. Scattered wits take a long time picking up, and often before I had got them well together, they would be dispersed in all directions by one stray thought, that perhaps after all Miss Havisham was going to make my fortune when my time was out. If my time had run out, it would have left me still at the height of my perplexities, I dare say. It never did run out, however, but was brought to a premature end, as I proceed to relate. End of chapter Chapter 18 of Great Expectations this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens, Chapter 18 It was in the fourth year of my apprenticeship to Joe, and it was a Saturday night. There was a group assembled round the fire at the Three Jolly Bargemen, attentive to Mr. Wopsle as he read the newspaper aloud. Of that group I was one. A highly popular murder had been committed, and Mr. Wopsle was imbrued in blood to the eyebrows. He gloated over every abhorrent adjective in the description, and identified himself with every witness at the inquest. 
he faintly moaned, "'I am done for,' as the victim, and he barbarously bellowed, "'I'll serve you out,' as the murderer. He gave the medical testimony, in pointed imitation of our local practitioner, and he piped and shook, as the aged turnpike-keeper who had heard blows, to an extent so very paralytic as to suggest a doubt regarding the mental competency of that witness. The coroner in Mr. Wopsle's hands became Timon of Athens, the beetle Coriolanus. He enjoyed himself thoroughly, and we all enjoyed ourselves, and were delightfully comfortable. In this cosy state of mind we came to the verdict, Wilful Murder. Then, and not sooner, I became aware of a strange gentleman leaning over the back of the settle opposite me, looking on. There was an expression of contempt on his face, and he bit the side of a great forefinger as he watched the group of faces. "'Well,' said the stranger to Mr. Wopsell, when the reading was done, "'you have settled it all to your own satisfaction, I have no doubt.' Everybody started and looked up, as if it were the murderer." He looked at everybody coldly and sarcastically. "'Guilty, of course,' said he. "'Out with it, come!' "'So,' returned Mr. Wopsle, "'without having the honour of your acquaintance, I do say guilty.' Upon this we all took courage to unite in a confirmatory murmur. "'I know you do,' said the stranger. "'I knew you would. I told you so. But now I'll ask you a question.' Do you know, or do you not know, that the law of England supposes every man to be innocent, until he is proved, proved, to be guilty? Sir, Mr. Wopsle began to reply, as an Englishman myself, I— Come, said the stranger, biting his forefinger at him, don't evade the question. Either you know it, or you don't know it. Which is it to be? He stood with his head on one side, and himself on one side, in a bullying, interrogative manner, and he threw his forefinger at Mr. Wopsle, as if it were to mark him out, before biting it again. "'Now,' said he, "'do you know it, or don't you know it?' "'Certainly I know it,' replied Mr. Wopsle. "'Certainly you know it. Then why didn't you say so at first? Now I'll ask you another question.' taking possession of Mr. Wopsle, as if he had a right to him. "'Do you know that none of these witnesses have yet been cross-examined?' Mr. Wopsle was beginning, "'I can only say,' when the stranger stopped him. "'What? You won't answer the question, yes or no? Now I'll try you again,' throwing his finger at him again. "'Attend to me. Are you aware?' Or are you not aware that none of these witnesses have yet been cross-examined? Come, I only want one word from you. Yes or no? Mr. Wopsle hesitated, and we all began to conceive rather a poor opinion of him. Come, said the stranger. I'll help you. You don't deserve help, but I'll help you. Look at that paper you hold in your hand. What is it? What is it? repeated Mr. Wopsle, eyeing it, much at a loss. "'Is it,' pursued the stranger in his most sarcastic and suspicious manner, "'the printed paper you have just been reading from?' "'Undoubtedly.' "'Undoubtedly. Now turn to that paper, and tell me whether it distinctly states that the prisoner expressly said that his legal advisers instructed him altogether to reserve his defence. "'I read that just now,' Mr. Wopsle pleaded. "'Never mind what you read just now, sir. I don't ask you what you read just now. You may read the Lord's Prayer backwards if you like, and perhaps have done it before to-day. Turn to the paper. No, 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 my friend, not to the top of the column, you know better than that. To the bottom, to the bottom!' We all began to think Mr. Wopsle full of subterfuge. "'Well, have you found it?' "'Here it is,' said Mr. Wopsle. "'Now follow that passage with your eye, and tell me whether it distinctly states that the prisoner expressly said that he was instructed by his legal advisers wholly to reserve his defence. Come, do you make that of it?' 
Mr. Wopsle answered, "'Those are not the exact words.' "'Not the exact words,' repeated the gentleman bitterly. "'Is that the exact substance?' "'Yes,' said Mr. Wopsle. "'Yes,' repeated the stranger, looking round at the rest of the company with his right hand extended towards the witness, Wopsle. "'And now I ask you what you say to the conscience of that man who, with that passage before his eyes, can lay his head upon his pillow after having pronounced a fellow-creature guilty, unheard.' We all began to suspect that Mr. Wopsle was not the man we had thought him, and that he was beginning to be found out. "'And that same man, remember,' pursued the gentleman, throwing his finger at Mr. Wopsle heavily, "'that same man might be summoned as a juryman upon this very trial, and, having thus deeply committed himself, might return to the bosom of his family and lay his head upon his pillow, after deliberately swearing that he would well and truly try the issue joined between our sovereign lord the king and the prisoner at the bar, and would a true verdict give, according to the evidence, so help him God. We were all deeply persuaded that the unfortunate Wopsle had gone too far, and had better stop in his reckless career while there was yet time. The strange gentleman, with an air of authority not to be disputed, and with a manner expressive of knowing something secret about every one of us that would effectually do for each individual, if he chose to disclose it, left the back of the settle, and came into the space between the two settles, in front of the fire, where he remained standing, his left hand in his pocket, and he biting the forefinger of his right. "'From information I have received,' said he, looking round at us as we all quailed before him, "'I have reason to believe there is a blacksmith among you, by name Joseph or Joe Gargery. Which is the man?' "'Here is the man,' said Joe. The strange gentleman beckoned him out of his place, and Joe went. "'You have an apprentice,' pursued the stranger, "'commonly known as Pip. Is he here?' "'I am here,' I cried. The stranger did not recognize me, but I recognized him as the gentleman I had met on the stairs, on the occasion of my second visit to Miss Havisham. I had known him the moment I saw him looking over the settle, and now that I stood confronting him with his hand upon my shoulder, I checked off again in detail his large head, his dark complexion, his deep-set eyes, his bushy black eyebrows, his large watch-chain, his strong black dots of beard and whisker, and even the smell of scented soap on his great hand. "'I wish to have a private conference with you, too.' said he, when he had surveyed me at his leisure. "'It will take a little time. Perhaps we had better go to your place of residence. I prefer not to anticipate my communication here. You will impart as much or as little of it as you please to your friends afterwards. I have nothing to do with that.' Amidst a wondering silence we three walked out of the jolly bargeman, and in a wondering silence walked home. While going along, the strange gentleman occasionally looked at me, and occasionally bit the side of his finger. As we neared home, Joe vaguely acknowledging the occasion as an impressive and ceremonious one, went on ahead to open the front door. Our conference was held in the state parlour, which was feebly lighted by one candle. It began with the strange gentleman sitting down at the table, drawing the candle to him, and looking over some entries in his pocket-book. He then put up the pocket-book, and set the candle a little aside, after peering round it into the darkness at Joe and me, to ascertain which was which. "'My name,' he said, "'is Jaggers, and I am a lawyer in London. I am pretty well known. I have unusual business to transact with you, and I commence by explaining that it is not of my originating. If my advice had been asked, I should not have been here.' It was not asked, and you see me here. What I have to do as the confidential agent of another, I do, no less, no more. Finding that he could not see us very well from where he sat, he got up, and threw one leg over the back of a chair and leaned upon it, thus having one foot on the seat of the chair and one foot on the ground. Now Joseph Gargery, 
I am the bearer of an offer to relieve you of this young fellow, your apprentice. You would not object to cancel his indentures at his request and for his good. You would want nothing for so doing? Lord forbid that I should want anything for not standing in Pip's way, said Joe, staring. Lord forbidding is pious, but not to the purpose, returned Mr. Jaggers. The question is, would you want anything? Do you want anything? The answer is, returned Joe, sternly, no. I thought Mr. Jaggers glanced at Joe, as if he considered him a fool for his disinterestedness. But I was too much bewildered between breathless curiosity and surprise to be sure of it. "'Very well,' said Mr. Jaggers. "'Recollect the admission you have made, and don't try to go from it presently.' "'Who's a going to try?' retorted Joe. "'I don't say anybody is. "'Do you keep a dog?' "'Yes, I do keep a dog.' "'Bear in mind, then, that Bragg is a good dog, but Holdfast is a better. "'Bear that in mind, will you?' repeated Mr. Jaggers, shutting his eyes and nodding his head at Joe, as if he were forgiving him something. "'Now I return to this young fellow, and the communication I have got to make is that he has great expectations.' Joe and I gasped and looked at one another. "'I am instructed to communicate to him,' said Mr. Jaggers, throwing his finger at me sideways, "'that he will come into a handsome property. Further, that it is the desire of the present possessor of that property, that he be immediately removed from his present sphere of life and from this place, and be brought up as a gentleman, in a word, as a young fellow of great expectations. My dream was out. My wild fancy was surpassed by sober reality. Miss Havisham was going to make my fortune on a grand scale. Now, Mr. Pip, pursued the lawyer, I address the rest of what I have to say to you. You are to understand first that it is the request of the person from whom I take my instructions that you always bear the name of Pip. You will have no objection, I dare say, to your great expectations being encumbered with that easy condition. But if you have any objections, this is the time to mention it. My heart was beating so fast, and there was such a singing in my ears, that I could scarcely stammer. I had no objection. I should think not. Now, you are to understand, secondly, Mr. Pip, that the name of the person who is your liberal benefactor remains a profound secret, until the person chooses to reveal it. I am empowered to mention that it is the intention of the person to reveal it at first hand by word of mouth to yourself. When or where that intention may be carried out, I cannot say. No one can say. It may be years hence. Now, you are distinctly to understand that you are most positively prohibited from making any inquiry on this head, or any allusion or reference, however distant, to any individual whomsoever, as the individual, in all the communications you may have with me. If you have a suspicion in your own breast, keep that suspicion in your own breast." It is not the least to the purpose what the reasons of this prohibition are. They may be the strongest and gravest reasons, or they may be mere whim. This is not for you to inquire into. The condition is laid down. Your acceptance of it and your observance of it is binding, is the only remaining condition that I am charged with by the person from whom I take my instructions, and for whom I am not otherwise responsible. That person is the person from whom you derive your expectations, and this secret is solely held by that person and by me. Again, not a very difficult condition with which to encumber such a rise in fortune, but if you have any objection to it, this is the time to mention it. Speak out. Once more I stammered with difficulty that I had no objection. I should think not. Now, Mr. Pip, I have done with stipulations. Though he called me Mr. Pip, and began rather to make up to me, he still could not get rid of a certain air of bullying suspicion, 
and even now he occasionally shut his eyes and threw his finger at me while he spoke, as much as to express that he knew all kinds of things to my disparagement, if he only chose to mention them. We come next to mere details of arrangement. You must know that, although I have used the term expectations more than once, you are not endowed with expectations only. There is already lodged in my hands a sum of money amply sufficient for your suitable education and maintenance. You will please consider me your guardian. Oh, for I was going to thank him. I tell you at once I am paid for my services, or I shouldn't render them. It is considered that you must be better educated, in accordance with your altered position, and that you will be alive to the importance and necessity of at once entering on that advantage. I said I had always longed for it. "'Never mind what you have always longed for, Mr. Pip,' he retorted. "'Keep to the record. If you long for it now, that's enough. Am I answered that you are ready to be placed at once under some proper tutor? Is that it?' I stammered, "'Yes, that was it.' "'Good. Now your inclinations are to be consulted. I don't think that wise, mind, but it's my trust.' Have you ever heard of any tutor whom you would prefer to another? I had never heard of any tutor but Biddy and Mr. Wopsle's great aunt, so I replied in the negative. There is a certain tutor of whom I have some knowledge, who I think might suit the purpose, said Mr. Jaggers. I don't recommend him, observe, because I never recommend anybody. The gentleman I speak of is one Mr. Matthew Pocket. Ah! I caught at the name directly, Miss Havisham's relation, the Matthew whom Mr. and Mrs. Camilla had spoken of, the Matthew whose place was to be at Miss Havisham's head when she lay dead in her bride's dress on the bride's table. "'You know the name?' said Mr. Jaggers, looking shrewdly at me, and then shutting up his eyes while he waited for my answer. My answer was that I had heard of the name. "'Oh!' said he. You have heard of the name. But the question is, what do you say of it? I said, or tried to say, that I was much obliged to him for his recommendation. No, my young friend, he interrupted, shaking his great head very slowly. Recollect yourself. Not recollecting myself, I began again that I was much obliged to him for his recommendation. No, my young friend he interrupted, shaking his head and frowning and smiling both at once. No, no, no. It's very well done, but it won't do. You are too young to fix me with it. Recommendation is not the word, Mr. Pip. Try another. Correcting myself, I said that I was much obliged to him for his mention of Mr. Matthew Pocket. That's more like it, cried Mr. Jaggers. And, I added, I would gladly try that gentleman. Good. You had better try him in his own house. The way shall be prepared for you, and you can see his son first, who is in London. When will you come to London? I said, glancing at Joe, who stood looking on, motionless, that I supposed I could come directly. First, said Mr. Jaggers, you should have some new clothes to come in, and they should not be working clothes. Say this day week. You'll want some money. Shall I leave you twenty guineas? He produced a long purse with the greatest coolness and counted them out on the table and pushed them over to me. This was the first time he had taken his leg from the chair. He sat astride of that chair when he had pushed for the money over and sat swinging his purse and eyeing Joe. Well, Joseph Gargery, you look dumbfoundered. "'I am,' said Joe, in a very decided manner. "'It was understood that you wanted nothing for yourself, remember?' "'It were understood,' said Joe, "'and it are understood, and it ever will be similar according.' "'But what,' said Mr. Jaggers, swinging his purse, "'what if it was in my instructions to make you a present as compensation?' "'As compensation what for?' Joe demanded. 
for the loss of his services. Joe laid his hand upon my shoulder with the touch of a woman. I have often thought him since, like the steam hammer that can crush a man or pat an eggshell, in his combination of strength with gentleness. Pip is that hearty welcome, said Joe, to go free with his services, to honour and fortune, as no words can tell him. But if you think as money can make a compensation to me for the loss of the little child, what come to the forge, and ever the best of friends, oh, dear good Joe, whom I was so ready to leave and so unthankful to, I see you again, with your muscular blacksmith's arm before your eyes, and your broad chest heaving, and your voice dying away. Oh, dear, good, faithful, tender Joe! I feel the loving tremble of your hand upon my arm, as solemnly this day as if it had been the rustle of an angel's wing. But I encouraged Joe at the time. I was lost in the mazes of my future fortunes, and could not retrace the bypaths we had trodden together. I begged Joe to be comforted, for, as he said, we had ever been the best of friends, and, as I said, we ever would be so. Joe scooped his eyes with his disengaged wrist, as if he were bent on gouging himself, but said not another word. Mr. Jaggers had looked on at this, as one who recognized in Joe the village idiot, and in me his keeper. When it was over, he said, weighing in his hand the purse he had ceased to swing, "'Now, Joseph Gargery, I warn you this is your last chance. No half-measures with me.' If you mean to take a present, then I have it in charge to make you. Speak out, and you shall have it. If on the contrary you mean to say— Here, to his great amazement, he was stopped by Joe's suddenly working round him with every demonstration of a fell pugilistic purpose. "'Which I mean to say,' cried Joe, "'that if you come into my place bull-baiting and badgering me, come out. Which I mean to say, as such as you're a man, come on.' which I mean to say that what I say, I mean to say, and stand or fall by. I drew Joe away, and he immediately became placable, merely stating to me, in an obliging manner, and as a polite expostulatory notice to any one whom it might happen to concern, that he were not a-going to be bull-baited and badgered in his own place. Mr. Jaggers had risen when Joe demonstrated, and had backed near the door. Without evincing any inclination to come in again, he there delivered his valedictory remarks. They were these. "'Well, Mr. Pip, I think the sooner you leave here, as you are to be a gentleman, the better. Let it stand for this day week, and you shall receive my printed address in the meantime. You can take a hackney coach at the stagecoach office in London, and come straight to me.' Understand that I express no opinion, one way or other, on the trust I undertake. I am paid for undertaking it, and I do so. Now understand that, finally. Understand that. He was throwing his finger at both of us, and I think would have gone on, but for his seeming to think Joe dangerous, and going off. Something came into my head which induced me to run after him, as he was going down to the jolly bargeman, where he had left a hired carriage. "'I beg your pardon, Mr. Jaggers.' "'Hallo,' said he, facing round. "'What's the matter?' "'I wish to be quite right, Mr. Jaggers, and to keep to your directions, so I thought I had better ask. Would there be any objection to my taking leave of any one I know about here before I go away?' "'No,' said he, looking as if he hardly understood me. I don't mean in the village only, but uptown? No, said he, no objection. I thanked him and ran home again, and there I found that Joe had already locked the front door and vacated the state parlour, and was seated by the kitchen fire, with a hand on each knee, gazing intently at the burning coals. I too sat down before the fire and gazed at the coals, and nothing was said for a long time. My sister was in her cushioned chair in her corner, and Biddy sat at her needlework before the fire, and Joe sat next Biddy, and I sat next Joe in the corner opposite my sister. The more I looked into the glowing coals, the more incapable I became of looking at Joe. 
The longer the silence lasted, the more unable I felt to speak. At length I got out. Joe, have you told Biddy? No, Pip, returned Joe, still looking at the fire, and holding his knees tight, as if he had private information that they intended to make off somewhere. Which I left to yourself, Pip. I would rather you told, Joe. Pip's a gentleman of fortune, then, said Joe, and God bless him in it. Biddy dropped her work and looked at me. Joe held his knees and looked at me. I looked at both of them. After a pause they both heartily congratulated me, but there was a certain touch of sadness in their congratulations that I rather resented. I took it upon myself to impress Biddy, and through Biddy, Joe, with the grave obligation I considered my friends under, to know nothing and say nothing about the maker of my fortune. It would all come out in good time, I observed, and in the meanwhile nothing was to be said, save that I had come into great expectations from a mysterious patron. Biddy nodded her head thoughtfully at the fire as she took up her work again, and said she would be very particular, and Joe, still detaining his knees, said, "'Aye, aye, I'll be equally particular, Pip,' and then they congratulated me again, and went on to express so much wonder at the notion of my being a gentleman that I didn't half like it. Infinite pains were then taken by Biddy to convey to my sister some idea of what had happened. To the best of my belief, those efforts entirely failed. She laughed and nodded her head a great many times, and even repeated after Biddy the words Pip and Property. But I doubt if they had more meaning in them than an election cry, and I cannot suggest a darker picture of her state of mind. I never could have believed it without experience, but as Joe and Biddy became more at their cheerful ease again, I became quite gloomy. Dissatisfied with my fortune, of course I could not be, but it is possible that I may have been, without quite knowing it, dissatisfied with myself. Anyhow, I sat with my elbow on my knee and my face upon my hand, looking into the fire, as those two talk about my going away, and about what they should do without me, and all that. And whenever I caught one of them looking at me, though never so pleasantly, and they often looked at me, particularly Biddy, I felt offended, as if they were expressing some mistrust of me, though heaven knows they never did by word or sign. At those times I would get up and look out at the door, for our kitchen door opened at once upon the night, and stood open on summer evenings to air the room. The very stars to which I then raised my eyes, I am afraid I took to be but poor and humble stars for glittering on the rustic objects among which I had passed my life. Saturday night, said I, when we sat at our supper of bread and cheese and beer. Five more days, and then the day before the day. They'll soon go. Yes, Pip, observed Joe, whose voice sounded hollow in his beer mug. They'll soon go. Soon, soon go, said Biddy. I have been thinking, Joe, that when I go downtown on Monday, and order my new clothes, I shall tell the tailor that I'll come and put them on there, or that I'll have them set to Mr. Pumblechook's. It would be very disagreeable to be stared at by all the people here. Mr. and Mrs. Hubble might like to see you in your new genteel figure, too, Pip, said Joe, industriously cutting his bread, with his cheese on it, in the palm of his left hand, and glancing at my untasted supper, as if he thought of the time when we used to compare slices. So might Wopsle and the jolly bargeman might take it as a compliment. That's just what I don't want, Joe. They would make such a business of it, such a coarse and common business, that I couldn't bear myself. Ah, that indeed, Pip, said Joe. If you couldn't abear yourself. Biddy asked me here, as she sat holding my sister's plate, Have you thought about when you'll show yourself to Mr. Gargery, and your sister and me? You will show yourself to us, won't you? Biddy, I returned with some resentment, you are so exceedingly quick that it's difficult to keep up with you. She always were quick, observed Joe. 
"'If you had waited another moment, Biddy, you would have heard me say that I shall bring my clothes here in a bundle one evening, most likely on the evening before I go away.' Biddy said no more. Handsomely forgiving her, I soon exchanged an affectionate good-night with her and Joe, and went up to bed. When I got into my little room, I sat down and took a long look at it, as a mean little room that I should soon be parted from and raised above, forever. It was furnished with fresh young remembrances, too, and even at the same moment I fell into much the same confused division of mind, between it and the better rooms to which I was going, as I had been and so often between the Forge and Miss Havisham's, and Biddy and Estella. The sun had been shining brightly all day on the roof of my attic, and the room was warm. As I put the window open and stood looking out, I saw Joe come slowly forth at the dark door, below, and take a turn or two in the air. And then I saw Biddy come, and bring him a pipe, and light it for him. He never smoked so late, and it seemed to hint to me that he wanted comforting, for some reason or other. He presently stood at the door immediately beneath me, smoking his pipe, and Biddy stood there too, quietly talking to him, and I knew that they talked of me, for I heard my name mentioned in an endearing tone by both of them more than once. I would not have listened for more, if I could have heard more, so I drew away from the window, and sat down in my one chair by the bedside, feeling it very sorrowful and strange that this first night of my bright fortunes should be the loneliest I had ever known. Looking towards the open window, I saw light wreaths from Joe's pipe floating there, and I fancied it was like a blessing from Joe, not obtruded on me or paraded before me, but pervading the air we shared together. I put my light out, and crept into bed, and it was an uneasy bed now, and I never slept the old sound sleep in it any more. End of chapter. Chapter 19 of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens, Chapter 19 Morning made a considerable difference in my general prospect of life, and brightened it so much that it scarcely seemed the same. What lay heaviest on my mind was the consideration that six days intervened between me and the day of departure for I could not divest myself of a misgiving that something might happen to London in the meanwhile, and that, when I got there, it would be either greatly deteriorated or clean gone. Joe and Biddy were very sympathetic and pleasant when I spoke of our approaching separation, but they only referred to it when I did. After breakfast, Joe brought out my indentures from the press in the best parlour, and we put them in the fire, and I felt that I was free. With all the novelty of my emancipation on me, I went to church with Joe, and thought perhaps the clergyman wouldn't have read that about the rich man in the kingdom of heaven if he had known all. After our early dinner, I strolled out alone, proposing to finish off the marshes at once, and to get them done with. As I passed the church, I felt, as I had felt during service in the morning, a sublime compassion for the poor creatures who were destined to go there, Sunday after Sunday, all their lives through, and to lie obscurely at last among the low green mounds. I promised myself that I would do something for them one of these days, and formed a plan in outline for bestowing a dinner of roast beef and plum pudding, a pint of ale, and a gallon of condescension upon everybody in the village. If I had often thought before, with something allied to shame, of my companionship with the fugitive whom I had once seen limping among those graves, what were my thoughts on this Sunday, when the place recalled the wretch, ragged and shivering, with his felon iron and batch? My comfort was that it happened a long time ago, and that he had doubtless been transported a long way off, and that he was dead to me, 
and might be veritably dead into the bargain. No more low, wet grounds, no more dikes and sluices, no more of these grazing cattle, though they seemed in their dull manner to wear a more respectful air now, and to face round, in order that they might stare as long as possible at the possessor of such great expectations. Farewell, monotonous acquaintances of my childhood, Henceforth I was for London and greatness, not for Smith's work in general, and for you. I made my exultant way to the old battery, and, lying down there to consider the question whether Miss Havisham intended me for Estella, fell asleep. When I awoke I was much surprised to find Joe sitting beside me, smoking his pipe. He greeted me with a cheerful smile on my opening my eyes, and said, "'As being the last time, Pip, I thought I'd foller. "'And, Joe, I'm very glad you did so.' "'Thank you, Pip.' "'You may be sure, dear Joe,' I went on, after we had shaken hands, "'that I shall never forget you.' "'No, no, Pip,' said Joe, in a comfortable tone. "'I'm sure of that. "'Aye, aye, old chap, bless you. It were only necessary to get it well round in a man's mind to be certain on it. But it took a bit of time to get it well round. The change come so uncommon plump, didn't it? Somehow I was not best pleased with Joe's being so mightily secure of me. I should have liked him to have betrayed emotion, or to have said, It does you credit, Pip, or something of that sort. Therefore I made no remark on Joe's first head merely saying, as to a second, that the tidings had indeed come suddenly, but that I had always wanted to be a gentleman, and had often and often speculated on what I would do, if I were one. "'Have you, though?' said Joe. "'Astonishing!' "'It's a pity now, Joe,' said I, "'that you did not get on a little more when we had our lessons here, isn't it?' "'Well, I don't know,' returned Joe. I'm so awful dull. I'm only master of my own trade. It were always a pity as I was so awful dull, but it's no more of a pity now than it was this day twelvemonth, don't you see? What I had meant was, that when I came into my property and was able to do something for Joe, it would have been much more agreeable if he had been better qualified for a rise in station. He was so perfectly innocent of my meaning, however, that I thought I would mention it to Biddy in preference. So when we had walked home and had had tea, I took Biddy into our little garden, by the side of the lane, and after throwing out in a general way for the elevation of her spirits, that I should never forget her, said I had a favour to ask of her. "'And it is, Biddy,' said I, "'that you will not omit any opportunity of helping Joe on a little.' "'How helping him on?' asked Biddy, with a steady sort of glance. "'Well, Joe is a dear good fellow. In fact, I think he is the dearest fellow that ever lived. But he is rather backward in some things. For instance, Biddy, in his learning and his manners.' Although I was looking at Biddy as I spoke, and although she opened her eyes very wide when I had spoken, she did not look at me. "'Oh!' his manners. Won't his manners do, then? asked Biddy, plucking a black currant leaf. My dear Biddy, they do very well here. Oh, they do very well here, interrupted Biddy, looking closely at the leaf in her hand. Hear me out. But if I were to remove Joe into a higher sphere, as I shall hope to remove him when I fully come into my property, they would hardly do him justice. "'And don't you think he knows that?' asked Biddy. It was such a very provoking question, for it had never in the most distant manner occurred to me, that I said snappishly, "'Biddy, what do you mean?' Biddy, having rubbed the leaf to pieces between her hands, and the smell of a black currant bush has ever since recalled to me that evening in the little garden by the side of the lane, said, have you never considered that he may be proud? Proud? I repeated with disdainful emphasis. Oh, there are many kinds of pride, said Biddy, looking full at me and shaking her head. 
Pride is not all of one kind. Well, what are you stopping for? said I. Not all of one kind, resumed Biddy. He may be too proud to let any one take him out of a place that he is competent to fill, and fills well and with respect. To tell you the truth, I think he is, though it sounds bold in me to say so, for you must know him far better than I do. Now, Biddy, said I, I'm very sorry to see this in you. I did not expect to see this in you. You are envious, Biddy, and grudging. You are dissatisfied on account of my rise in fortune, and you can't help showing it. If you have the heart to think so, returned Biddy, say so. Say so over and over again, if you have the heart to think so. If you have the heart to be so, you mean, Biddy, said I, in a virtuous and superior tone, don't put it off upon me. I am very sorry to see it, and it's a, it's a bad side of human nature. I did intend to ask you to use any little opportunities you might have, after I was gone, of improving, dear Joe. But after this I ask you nothing. I am extremely sorry to see this in you, Biddy. I repeated. It's a, it's a bad side of human nature. Whether you scold me or approve of me, returned poor Biddy, you may equally depend upon my trying to do all that lies in my power, here, at all times. And whatever opinion you take away of me, shall make no difference in my remembrance of you. Yet a gentleman should not be unjust, neither said Biddy, turning away her head. I again warmly repeated that it was a bad side of human nature, in which sentiment, waiving its application, I have since seen reason to think I was right. And I walked down the little path away from Biddy, and Biddy went into the house, and I went out at the garden gate and took a dejected stroll until supper-time, again feeling it very sorrowful and strange that this the second night of my bright fortunes should be as lonely and unsatisfactory as the first. But morning once more brightened my view, and I extended my clemency to Biddy, and we dropped the subject. Putting on the best clothes I had, I went into town as early as I could hope to find the shops open, and presented myself before Mr. Trabb, the tailor, who was having his breakfast in the parlour behind his shop and who did not think it worth his while to come out to me, but called me in to him. "'Well,' said Mr. Trabb, in a hail-fellow well-met kind of way, "'how are you, and what can I do for you?' Mr. Trabb had sliced his hot roll into three feather-beds, and was slipping butter in between the blankets and covering it up. He was a prosperous old bachelor, and his open window looked into a prosperous little garden and orchard and there was a prosperous iron safe led into the wall at the side of his fireplace, and I did not doubt that heaps of his prosperity were put away in it in bags. "'Mr. Trabb,' said I, "'it's an unpleasant thing to have to mention, because it looks like boasting, but I have come into a handsome property.' A change passed over Mr. Trabb. He forgot the butter in bed, got up from the bedside, and wiped his fingers on the tablecloth, exclaiming, "'Lord, bless my soul!' "'I'm going up to my guardian in London,' said I, casually drawing some guineas out of my pocket and looking at them, "'and I want a fashionable suit of clothes to go in. I wish to pay for them,' I added, otherwise I thought he might only pretend to make them, "'with ready money.' "'My dear sir!' said Mr. Trabb, as he respectfully bent his body, opened his arms, and took the liberty of touching me on the outside of each elbow. "'Don't hurt me by mentioning that. May I venture to congratulate you? Would you do me the favour of stepping into the shop?' Mr. Trabb's boy was the most audacious boy in all that countryside. When I had entered he was sweeping the shop, and he had sweetened his labours by sweeping over me. He was still sweeping when I came out into the shop with Mr. Trabb, and he knocked the broom against all possible corners and obstacles, to express, as I understood it, 
equality with any blacksmith, alive or dead. "'Hold that noise!' said Mr. Trabb, with the greatest sternness, "'or I'll knock your head off. "'Do me the favour to be seated, sir. "'Now this,' said Mr. Trabb, taking down a roll of cloth, and tidying it out in a flowing manner over the counter, preparatory to getting his hand under it to show the gloss, "'is a very sweet article. "'I can recommend it for your purpose, sir, "'because it really is extra super. "'But you shall see some others. "'Give me number four, you,' to the boy, "'and with a dreadfully severe stare, "'foreseeing the danger of that miscreant's brushing me with it, "'or making some other sign of familiarity.' Mr. Trabb never removed his stern eye from the boy until he had deposited number four on the counter, and was at a safe distance again. Then he commanded him to bring number five and number eight. "'And let me have none of your tricks here,' said Mr. Trabb, "'or you shall repent it, you young scoundrel, the longest day you have to live.' Mr. Trabb then bent over number four and in a sort of deferential confidence recommended it to me as a light article for summer wear, an article much in vogue among the nobility and gentry, an article that it would ever be an honour to him to reflect upon a distinguished fellow-townsman's, if he might claim me for a fellow-townsman, having worn. "'Are you bringing numbers five and eight, you vagabond?' said Mr. Trabb to the boy after that. "'Or shall I kick you out of the shop and bring them myself?' I selected the materials for a suit, with the assistance of Mr. Trabb's judgment, and re-entered the parlour to be measured. For although Mr. Trabb had my measure already, and had previously been quite contented with it, he said apologetically that it "'Wouldn't do under existing circumstances, sir. Wouldn't do at all.' So Mr. Trabb measured and calculated me in the parlour, as if I were an estate, and he the finest species of surveyor, and gave himself such a world of trouble that I felt that no suit of clothes could possibly remunerate him for his pains. When he had at last done, and had appointed to send the articles to Mr. Pumblechook's on the Thursday evening, he said, with his hand upon the parlour lock, "'I know, sir, that London gentlemen cannot be expected to patronise local work as a rule.' but if you would give me a turn now and then in the quality of a townsman, I should greatly esteem it. Good morning, sir. Much obliged. Door. The last word was flung at the boy, who had not the least notion what it meant. But I saw him collapse as his master rubbed me out with his hands, and my first decided experience of the stupendous power of money was that it had morally laid upon his back Trab's boy. After this memorable event, I went to the hatters, and the bootmakers, and the hosiers, and felt rather like Mother Hubbard's dog whose outfit required the services of so many trades. I also went to the coach office, and took my place for seven o'clock on Saturday morning. It was not necessary to explain everywhere that I had come into a handsome property, but whenever I said anything to that effect— it followed that the officiating tradesman ceased to have his attention diverted through the window by the high street, and concentrated his mind upon me. When I had ordered everything I wanted, I directed my steps towards Pumblechook's, and, as I approached that gentleman's place of business, I saw him standing at his door. He was waiting for me with great impatience. He had been out early with a chaise-cart, and had called at the forge and heard the news. He had prepared a collation for me in the Barnwell parlour, and he too ordered his shopman to come out of the gangway, as my sacred person passed. "'My dear friend,' said Mr. Pumblechook, taking me by both hands, when he and I and the collation were alone, "'I give you joy of your good fortune. Well deserved. Well deserved.' This was coming to the point and I thought it a sensible way of expressing himself. "'To think,' said Mr. Pumblechook, after snorting admiration at me for some moments, "'that I should have been the humble instrument of leading up to this is a proud reward.' I begged Mr. Pumblechook to remember that nothing was to be ever said or hinted on that point. 
"'My dear young friend,' said Mr. Pumblechook, "'if you will allow me to call you so.' I murmured, "'Certainly.' And Mr. Pumblechook took me by both hands again, and I communicated a movement to his waistcoat, which had an emotional appearance, though it was rather low down. "'My dear young friend, rely upon my doing my little all in your absence, by keeping the fact before the mind of Joseph.' "'Joseph,' said Mr. Pumblechook, in the way of a compassionate adjuration, "'Joseph, Joseph!' Thereupon he shook his head and tapped it, expressing his sense of deficiency in Joseph. "'But, my dear young friend,' said Mr. Pumblechook, "'you must be hungry. You must be exhausted. Be seated. Here is a chicken head round from the boar. Here is a tongue had round from the boar. Here's one or two little things had round from the boar that I hope you may not despise. But do I, said Mr. Pumblechook, getting up again the moment after he had sat down, see afore me, him as I ever sported with in his times of happy infancy? And may I, may I, this may I meant mighty shake hands. I consented, and he was fervent, and then sat down again. "'Here is wine,' said Mr. Pumblechook. "'Let us drink, thanks to fortune, and may she ever pick out her favourites with equal judgment. And yet I cannot,' said Mr. Pumblechook, getting up again, "'see afore me one, and likewise drink to one, without again expressing, "'May I, may I?' I said he might, and he shook hands with me again, and emptied his glass and turned it upside down. I did the same, and if I had turned myself upside down before drinking, the wine could not have gone more direct to my head. Mr. Pumblechook helped me to the liver wing, and to the best slice of tongue, none of those out-of-the-way, no thoroughfares of pork now, and took, comparatively speaking, no care of himself at all. "'Ah, poultry, poultry! You little thought,' said Mr. Pumblechook, apostrophizing the fowl in the dish, "'when you was a young fledgling, what was in store for you? You little thought you was to be refreshment beneath this humble roof for one as—' "'Call it a weakness, if you will,' said Mr. Pumblechook, getting up again. "'But may I? May I?' It began to be unnecessary to repeat the form of saying he might, so he did it at once. How he ever did it so often without wounding himself with my knife, I don't know. "'And your sister,' he resumed, after a little steady eating, "'which had the honour of bringing you up by hand. It's a sad picture, to reflect that she's no longer equal to fully understanding the honour. May... I saw he was about to come at me again, and I stopped him. "'We'll drink her health,' said I. "'Ha!' Ah, cried Mr. Pumblechook, leaning back in his chair, quite flaccid with admiration. "'That's the way you know em, sir!' I don't know who sir was, but he certainly was not I, and there was no third person present. "'That's the way you know the noble-minded, sir, ever forgiving and ever affable.' "'It might,' said the servile Pumblechook, putting down his untasted glass in a hurry, and getting up again, "'to a common person, have the appearance of repeating, but may I?' When he had done it, he resumed his seat and drank to my sister. "'Let us never be blind,' said Mr. Pumblechook, "'to her faults of temper, but it is to be hoped she meant well.' At about this time I began to observe that he was getting flushed in the face, as to myself I felt all face, steeped in wine and smarting. I mentioned to Mr. Pumblechook that I wished to have my new clothes sent to his house, and he was ecstatic on my so distinguishing him. I mentioned my reason for desiring to avoid observation in the village, and he lauded it to the skies. There was nobody but himself, he intimated, worthy of my confidence, and, in short, might he? 
Then he asked me tenderly if I remembered our boyish games at sums, and how we had gone together to have me bound apprentice, and in effect how he had ever been my favourite fancy and my chosen friend. If I had taken ten times as many glasses of wine as I had, I should have known that he never had stood in that relation towards me, and should in my heart of hearts have repudiated the idea. Yet for all that, I remember feeling convinced that I had been much mistaken in him, and that he was a sensible, practical, good-hearted, prime fellow. By degrees he fell to reposing such great confidence in me, as to ask my advice in reference to his own affairs. He mentioned that there was an opportunity for a great amalgamation and monopoly of the corn and seed trade on those premises, if enlarged, such as had never occurred before in that or any other neighbourhood. What alone was wanting to the realisation of a vast fortune he considered to be more capital. Those were the two little words, more capital. Now it appeared to him, Pumblechook, that if that capital were got into the business through a sleeping partner, sir, which sleeping partner would have nothing to do but walk in, by self or deputy, whenever he pleased, and examine the books, and walk in twice a year and take his profits away in his pocket, to the tune of fifty per cent, it appeared to him that that might be an opening for a young gentleman of spirit combined with property, which would be worthy of his attention. But what did I think? He had great confidence in my opinion, and what did I think? I gave it as my opinion. Wait a bit. The united vastness and distinctness of this view so struck him that he no longer asked if he might shake hands with me, but said he really must, and did. We drank all the wine, and Mr. Pumblechook pledged himself over and over again to keep Joseph up to the mark. I don't know what, Mark, and to render me efficient and constant service. I don't know what service. He also made known to me for the first time in my life, and certainly after having kept his secret wonderfully well, that he had always said of me, That boy is no common boy, and mark me, his fortune will be no common fortune. He said with a tearful smile that it was a singular thing to think of now, and I said so, too. Finally, I went out into the air, with a dim perception that there was something unwanted in the conduct of the sunshine, and found that I had slumberously got to the turnpike without having taken any account of the road. There I was roused by Mr. Pumblechook's hailing me. It was a long way down the sunny street, and was making expressive gestures for me to stop. I stopped, and he came up breathless. "'No, my dear friend,' said he, when he had recovered wind for speech, "'not if I can help it. This occasion shall not entirely pass without that affability on your part. May I, as an old friend and well-wisher, may I?' We shook hands for the hundredth time, at least, and he ordered a young carter out of my way with the greatest indignation. Then he blessed me, and stood waving his hand to me until I had passed the crook in the road, and then I turned into a field and had a long nap, under a hedge, before I pursued my way home. I had scant luggage to take with me to London, for little of the little I possessed was adapted to my new station, but I began packing that same afternoon, and wildly packed up things that I knew I should want next morning, in a fiction that there was not a moment to be lost. So Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday passed, and on Friday morning I went to Mr. Pumblechook's to put on my new clothes and pay my visit to Miss Havisham. Mr. Pumblechook's own room was given up to me to dress in, and was decorated with clean towels expressly for the event. My clothes were rather a disappointment, of course. Probably every new and eagerly expected garment ever put on since clothes came in fell a trifle short of the wearer's expectation. But after I had had my new suit on for some half an hour, and had gone through an immensity of posturing with Mr. Pumblechook's very limited dressing-glass, in the futile endeavour to see my legs, it seemed to fit me better. 
It being market morning at a neighbouring town some ten miles off, Mr. Pumblechook was not at home. I had not told him exactly when I meant to leave, and was not likely to shake hands with him again before departing. This was all as it should be, and I went out in my new array, fearfully ashamed of having to pass the shopman, and suspicious, after all, that I was at a personal disadvantage, something like Joe's in his Sunday suit. I went circuitously to Miss Havisham's by all the back ways, and rang at the bell constrainedly, on account of the stiff long fingers of my gloves. Sarah Pocket came to the gate, and positively reeled back when she saw me so changed, her walnut-shell countenance likewise turned from brown to green and yellow. "'You!' said she. "'You! Good gracious! What do you want?' "'I am going to London, Miss Pocket,' said I, "'and want to say good-bye to Miss Havisham.' I was not expected, for she left me locked in the yard, while she went to ask if I were to be admitted. After a very short delay, she returned and took me up, staring at me all the way. Miss Havisham was taking exercise in the room with a long spread table, leaning on her crutch-stick. The room was lighted as of yore, and at the sound of our entrance she stopped and turned. She was then just abreast of the rotted bride-cake. "'Don't go, Sarah,' she said. "'Well, Pip?' I start for London, Miss Havisham, to-morrow. I was exceedingly careful what I said. And I thought you would kindly not mind my taking leave of you. This is a gay figure, Pip, said she, making her crutch-stick play round me, as if she, the fairy godmother who had changed me, were bestowing the finishing gift. I have come into such good fortune since I saw you last, Miss Havisham, I murmured, and I am so grateful for it, Miss Havisham. Ay, ay, said she, looking at the discomfited and envious Sarah with delight. I have seen Mr. Jaggers. I have heard about it, Pip. So you go to-morrow? Yes, Miss Havisham. And you are adopted by a rich person. Yes, Miss Havisham. Not named. No, Miss Havisham. And Mr. Jaggers is made your guardian. Yes, Miss Havisham. She quite gloated on these questions and answers. So keen was her enjoyment of Sarah Pocket's jealous dismay. Well, she went on. You have a promising career before you. Be good, deserve it, and abide by Mr. Jagger's instructions. She looked at me, and looked at Sarah, and Sarah's countenance wrung out of her watchful face a cruel smile. Good-bye, Pip. You will always keep the name of Pip, you know. Yes, Miss Havisham. Good-bye, Pip. She stretched out her hand, and I went down on my knee, and put it to my lips. I had not considered how I should take leave of her. It came naturally to me at the moment to do this. She looked at Sarah Pocket with triumph in her weird eyes, and so I left my fairy godmother, with both her hands on her crutch-stick, standing in the midst of the dimly lighted room beside the rotten bride-cake that was hidden in cobwebs. Sarah Pocket conducted me down, as if I were a ghost who must be seen out. She could not get over my appearance, and was in the last degree confounded. I said, "'Good-bye, Miss Pocket,' but she merely stared, and did not seem collected enough to know that I had spoken. Clear of the house, I made the best of my way back to Pumblechook's, took off my new clothes, made them into a bundle, and went back home in my older dress, carrying it, to speak the truth, much more at my ease, too, though I had the bundle to carry. And now those six days which were to have run out so slowly had run out fast and were gone, and to-morrow looked me in the face more steadily than I could look at it. As the six evenings had dwindled away to five, to four, to three, to two, I had become more and more appreciative of the society of Joe and Biddy. 
On this last evening, I dressed myself out in my new clothes for their delight, and sat in my splendour until bedtime. We had a hot supper on the occasion, graced by the inevitable roast fowl, and we had some flip to finish with. We were all very low, and none the higher for pretending to be in spirits. I was to leave our village at five in the morning, carrying my little hand portmanteau, and I had told Joe that I wished to walk away all alone. I am afraid, sore afraid, that this purpose originated in my sense of the contrast there would be between me and Joe if we went to the coach together. I had pretended with myself that there was nothing of this taint in the arrangement, but when I went up to my little room on this last night, I felt compelled to admit that it might be so, and had an impulse upon me to go down again and entreat Joe to walk with me in the morning. I did not. All night there were coaches in my broken sleep, going to wrong places instead of to London, and having in the traces now dogs, now cats, now pigs, now men, never horses. Fantastic failures of journeys occupied me until the day dawned and the birds were singing. Then I got up and partly dressed, and sat at the window to take a last look out, and in taking it fell asleep. Biddy was astir so early to get my breakfast that, although I did not sleep at the window an hour, I smelt the smoke of the kitchen fire when I started up, with a terrible idea that it must be late in the afternoon. But long after that, and long after I had heard the clinking of the teacups and was quite ready, I wanted the resolution to go downstairs. After all, I remained up there, repeatedly unlocking and unstrapping my small portmanteau, and locking and strapping it up again, until Biddy called to me that I was late. It was a hurried breakfast with no taste in it. I got up from the meal, saying with a sort of briskness, as if it had only just occurred to me, "'Well, I suppose I must be off.' And then I kissed my sister, who was laughing and nodding and shaking in her usual chair, and kissed Biddy, and threw my arms around Joe's neck. Then I took up my little portmanteau and walked out. The last I saw of them was, when I presently heard a scuffle behind me, and looking back, saw Joe throwing an old shoe after me, and Biddy throwing another old shoe. I stopped, to wave my hat, and dear old Joe waved his strong right arm above his head, crying huskily, Hurrah! and Biddy put her apron to her face. I walked away at a good pace, thinking it was easier to go than I had supposed it would be, and reflecting that it would never have done to have had an old shoe thrown after the coach, in sight of all the high street. I whistled and made nothing of going, but the village was very peaceful and quiet, and the light mists were solemnly rising, as if to show me the world, and I had been so innocent and little there, and all beyond was so unknown and great, that in a moment with a strong heave and sob I broke into tears. It was by the finger-post at the end of the village, and I laid my hand upon it and said, "'Good-bye, oh, my dear, dear friend!' Heaven knows we need never be ashamed of our tears, for they are rain upon the blinding dust of earth, overlying our hard hearts. I was better after I had cried than before, more sorry, more aware of my own ingratitude, more gentle. If I had cried before, I should have had Joe with me then. So subdued I was by those tears, and by their breaking out again in the course of the quiet walk, that when I was on the coach, and it was clear of the town, I deliberated with an aching heart whether I would not get down when we changed horses, and walk back, and have another evening at home, and a better parting. We changed, and I had not made up my mind, and still reflected for my comfort that it would be quite practicable to get down and walk back, when we changed again. And while I was occupied with those deliberations, I would fancy an exact resemblance to Joe and some man coming along the road towards us, and my heart would beat high, as if he could possibly be there. We changed again, and yet again, 
and it was now too late and too far to go back, and I went on. And the mists had all solemnly risen now, and the world lay spread before me. This is the end of the first stage of Pip's Expectations. End of chapter Chapter Twenty of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter Twenty. The journey from our town to the metropolis was a journey of about five hours. It was a little past midday when the four-horse stagecoach by which I was a passenger got into the ravel of traffic frayed out about the Cross Keys, Wood Street, Cheapside, London. We Britons had at that time particularly settled that it was treasonable to doubt our having and our being the best of everything. Otherwise, while I was scared by the immensity of London, I think I might have had some faint doubts whether it were not ugly, crooked, narrow, and dirty. Mr. Jaggers had duly sent me his address. It was Little Britain, and he had written after it on his card, just out of Smithfield and close by the coach office. Nevertheless, a hackney coachman, who seemed to have as many capes to his greasy greatcoat as he was years old, packed me up in his coach and hemmed me in with a folding and jingling barrier of steps as if he were going to take me fifty miles. His getting on the, his box, which I remember to have been decorated with an old weather-stained pea-green hammer-cloth, moth-eaten into rags, was quite a work of time. It was a wonderful equipage, with six great coronets outside, and ragged things behind for I don't know how many footmen to hold on by, and a harrow below them to prevent amateur footmen from yielding to the temptation. I had scarcely had time to enjoy the coach, and to think how like a straw-yard it was, and yet how like a rag-shop, and to wonder why the horses' nose-bags were kept inside, when I observed the coachman beginning to get down, as if we were going to stop presently. And stop we presently did, in a gloomy street, at certain offices with an open door, whereon was painted Mr. Jaggers. "'How much?' I asked the coachman. The coachman answered, "'A shilling, unless you wish to make it more.' I naturally said I had no wish to make it more. "'Then it must be a shilling,' observed the coachman. "'I don't want to get into trouble. I know him.' He darkly closed an eye at Mr. Jagger's name and shook his head. When he had got his shilling, and had in course of time completed the ascent to his box, and had got away— which appeared to relieve his mind, I went into the front office with my little portmanteau in my hand, and asked, Was Mr. Jaggers at home? He is not, returned the clerk. He is in court at present. Am I addressing Mr. Pip? I signified that he was addressing Mr. Pip. Mr. Jaggers left word, Would you wait in his room? He couldn't say how long he might be, having a case on. "'but it stands to reason, his time being valuable, "'that he won't be longer than he can help.' "'With those words the clerk opened a door "'and ushered me into an inner chamber at the back. "'Here we found a gentleman with one eye, "'in a velveteen suit and knee-breeches, "'who wiped his nose with his sleeve "'on being interrupted in the perusal of the newspaper. "'Go and wait outside, Mike,' said the clerk. I began to say that I hoped I was not interrupting, when the clerk shoved this gentleman out with as little ceremony as I ever saw used, and tossing his fur cap out after him, left me alone. Mr. Jagger's room was lighted by a skylight only, and was a most dismal place. The skylight, eccentrically pitched like a broken head, and the distorted adjoining houses looking as if they had twisted themselves to peep down at me through it. There were not so many papers about— as I should have expected to see, and there were some odd objects about that I should not have expected to see, 
such as an old rusty pistol, a sword in a scabbard, several strange-looking boxes and packages, and two dreadful casts on a shelf of faces peculiarly swollen and twitchy about the nose. Mr. Jaggers's own high-backed chair was of a deadly black horsehair, with rows of brass nails round it like a coffin and I fancied I could see how he leaned back in it and bit his forefinger at his clients. The room was but small, and the clients seemed to have had a habit of backing up against the wall, the wall, especially opposite to Mr. Jaggers's chair, being greasy with shoulders. I recalled, too, that the one-eyed gentleman had shuffled forth against the wall when I was the innocent cause of his being turned out. I sat down in the clientel chair, placed over against Mr. Jaggers's chair, and became fascinated by the dismal atmosphere of the place. I called to mind that the clerk had the same air of knowing something to everybody else's disadvantage, as his master had. I wondered how many other clerks there were upstairs, and whether they all claimed to have the same detrimental mastery of their fellow-creatures. I wondered what was the history of all the odd litter about the room, and how it came there. I wondered whether the two swollen faces were of Mr. Jaggers's family, and, if he were so unfortunate as to have had a pair of such ill-looking relations, why he stuck them on that dusty perch for the blacks and flies to settle on, instead of giving them a place at home. Of course I had no experience of a London summer day, and my spirits may have been oppressed by the hot exhausted air, and by the dust and grit that lay thick on everything but I sat wondering and waiting in Mr. Jagger's close room, until I really could not bear the two casts on the shelf above Mr. Jagger's chair, and got up and went out. When I told the clerk that I would take a turn in the air while I waited, he advised me to go round the corner and I should come into Smithfield. So I came into Smithfield, and the shameful place, being all a smear with filth and fat and blood and foam, seemed to stick to me so I rubbed it off with all possible speed by turning into a street where I saw the great black dome of St. Paul's bulging at me from behind a grim stone building which a bystander said was Newgate Prison. Following the wall of the jail, I found the roadway covered with straw to deaden the noise of passing vehicles, and from this, and from the quantity of people standing about smelling strongly of spirits and beer, I inferred that the trials were on. While I looked about me here, an exceedingly dirty and partially drunk minister of justice asked me if I would like to step in and hear a trial or so, informing me that he could give me a front place for half a crown, whence I should command a full view of the Lord Chief Justice in his wig and robes, mentioning that awful personage like waxwork, and presently offering him at the reduced price of eighteen pence. As I declined the proposal on the plea of an appointment, he was so good as to take me into a yard and show me where the gallows was kept, and also where people were publicly whipped, and then he showed me the debtor's door, out of which culprits came to be hanged, heightening the interest of that dreadful portal, by giving me to understand that four on em would come out at that door the day after to-morrow, at eight in the morning, to be killed in a row. This was horrible, gave me a sickening idea of London, the more so as the Lord Chief Justice's proprietor wore, from his hat down to his boots and up again to his pocket-handkerchief inclusive, mildewed clothes, which had evidently not belonged to him originally, and which I took it into my head he had bought cheap of the executioner. Under these circumstances I thought myself well rid of him for a shilling. I dropped into the office to ask if Mr. Jaggers had come in yet, and I found he had not, and I strolled out again. This time I made the tour of Little Britain, and turned into Bartholomew Close, and now I became aware that other people were waiting about for Mr. Jaggers, as well as I. There were two men of secret appearance lounging in Bartholomew Close, and thoughtfully fitting their feet into the cracks of the pavement as they talked together, one of whom said to the other when they first passed me that Jaggers would do it if it was to be done. There was a knot of three men and two women standing at a corner, and one of the women was crying on her dirty shawl, and the other comforted her by saying, as she pulled her own shawl over her shoulders, "'Jaggers is for him, Melia, 
and what more could you have? There was a red-eyed little Jew who came into the clothes while I was loitering there, in company with a second little Jew whom he had sent upon an errand. And while the messenger was gone, I remarked this Jew, who was of a highly excitable temperament, performing a jig of anxiety under a lamp-post, and accompanying himself in a kind of frenzy with the words, Oh, Jaggerth, 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 all other than Kagmagerth, give me Jaggerth. These testimonies to the popularity of my guardian made a deep impression on me, and I admired and wondered more than ever. At length, as I was looking out at the iron gate of Bartholomew Close into Little Britain, I saw Mr. Jaggers coming across the road towards me. All the others who were waiting saw him at the same time, and there was quite a rush at him. Mr. Jaggers, putting a hand on my shoulder and walking me on at his side, without saying anything to me, addressed himself to his followers. First he took the two secret men. "'Now I have nothing to say to you,' said Mr. Jaggers, throwing his finger at them. "'I want to know no more than I know. As to the result, it's a toss-up. I told you from the first it was a toss-up. Have you paid Wemmick?' "'We made the money up this morning, sir,' said one of the men submissively, while the other perused Mr. Jagger's face. "'I don't ask you when you made it up, or where, or whether you made it up at all. Has Wemmick got it?' "'Yes, sir,' said both the men together. "'Very well, then you may go. No, I won't have it,' said Mr. Jaggers, waving his hand at them to put them behind him. If you say a word to me, I'll throw up the case. We thought, Mr. Jaggers, one of the men began pulling off his hat. That's what I told you not to do, said Mr. Jaggers. You thought. I think for you, that's enough for you. If I want you, I know where to find you. I don't want you to find me. Now I won't have it. I won't hear a word. The two men looked at one another as Mr. Jaggers waved them behind again and humbly fell back and were heard no more. "'And now you,' said Mr. Jaggers, suddenly stopping, and turning on the two women with the shawls, from whom the three men had meekly separated. "'Oh, Amelia, is it?' "'Yes, Mr. Jaggers.' "'And do you remember,' retorted Mr. Jaggers, "'that but for me you wouldn't be here and couldn't be here?' "'Oh, yes, sir,' exclaimed both women together, "'Lord bless you, sir. Well, we knows that.' "'Then why,' said Mr. Jaggers, "'do you come here?' "'My bill, sir,' the crying woman pleaded. "'Now I tell you what,' said Mr. Jaggers, "'once for all. If you don't know that your bill's in good hands, I know it. And if you come here bothering about your bill, I'll make an example of both your bill and you, and let him slip through my fingers.' "'Have you paid Wemmick?' "'Oh, yes, sir, every farthing.' "'Very well. Then you have done all you have got to do. Say another word, one single word, and Wemmick shall give you your money back.' This terrible threat caused the two women to fall off immediately. No one remained now but the excitable Jew, who had already raised the skirts of Mr. Jagger's coat to his lips several times. "'I don't know this man.' said Mr. Jaggers, in the same devastating strain. "'What does this fellow want?' "'My dear Mr. Jaggers, own brother to Abraham Lathareth?' "'Who's he?' said Mr. Jaggers. "'Let go of my coat.' The suitor, kissing the hem of the garment again before relinquishing it, replied, "'Abraham Lathareth, on Thithbithian a plate.' "'You're too late,' said Mr. Jaggers. "'I am over the way.' "'Holy Father, Mr. Daggerth!' cried my excitable acquaintance, turning white. "'Don't say you're again Abraham Lathareth!' "'I am,' said Mr. Jaggers, "'and there's an end of it. Get out of the way.' "'Mr. Jaggerth, half a moment. My home cousin's gone to Mr. Wemmick at this present minute, to offer him any terms. Mr. Jaggers, half a quarter of a moment.' if you'd have the condescension to be bought off from the other side. At any superior price, money no object, Mr. Jaggers, Mr. 
my guardian threw his supplicant off with supreme indifference and left him dancing on the pavement as if it were red-hot. Without further interruption we reached the front office, where we found the clerk and the man in velveteen with the fur cap. "'Here's Mike,' said the clerk, getting down from his stool and approaching Mr. Jaggers confidentially. "'Oh,' said Mr. Jaggers, turning to the man, who was pulling a lock of hair in the middle of his forehead, like the bull in Cock Robin pulling at the bell-rope, "'Your man comes on this afternoon. Well?' "'Well, Master Jaggers,' returned Mike, in the voice of a sufferer from a constitutional cold, "'arter a deal of trouble, I found one, sir, as might do.' "'What is he prepared to swear?' "'Well, Master Jaggers,' said Mike, wiping his nose on his fur cap this time, "'in a general way, anything.' Mr. Jaggers suddenly became most irate. "'Now I warned you before,' said he, throwing his forefinger at the terrified client, "'that if you ever presumed to talk in that way here, I'd make an example of you. "'You infernal scoundrel, how dare you tell me that?' The client looked scared, but bewildered, too, as if he were unconscious what he had done. "'Spoony,' said the clerk in a low voice, giving him a stir with his elbow. "'Soft head! Need you say it face to face?' "'Now I ask you, you blundering booby,' said my guardian very sternly, "'once more, and for the last time, what the man you have brought here is prepared to swear.' Mike looked hard at my guardian, as if he were trying to learn a lesson from his face, and slowly replied, "'Hather to character, or having been in his company, and never left him all the night in question. "'Now be careful.' "'In what station of life is this man?' Mike looked at his cap, and looked at the floor, and looked at the ceiling, and looked at the clerk, and even looked at me, before beginning to reply in a nervous manner, "'We've dressed him up like—' When my guardian blustered out, "'What? You will, will you?' "'Spoony!' added the clerk again, with another stir. After some helpless casting about, Mike brightened and began again, He's dressed like a spectable pieman, a sort of a pastry-cook. "'Is he here?' asked my guardian. "'I left him,' said Mike, "'a-settin' on some door-steps round the corner. "'Take him past that window, and let me see him.' The window indicated was the office window. We all three went to it, behind the wire blind, and presently saw the client go by in an accidental manner with a murderous-looking tall individual, in a short suit of white linen and a paper cap. This guileless confectioner was not by any means sober, and had a black eye and the green stage of recovery, which was painted over. "'Tell him to take his witness away directly,' said my guardian to the clerk, in extreme disgust, "'and ask him what he means by bringing such a fellow as that.' My guardian then took me into his own room, and while he lunched, standing from a sandwich-box and a pocket-flask of sherry, he seemed to bully his very sandwich as he ate it, informed me what arrangements he had made for me. I was to go to Barnard's Inn, to young Mr. Pocket's rooms, where a bed had been sent in for my accommodation. I was to remain with young Mr. Pocket until Monday. On Monday I was to go with him to his father's house on a visit that I might try how I liked it. Also I was told what my allowance was to be, it was a very liberal one, and had handed to me, from one of my guardian's drawers, the cards of certain tradesmen with whom I was to deal for all kinds of clothes, and such other things as I could in reason want. "'You will find your credit good, Mr. Pip,' said my guardian, whose flask of sherry smelt like a whole caskful, as he hastily refreshed himself but I shall by this means be able to check your bills, and to pull you up if I find you outrunning the constable. Of course you'll go wrong somehow, but that's no fault of mine. After I had pondered a little over this encouraging sentiment, I asked Mr. Jaggers if I could send for a coach. He said it was not worth while, I was so near my destination, Wemmick should walk round with me, if I pleased. 
I then found that Wemmick was the clerk in the next room. Another clerk was rung down from upstairs to take his place while he was out, and I accompanied him into the street after shaking hands with my guardian. We found a new set of people lingering outside, but Wemmick made a way among them by saying coolly yet decisively, "'I tell you it's no use. He won't have a word to say to one of you.' And we soon got clear of them, and went on side by side. End of chapter Chapter Twenty One of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter Twenty One. Casting my eyes on Mr. Wemmick as we went along, to see what he was like in the light of day, I found him to be a dry man, rather short in stature, with a square wooden face, whose expression seemed to have been imperfectly chipped out with a dull-edged chisel. There were some marks in it that might have been dimples, if the material had been softer and the instrument finer, but which, as it was, were only dints. The chisel had made three or four of these attempts at embellishment over his nose, but had given them up without an effort to smooth them off. I judged him to be a bachelor from the frayed condition of his linen, and he appeared to have sustained a good many bereavements, for he wore at least four mourning rings, besides a brooch representing a lady and a weeping willow at a tomb with an urn on it. I noticed, too, that several rings and seals hung at his watch-chain, as if he were quite laden with remembrances of departed friends. He had glittering eyes, small, keen, and black, and thin, wide, mottled lips. He had had them, to the best of my belief, from forty to fifty years. "'So you were never in London before?' said Mr. Wemmick to me. "'No,' said I. "'I was new here once,' said Mr. Wemmick. "'Rum to think of now.' "'You are well acquainted with it now?' "'Why, yes,' said Mr. Wemmick. "'I know the moves of it.' "'Is it a very wicked place?' I asked, more for the sake of saying something than for information. "'You may get cheated, robbed, and murdered in London, but there are plenty of people anywhere who'll do that for you.' "'If there is bad blood between you and them,' said I, to soften it off a little. "'Oh, I don't know about bad blood,' returned Mr. Wemmick. "'There's not much bad blood about. They'll do it if there's anything to be got by it.' "'That makes it worse.' And "'You think so?' returned Mr. Wemmick. "'Much about the same, I should say.' He wore his hat on the back of his head, and looked straight before him, walking in a self-contained way as if there were nothing in the streets to claim his attention. His mouth was such a post-office of a mouth that he had a mechanical appearance of smiling. We had got to the top of Holborn Hill before I knew that it was merely a mechanical appearance, and that he was not smiling at all. "'Do you know where Mr. Matthew Pocket lives?' I asked Mr. Wemmick. "'Yes,' said he, nodding in the direction, "'at Hammersmith, west of London.' "'Is that far?' "'Well, uh, say five miles.' "'Do you know him?' "'Why, you're a regular cross-examiner,' said Mr. Wemmick, looking at me with an approving air. "'Yes, I know him. I know him.' There was an air of toleration or depreciation about his utterance of these words that rather depressed me, and I was still looking sideways at his block of a face in search of any encouraging note to the text, when he said, Here we were, at Barnard's Inn. My depression was not alleviated by the announcement, for I had supposed that establishment to be a hotel kept by Mr. Barnard, to which the Blue Boar in our own town was a mere public-house whereas I had now found Barnard to be a disembodied spirit, or a fiction, 
and is in the dingiest collection of shabby buildings ever squeezed together in a rank corner as a club for tomcats. We entered this haven through a wicket gate, and was disgorged by an introductory passage into a melancholy little square that looked to me like a flat burying ground. I thought it had the most dismal trees in it, and the most dismal sparrows, and the most dismal cats, and the most dismal houses, in number half a dozen or so, that I had ever seen. I thought the windows of the sets of chambers into which those houses were divided were in every stage of dilapidated blind and curtain, crippled flower-pot, cracked glass, dusty decay, and miserable makeshift, while to let, to let, to let, glared at me from empty rooms, as if no new wretches ever came there, and the vengeance of the soul of Barnard were being slowly appeased by the gradual suicide of the present occupants, and their unholy interment under the gravel. A frowsy morning of soot and smoke attired this forlorn creation of Barnard, and it had strewn ashes on its head, and was undergoing penance and humiliation as a mere dust-hole. Thus far my sense of sight, while dry rot and wet rot, and all the silent rots that rot in neglected roof and cellar, rot of rat and mouse and bug, and coaching stables near at hand besides, addressed themselves faintly to my sense of smell, and bemoaned, "'Try Barnard's mixture.' So imperfect was this realization of the first of my great expectations, that I looked in dismay at Mr. Wemmick. "'Ah,' said he, mistaking me, "'the retirement reminds you of the country. <laughs> so it does me.' He led me into a corner and conducted me up a flight of stairs, which appeared to me to be slowly collapsing into sawdust, so that one of those days the upper lodgers would look out of their doors and find themselves without the means of coming down, to a set of chambers on the top floor. Mr. Pocket, Jr., was painted on the door, and there was a label on the letter-box, Return Shortly. "'He hardly thought you'd come so soon,' Mr. Wemmick explained. "'You don't want me any more.' "'No, thank you,' said I. "'As I keep the cash,' Mr. Wemmick observed, "'we shall most likely meet pretty often. Good day.' "'Good day.' I put out my hand, and Mr. Wemmick at first looked at it as if he thought I wanted something. Then he looked at me and said, correcting himself, eh, "'To be sure, yes, you're in the habit of shaking hands.' I was rather confused, thinking it must be out of the London fashion, but said yes. "'I have so got out of it,' said Mr. Wemmick, "'except at last. Very glad, I'm sure, to make your acquaintance. Good day.' When we had shaken hands and he was gone, I opened the staircase window and had nearly beheaded myself, for the lines had rotted away and it came down like the guillotine. Happily it was so quick that I had not put my head out. After this escape I was content to take a foggy view of the inn through the windows encrusting dirt, and to stand dolefully looking out, saying to myself that London was decidedly overrated. Mr. Pocket Jr.'s idea of shortly was not mine, for I had nearly maddened myself with looking out for half an hour and had written my name with my finger several times in the dirt of every pane in the window, before I heard footsteps on the stairs. Gradually there arose before me the hat, head, neckcloth, waistcoat, trousers, boots, of a member of society of about my own standing. He had a paper bag under each arm and a pottle of strawberries in one hand, and was out of breath. "'Mr. Pip,' said he, "'Mr. Pocket?' said I. "'Dear me!' he exclaimed. "'I am extremely sorry, but I knew there was a coach from your part of the country at midday, and I thought you would come by that one. The fact is, I have been out on your account, not that that is any excuse, for I thought, coming from the country, you might like a little fruit after dinner, and I went to Covent Garden Market to get it good. For a reason that I had, 
I felt as if my eyes would start out of my head. I acknowledged his attention incoherently, and began to think this was a dream. "'Dear me,' said Mr. Pocket, Jr., "'this door sticks so.' As he was fast making jam of his fruit by wrestling with the door while the paper bags were under his arms, I begged him to allow me to hold them. He relinquished them with an agreeable smile, and combated with the door as if it were a wild beast. It yielded so suddenly at last that he staggered back upon me, and I staggered back upon the opposite door, and we both laughed. But still I felt as if my eyes must start out of my head, and as if this must be a dream. "'Pray come in,' said Mr. Pocket, Jr. "'Allow me to lead the way. I'm rather bare here, but I hope you'll be able to make out tolerably well till Monday. My father thought you would get on more agreeably through to-morrow with me than with him, and might like to take a walk about London. I am sure I shall be very happy to show London to you. As to our table, you won't find that bad, I hope, for it will be supplied from our coffee-house here, and— it is only right, I should add, at your expense, such being Mr. Jagger's directions. As to our lodging, it's not by any means splendid, because I have my own bread to earn, and my father hasn't anything to give me, and I shouldn't be willing to take it if he had. This is our sitting-room. Just such chairs and tables and carpet and so forth, you see, as they could spare from home. You mustn't give me credit for the tablecloth and spoons and casters, because they come for you from the coffee-house. This is my little bedroom. Rather musty, but Barnard's is musty. This is your bedroom. The furniture's hired for the occasion, but I trust it will answer the purpose. If you should want anything, I'll go and fetch it. The chambers are retired, and we shall be alone together, but we shan't fight, I dare say. "'But, dear me, I beg your pardon. You're holding the fruit all this time. Pray let me take those bags from you. I am quite ashamed.' As I stood opposite to Mr. Pocket, Jr., delivering him the bags, one, two, I saw the starting appearance come into his own eyes that I knew to be in mine, and he said, falling back, "'Lord, bless me! You're the prowling boy!' "'And you,' said I, are the pale young gentlemen. End of chapter. Chapter 22 of Great Expectations This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens Chapter 22 The pale young gentleman and I stood contemplating one another in Barnard's Inn until we both burst out laughing. "'The idea of its being you!' said he. "'The idea of its being you!' said I. And then we contemplated one another afresh— and laughed again. "'Well,' said the pale young gentleman, reaching out his hand good-humouredly, "'it's all over now, I hope, and it will be magnanimous in you if you'll forgive me for having knocked you about so.' I derived from this speech that Mr. Herbert Pocket, for Herbert was the pale young gentleman's name, still rather confounded his intention with his execution. But I made a modest reply, and we shook hands warmly. "'You hadn't come into your good fortune at that time?' said Herbert Pocket. "'No,' said I. "'No,' he acquiesced. "'I heard it had happened very lately. "'I was rather on the lookout for good fortune then.' "'Indeed?' "'Yes. "'Miss Havisham had sent for me to see if she could take a fancy to me. "'But she couldn't. "'At all events, she didn't.' I thought it polite to remark that I was surprised to hear that. <laughs> "'Bad taste,' said Herbert, laughing. "'But a fact. Yes, she had sent for me on a trial visit, and if I had come out of it successfully, I suppose I should have been provided for. Perhaps I should have been what you may call it to Estella.' 
"'What's that?' I asked with sudden gravity. He was arranging his fruit in plates while we talked, which divided his attention, and was the cause of his having made this lapse of a word. Affianced, he explained, still busy with the fruit. Betrothed, engaged, what's his named, any word of that sort. How did you bear your disappointment? I asked. Pooh, said he. I didn't care much for it. She's a tartar. Miss Havisham? I don't say no to that, but I meant Estella. That girl's hard and haughty and capricious to the last degree, and has been brought up by Miss Havisham to wreak revenge on all the male sex. What relation is she to Miss Havisham? None, said he, only adopted. Why should she wreak revenge on all the male sex? What revenge? <laughs> Lord, Mr. Pip, said he, don't you know? No? said I. Dear me, it's quite a story, and shall be saved till dinner-time, and now let me take the liberty of asking you a question. How did you come there that day? I told him, and he was attentive till I had finished, and then burst out laughing again, and asked me if I was sore afterwards. I didn't ask him if he was, for my conviction on that point was perfectly established. "'Mr. Jaggers is your guardian, I understand?' he went on. "'Yes. "'You know he is Miss Havisham's man of business and solicitor, "'and has her confidence when nobody else has.' "'This was bringing me, I felt, towards dangerous ground. "'I answered with a constraint I made no attempt to disguise, "'that I had seen Mr. Jaggers in Miss Havisham's house "'on the very day of our combat, but never at any other time.' and that I believed he had no recollection of having ever seen me there. He was so obliging as to suggest my father for your tutor, and he called on my father to propose it. Of course he knew about my father from his connection with Miss Havisham. My father is Miss Havisham's cousin, not that that implies familiar intercourse between them, for he is a bad courtier and will not propitiate her. Herbert Pocket had a frank and easy way with him that was very taking. I had never seen any one then, and I have never seen any one since, who more strongly expressed to me, in every look and tone, a natural incapacity to do anything secret and mean. There was something wonderfully hopeful about his general air, and something that at the same time whispered to me he would never be very successful or rich. I don't know how this was. I became imbued with the notion on that first occasion before we sat down to dinner, but I cannot define by what means. He was still a pale young gentleman, and had a certain conquered languor about him in the midst of his spirits and briskness that did not seem indicative of natural strength. He had not a handsome face, but it was better than handsome, being extremely amiable and cheerful. His figure was a little ungainly, as in the days when my knuckles had taken such liberties with it, but it looked as if it would always be light and young. Whether Mr. Trabb's local work would have sat more gracefully on him than on me may be a question, but I am conscious that he carried off his rather old clothes much better than I carried off my new suit. As he was so communicative, I felt that reserve on my part would be a bad return unsuited to our years. I therefore told him my small story, and laid stress on my being forbidden to inquire who my benefactor was. I further mentioned that as I had been brought up a blacksmith in a country place, and knew very little of the ways of politeness, I would take it as a great kindness in him if he would give me a hint whenever he saw me at a loss or going wrong. "'With pleasure,' said he, "'though I venture to prophesy that you'll want very few hints. I dare say we shall be often together, and I should like to banish any needless restraint between us. Will you do me the favour to begin at once to call me by my Christian name, Herbert?' I thanked him, and said I would. I informed him in exchange that my Christian name was Philip. "'I don't take to Philip.' said he, smiling, for it sounds like a moral boy out of the spelling-book, 
who was so lazy that he fell into a pond, or so fat that he couldn't see out of his eyes, or so avaricious that he locked up his cake till the mice ate it, or so determined to go a bird's nesting that he got himself eaten by bears who lived handy in the neighbourhood. I tell you what I should like. We are so harmonious, and you have been a blacksmith. Would you mind it? I shouldn't mind anything that you propose, I answered, but I don't understand you. Would you mind Handel for a familiar name? There's a charming piece of music by Handel, called The Harmonious Blacksmith. I should like it very much. Then, my dear Handel, said he, turning round as the door opened, here is the dinner, and I must beg of you to take the top of the table, because the dinner is of your providing. This I would not hear of, so he took the top, and I faced him. It was a nice little dinner, seemed to me then a very Lord Mayor's feast and it acquired additional relish from being eaten under those independent circumstances, with no old people by, and with London to all around us. This again was heightened by a certain gypsy character that set the banquet off, for while the table was, as Mr. Pumblechook might have said, the lap of luxury, being entirely furnished forth from the coffee-house, the circumjacent region of sitting-room was of a comparatively pastureless and shifty character imposing on the waiter the wandering habits of putting the covers on the floor, where he fell over them, the melted butter in the armchair, the bread on the bookshelves, the cheese in the coal scuttle, and the boiled fowl into my bed in the next room, where I found much of its parsley and butter in a state of congelation when I retired for the night. All this made the feast delightful, and when the waiter was not there to watch me, my pleasure was without alloy. We had made some progress in the dinner when I reminded Herbert of his promise to tell me about Miss Havisham. True, he replied. I'll redeem it at once. Let me introduce the topic, Handel, by mentioning that in London it is not the custom to put the knife in the mouth, for fear of accidents, and that while the fork is reserved for that use, it is not put further in than necessary. It is scarcely worth mentioning, only it's as well to do as other people do. Also, the spoon is not generally used overhand, but under. This is two advantages. You get at your mouth better, which, after all, is the object, and you save a good deal of the attitude of opening oysters on the part of the right elbow. He offered these friendly suggestions in such a lively way that we both laughed, and I scarcely blushed. Now, he pursued, conserving Miss Havisham, Miss Havisham, you must know, was a spoilt child. Her mother died when she was a baby, and her father denied her nothing. Her father was a country gentleman down in your part of the world, and was a brewer. I don't know why it should be a crack thing to be a brewer, but it is indisputable that while you cannot possibly be genteel and bake, you may be as genteel as never was, and brew, you see it every day. "'Yet a gentleman may not keep a public-house, may he?' said I. "'Not on any account,' returned Herbert. "'But a public-house may keep a gentleman. "'Well, Mr. Havisham was very rich and very proud. "'So was his daughter.' "'Miss Havisham was an only child?' I hazarded. "'Stop a moment. I'm coming to that. "'No, she was not an only child. She had a half-brother.' Her father privately married again. His cook, I rather think. I thought he was proud, said I. My good Handel, so he was. He married his second wife privately, because he was proud, and in course of time she died. When she was dead, I apprehend he first told his daughter what he had done, and then the son became a part of the family, residing in the house you are acquainted with. As the son grew a young man, he turned out riotous, extravagant, undutiful, altogether bad. At last his father disinherited him, but he softened when he was dying, and left him well off, though not nearly so well off as Miss Havisham. Take another glass of wine, and excuse my mentioning that society as a body does not expect one to be so strictly conscientious in emptying one's glass, 
as to turn it bottom upwards with the rim on one's nose. I had been doing this, in an excess of attention to his recital. I thanked him, and apologized. He said, Not at all, and resumed. Miss Havisham was now an heiress, and you may suppose was looked after as a great match. Her half-brother had now ample means again, but what with debts and what with new madness wasted them most fearfully again. There were stronger differences between him and her than there had been betwixt him and his father, and it is suspected that he cherished a deep and mortal grudge against her as having influenced the father's anger. Now I come to the cruel part of the story, merely breaking off my dear handle to remark that a dinner napkin will not go into a tumbler. Why I was trying to pack mine into my tumbler I am wholly unable to say. I only know that I found myself, with a perseverance worthy of a much better cause, making the most strenuous exertions to compress it within those limits. Again I thanked him and apologized, and again he said in the cheerfullest manner, "'Not at all, I am sure,' and resumed. There appeared upon the scene, say at the races, or the public balls, or anywhere else you like, a certain man who made love to Miss Havisham. I never saw him, for this happened five and twenty years ago, before you and I were, Handel, but I have heard my father mention that he was a showy man, and the kind of man for the purpose. But that he was not to be, without ignorance or prejudice, mistaken for a gentleman, my father most strongly asservates, because it is a principle of his that no man who was not a true gentleman at heart ever was, since the world began, a true gentleman in manner. He says, no varnish can hide the grain of the wood, and that the more varnish you put on, the more the grain will express itself. Well, this man pursued Miss Havisham closely, and professed to be devoted to her. I believe she had not much shown susceptibility up to that time, but all the susceptibility she possessed certainly came out then, had she passionately loved him. There is no doubt that she perfectly idolized him, he practised on her affection in that systematic way, that he got great sums of money from her, and he induced her to buy her brother out of a share in the brewery, which had been weakly left him by his father, at an immense price, on the plea that when he was her husband he must hold and manage it all. Your guardian was not at that time in Miss Havisham's counsels, and she was too haughty and too much in love to be advised by any one. Her relations were poor and scheming, with the exception of my father. He was poor enough, but not time-serving or jealous. The only independent one among them, he warned her that she was doing too much for this man, and was placing herself too unreservedly in his power. She took the first opportunity of angrily ordering my father out of the house, in his presence, and my father has never seen her since." I thought of her having said, Matthew will come and see me at last when I am laid dead upon that table, and I asked Herbert whether his father was so inveterate against her. It's not that, said he, but she charged him, in the presence of her intended husband, with being disappointed in the hope of fawning upon her for his own advancement, and, if he were to go to her now, it would look true, even to him and even to her. To return to the man, and make an end of him. The marriage day was fixed, the wedding dresses were bought, the wedding tour was planned out, the wedding guests were invited. The day came, but not the bridegroom. He wrote her a letter. Which she received, I struck in, when she was dressing for her marriage, at twenty minutes to nine? At the hour and minute said Herbert, nodding, at which she afterwards stopped all the clocks. What was in it, further than that, it most heartlessly broke the marriage off. I can't tell you, because I don't know. When she recovered from a bad illness that she had, she laid the whole place waste, as you have seen it, and she has never since looked upon the light of day. "'Is that all the story?' I asked, after considering it. 
all I know of it, and indeed I only know so much, through piecing it out for myself, for my father always avoids it, and, even when Miss Havisham invited me to go there, told me no more of it than was absolutely requisite I should understand. But I have forgotten one thing. It has been supposed that the man to whom she gave her misplaced confidence acted throughout in concert with her half-brother, that it was a conspiracy between them, and that they shared the profits. "'I wonder he didn't marry her and get all the property,' said I. "'He may have been married already, and her cruel mortification may have been a part of her half-brother's scheme,' said Herbert. "'Mind, I don't know that.' "'What became of the two men?' I asked, after again considering the subject. "'They fell into deeper shame and degradation, if there can be deeper, and ruin.' "'Are they alive now?' "'I don't know.' "'You said just now that Estella was not related to Miss Havisham, but adopted. When adopted?' Herbert shrugged his shoulders. "'There has always been an Estella since I have heard of a Miss Havisham. I know no more. And now, Handel,' said he, finally throwing off the story as it were, "'there is a perfectly open understanding between us. All that I know about Miss Havisham, you know.' "'And all that I know,' I retorted, "'you know.' "'I fully believe it. So there can be no competition or perplexity between you and me. And as to the condition in which you hold your advancement in life, namely, that you are not to inquire or discuss to whom you owe it, you may be very sure that it will never be encroached upon, or even approached, by me, or by any one belonging to me. In truth, he said this with so much delicacy, that I felt the subject done with, even though I should be under his father's roof for years and years to come. Yet he said it with so much meaning, too, that I felt he as perfectly understood Miss Havisham to be my benefactress, as I understood the fact myself. It had not occurred to me before that he had led up to the theme for the purpose of clearing it out of our way, but we were so much the lighter and easier for having broached it, that I now perceived this to be the case. We were very gay and sociable, and I asked him, in the course of conversation, what he was. He replied, A capitalist, an insurer of ships. I suppose he saw me glancing about the room in search of some tokens of shipping or capital, for he added, in the city. I had grand ideas of the wealth and importance of insurers of ships in the city, and I began to think with awe of having laid a young insurer on his back, blackened his enterprising eye, and cut his responsible head open. But again there came upon me, for my relief, that odd impression that Herbert Pocket would never be very successful or rich. I shall not rest satisfied with merely employing my capital in insuring ships. I shall buy up some good life assurance shares and cut into the direction. I shall also do a little in the mining way. None of these things will interfere with my chartering a few thousand tons on my own account. I think I shall trade, said he, leaning back in his chair, to the East Indies, for silks, shawls, spices, dyes, drugs, and precious woods. It's an interesting trade. And the profits are large? said I. Tremendous! said he. I wavered again, and began to think, here were greater expectations than my own. I think I shall trade also, said he, putting his thumbs in his waistcoat pockets, to the West Indies, for sugar, tobacco, and rum. Also to Ceylon, especially for elephant's tusks. You will want a good many ships, said I. A perfect fleet, said he. Quite overpowered by the magnificence of these transactions, I asked him where the ships he insured mostly traded to at present. "'I haven't begun insuring yet,' he replied. "'I am looking about me.' Somehow that pursuit seemed more in keeping with Barnard's Inn. I said, in a tone of conviction, "'Ah!' 
Yes, I am in a counting-house and looking about me. Is a counting-house profitable? I asked. To, do you mean to the young fellow who's in it? He asked in reply. Yes, to you. Why, no, not to me. He said this with the air of one carefully reckoning up and striking a balance. Not directly profitable. That is, it doesn't pay me anything, and I have to keep myself. This certainly had not been a profitable appearance, and I shook my head as if I would imply that it would be difficult to lay by much accumulative capital from such a source of income. "'But the thing is,' said Herbert Pocket, "'that you look about you. That's the grand thing. You are in a counting-house, you know, and you look about you.' It struck me as a singular implication that you couldn't be out of a counting-house, you know, and look about you, but I silently deferred to his experience. "'Then the time comes,' said Herbert, "'when you see your opening, and you go in, and you swoop upon it, and you make your capital, and then there you are. When you have once made your capital, you have nothing to do but employ it.' This was very like his way of conducting that encounter in the garden, very like. His manner of bearing his poverty, too, exactly corresponded to his manner of bearing that defeat. It seemed to me that he took all blows and buffets now with just the same air as he had taken mine then. It was evident that he had nothing around him but the simplest necessaries, for everything that I remarked upon turned out to have been sent in on my account from the coffee-house or somewhere else. Yet, Having already made his fortune in his own mind, he was so unassuming with it that I felt quite grateful to him for not being puffed up. It was a pleasant addition to his naturally pleasant ways, and we got on famously. In the evening we went out for a walk in the streets, and went half-price to the theatre, and next day we went to church at Westminster Abbey, and in the afternoon we walked in the parks, and I wondered who shod all the horses there, and wish Joe did. On a moderate computation, it was many months, that Sunday, since I had left Joe and Biddy. The space interposed between myself and them partook of that expansion, and our marshes were any distance off. That I could have been at our old church in my old church-going clothes, on the very last Sunday that ever was, seemed a combination of impossibilities, geographical and social, solar and lunar. Yet in the London streets so crowded with people, and so brilliantly lighted in the dusk of evening, there were depressing hints of reproaches for that I had put the poor old kitchen at home so far away, and in the dead of night the footsteps of some incapable impostor of a porter mooring about Barnard's Inn, under pretense of watching it, fell hollow on my heart. On the Monday morning at a quarter before nine, Herbert went to the counting-house to report himself, to look about him too, I suppose, and I bore him company. He was to come away in an hour or two to attend me to Hammersmith, and I was to wait about for him. It appeared to me that the eggs from which young insurers were hatched were incubated in dust and heat, like the eggs of ostriches, judging from the places to which those incipient giants repaired on a Monday morning. Nor did the counting-house where Herbert assisted show in my eyes as at all a good observatory, being a back second floor up a yard, of a grimy presence in all particulars, and with a look into another back second floor, rather than a look-out. I waited about until it was noon, and I went upon change, and I saw fluey men sitting there under the bills about shipping, whom I took to be great merchants, though I couldn't understand why they should be all out of spirits. When Herbert came, we went and had lunch at a celebrated house which I then quite venerated, but now believed to have been the most abject superstition in Europe, and where I could not help noticing, even then, that there was much more gravy on the tablecloths and knives and waiters' clothes than in the steaks. This collation disposed of at a moderate price— considering the grease which was not charged for, we went back to Barnard's Inn and got my little portmanteau, and then took coach for Hammersmith. 
We arrived there at two or three o'clock in the afternoon, and had very little way to walk to Mr. Pocket's house. Lifting the latch of a gate, we passed directly into a little garden overlooking the river, where Mr. Pocket's children were playing about. And unless I deceive myself on a point where my interests or prepossessions are certainly not concerned, I saw that Mr. and Mrs. Pocket's children were not growing up or being brought up, but were tumbling up. Mrs. Pocket was sitting on a garden chair under a tree, reading, with her legs upon another garden chair, and Mrs. Pocket's two nursemaids were looking about them while the children played. Mama, said Herbert, this is young Mr. Pip, upon which Mrs. Pocket received me with an appearance of amiable dignity. "'Master Alec and Miss Jane,' cried one of the nurses to two of the children, "'if you go a-bouncing up against them bushes, you'll fall over into the river, and be drowned. and what'll your pa say then?' At the same time this nurse picked up Mrs. Pocket's handkerchief, and said, "'If that don't make six times you've dropped it, Mum,' upon which Mrs. Pocket laughed and said, "'Thank you, Flopson,' and settling herself in one chair only, resumed her book. Her countenance immediately assumed a knitted and intent expression, as if she had been reading for a week, but before she could have read half a dozen lines, she fixed her eyes upon me, and said, "'I hope your mamma is quite well.' This unexpected inquiry put me into such a difficulty that I began saying in the absurdest way that if there had been any such person, I had no doubt she would have been quite well, and would have been very much obliged, and would have sent her compliments, when the nurse came to my rescue. "'Well,' she cried, picking up the pocket-handkerchief, "'if that don't make seven times! What are you a-doin' of this afternoon, Mum?' Mrs. Pocket received her property, at first with a look of unutterable surprise, as if she had never seen it before, and then with a laugh of recognition, and said, "'Thank you, Flopson,' and forgot me, and went on reading. I found, now I had leisure to count them, that there were no fewer than six little pockets present, in various stages of tumbling up. I had scarcely arrived at the total when a seventh was heard, as in the region of air, wailing dolefully. "'If there ain't baby,' said Flopson, appearing to think it most surprising, "'make haste up, Millers!' Millers, who was the other nurse, retired into the house, and by degrees the child's wailing was hushed and stopped, as if it were a young ventriloquist with something in its mouth. Mrs. Pocket read all the time, and I was curious to know what the book could be. We were waiting, I suppose, for Mr. Pocket to come out to us. At any rate, we waited there, and so I had an opportunity of observing the remarkable family phenomenon that whenever any of the children strayed near Mrs. Pocket in their play, they always tripped themselves up and tumbled over her, always very much to her momentary astonishment and their own more enduring lamentation. I was at a loss to account for this surprising circumstance, and could not help giving my mind to speculations about it, until by and by Millers came down with the baby, which baby was handed to Flopson, which Flopson was handing it to Mrs. Pocket, when she too went fairly head foremost over Mrs. Pocket, baby and all, and was caught by Herbert and myself. "'Gracious me, Flopson,' said Mrs. Pocket, looking off her book for a moment, "'everybody's tumbling.' "'Gracious you indeed, Mum,' returned Flopson, very red in the face. "'What have you got there?' "'I got here, Flopson?' asked Mrs. Pocket. "'Why, if it ain't your footstool!' cried Flopson. "'And if you keep it under your skirts like that, who's to help tumbling? "'Here, take the baby, Mum, and give me your book.' Mrs. Pocket acted on the advice, and inexpertly danced the infant a little in her lap, while the other children played about it. This had lasted but a very short time, when Mrs. Pocket issued summary orders that they were all to be taken into the house for a nap. Thus I made the second discovery on that first occasion, that the nurture of the little pockets consisted of alternately tumbling up and lying down. 
Under these circumstances, when Flopson and Millers had got the children into the house, like a little flock of sheep, and Mr. Pocket came out of it to make my acquaintance, I was not much surprised to find that Mr. Pocket was a gentleman with a rather perplexed expression of face, and with his very grey hair disordered on his head, as if he didn't quite see his way to putting anything straight. End of chapter Chapter Twenty Three of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter Twenty Three. Mr. Pocket said he was glad to see me, and he hoped I was not sorry to see him. For I really am not, he added with his son's smile, an alarming personage. He was a young-looking man, in spite of his perplexities and his very grey hair, and his manner seemed quite natural. I use the word natural in the sense of its being unaffected. There was something comic in his distraught way, as though it would have been downright ludicrous, but for his own perception, that it was very near being so. When he had talked with me a little, he said to Mrs. Pocket, with a rather anxious contraction of his eyebrows, which were black and handsome, "'Belinda, I hope you have welcomed Mr. Pip.' And she looked up from her book and said, "'Yes.' She then smiled upon me in an absent state of mind, and asked me if I would liked the taste of orange-flower water. As the question had no bearing, near or remote, on any foregone or subsequent transaction, I consider it to have been thrown out, like her previous approaches, in general conversational condescension. I found out within a few hours, and may mention at once, that Mrs. Pocket was the only daughter of a certain quite accidental deceased knight, who had invented for himself a conviction that his deceased father would have made a baronet, but for somebody's determined apposition, arising out of entirely personal motives. I forget whose, if I ever knew. The sovereigns, the prime ministers, the lord chancellors, the archbishop of Canterbury's, anybody's. And had tacked himself on to the nobles of the earth in right of this quite superstitious fact. I believe he had been knighted himself for storming the English grammar at the point of the pen, in a desperate address engrossed on vellum, on the occasion of the laying of the first stone of some building or other, and for handing some royal personage either the trowel or the mortar. Be that as it may, he had directed Mrs. Pocket to be brought up from her cradle as one who in the nature of things must marry a title and who was to be guarded from the acquisition of plebeian domestic knowledge. So successful a watch and ward had been established over the young lady by this judicious parent, that she had grown up highly ornamental, but perfectly helpless and useless. With her character thus happily formed, in the first bloom of her youth she had encountered Mr. Pocket, who was also in the first bloom of youth, and not quite decided whether to mount to the wool-sack, or to roof himself in with a mitre. As his doing the one or the other was a mere question of time, he and Mrs. Pocket had taken time by the forelock, when, to judge from its length, it would seem to have wanted cutting, and had married without the knowledge of the judicious parent. The judicious parent, having nothing to bestow or withhold but his blessing, had handsomely settled that dower upon them after a short struggle, and had informed Mr. Pocket that his wife was a treasure for a prince. Mr. Pocket had invested the prince's treasure in the ways of the world ever since, and it was supposed to have brought him in but indifferent interest. Still, Mrs. Pocket was in general the object of a queer sort of respectful pity, because she had not married a title, while Mr. Pocket was the object of a queer sort of forgiving reproach, because he had never got one. Mr. Pocket took me into the house, and showed me my room, which was a pleasant one, and so furnished 
as that I could use it with comfort for my own private sitting-room. He then knocked at the doors of two other similar rooms, and introduced me to their occupants, by name Drummel and Startop. Drummel, an odd-looking young man of a heavy order of architecture, was whistling. Startop, younger in years and appearance, was reading and holding his head, as if he thought himself in danger of exploding it with too strong a charge of knowledge. Both Mr. and Mrs. Pocket had such a noticeable air of being in somebody else's hands, that I wondered who really was in possession of the house and let them live there, until I found this unknown power to be the servants. It was a smooth way of going on, perhaps, in respect of saving trouble, but it had the appearance of being expensive for well, the servants felt it a duty they owed to themselves to be nice in their eating and drinking, and to keep a deal of company downstairs. They allowed a very liberal table to Mr. and Mrs. Pocket, yet it always appeared to me that by far the best part of the house to have boarded in would have been the kitchen, always supposing the boarder capable of self-defence, for before I had been there a week, a neighbouring lady with whom the family were personally unacquainted wrote in to say that she had seen Miller slapping the baby. This greatly distressed Mrs. Pocket, who burst into tears on receiving the note, and said that it was an extraordinary thing that the neighbours couldn't mind their own business. By degrees I learnt, and chiefly from Herbert, that Mr. Pocket had been educated at Harrow and at Cambridge, where he had distinguished himself, but that, when he had had the happiness of marrying Mrs. Pocket very early in life, he had impaired his prospects and taken up the calling of a grinder. After grinding a number of dull blades, of whom it was remarkable that their fathers, when influential, were always going to help him to preferment, but always forgot to do it when the blades had left the grindstone, he had wearied of that poor work and had come to London. Here, after gradually failing in loftier hopes, he had read with divers who had lacked opportunities or neglected them, and had refurbished divers others for special occasions, and had turned his acquirements to the account of literary compilation and correction, and on such means, added to some very moderate private resources, still maintained the house I saw. Mr. and Mrs. Pocket had a toady neighbour a widow lady of that highly sympathetic nature that she agreed with everybody, blessed everybody, and shed smiles and tears on everybody, according to circumstances. This lady's name was Mrs. Coiler, and I had the honour of taking her down to dinner on the day of my installation. She gave me to understand on the stairs that it was a blow to dear Mrs. Pocket, that dear Mr. Pocket should be under the necessity of receiving gentlemen to read with him. That did not extend to me, she told me, in a gush of love and confidence. At that time I had known her something less than five minutes. If they were all like me, it would be quite another thing. "'But, dear Mr. Pocket,' said Mrs. Coiler, "'after her early disappointment—not that dear Mr. Pocket was to blame in that—requires so much luxury and elegance. Yes, ma'am.' I said to stop her, for I was afraid she was going to cry. "'And she is of so aristocratic a disposition?' "'Yes, ma'am,' I said again, with the same object as before. "'That it is hard,' said Mrs. Coiler, "'to have dear Mr. Pocket's time and attention diverted from dear Mrs. Pocket.' I could not help thinking that it might be harder if the butcher's time and attention were diverted from dear Mrs. Pocket, but I said nothing, and indeed had enough to do in keeping a bashful watch upon my company manners. It came to my knowledge, through what passed between Mrs. Pocket and Drummle, while I was attentive to my knife and fork, spoon, glasses, and other instruments of self-destruction, that Drummle, whose Christian name was Bentley, was actually the next heir but one to a baronetcy. It further appeared that the book I had seen Mrs. Pocket reading in the garden was all about titles, and that she knew the exact date at which her grandpapa would have come into the book, if he had ever come at all. 
Trummel didn't say much, but in his limited way, he struck me as a sulky kind of fellow, he spoke as one of the elect, and recognized Mrs. Pocket as a woman and a sister. No one but themselves and Mrs. Coiler, the toady neighbour, showed any interest in this part of the conversation, and it appeared to me that it was painful to Herbert. But it promised to last a long time, when the page came in with the announcement of a domestic affliction. It was, in effect, that the cook had mislaid the beef. To my unutterable amazement, I now, for the first time, saw Mr. Pocket relieve his mind by going through a performance that struck me as very extraordinary, but which made no impression on anybody else, and with which I soon became as familiar as the rest. He laid down the carving-knife and fork, being engaged in carving at the moment, put his two hands into his disturbed hair, and appeared to make an extraordinary effort to lift himself up by it. When he had done this, and in not lifting himself up at all, he quietly went on with what he was about. Mrs. Coiler then changed the subject and began to flatter me. I liked it for a few moments, but she flattered me so very grossly that the pleasure was soon over. She had a serpentine way of coming close at me when she pretended to be vitally interested in the friends and localities I had left, which was altogether snaky and fork-tongued, and when she made an occasional bounce upon Startop, who said very little to her, or upon Drummel, who said less, I rather envied them for being on the opposite side of the table. After dinner the children were introduced, and Mrs. Coiler made admiring comments on their eyes, noses, and legs, a sagacious way of improving their minds. There were four little girls and two little boys, besides the baby who might have been either, and the baby's next successor, who was as yet neither. They were brought in by Flopson and Millers, much as though those two non-commissioned officers had been recruiting somewhere for children, and had enlisted these, while Mrs. Pocket looked at the young nobles that ought to have been, as if she rather thought she had had the pleasure of inspecting them before, but didn't quite know what to make of them. "'Here, give me a fork, Mum, and take the baby,' said Flopson. "'Don't take it that way, or you'll get its head under the table.' Thus advised, Mrs. Pocket took it the other way, and got its head upon the table, which was announced to all present by a prodigious concussion. "'Dear, dear, give it me back, Mum,' said Flopson. "'And Miss Jane, come and dance to baby, do.' One of the little girls, a mere mite, who seemed to have prematurely taken upon herself some charge of the others, stepped out of her place by me, and danced to and from the baby until it left off crying and laughed. Then all the children laughed, and Mr. Pocket, who in the meantime had twice endeavoured to lift himself up by the hair, laughed, and we all laughed and were glad. Flopson, by dint of doubling the baby at the joints like a Dutch doll, then got it safely into Mrs. Pocket's lap, and gave it the nutcrackers to play with at the same time recommending Mrs. Pocket to take notice that the handles of that instrument were not likely to agree with its eyes, and sharply charging Miss Jane to look after the same. Then the two nurses left the room, and had a lively scuffle on the staircase with the dissipated page who had waited at dinner, and who had clearly lost half his buttons at the gaming-table. I was made very uneasy in my mind by Mrs. Pocket's falling into a discussion with Drummle respecting two baronetcies, while she ate a sliced orange steeped in sugar and wine, and forgetting all about the baby on her lap, who did most appalling things with the nutcrackers. At length little Jane, perceiving its young brains to be imperiled, softly left her place, and with many small artifices coaxed the dangerous weapon away. Mrs. Pocket, finishing her orange at about the same time, and not approving of this, said to Jane, "'You naughty child! How dare you! Go and sit down this instant!' "'Mama, dear,' lifts the little girl, "'baby would have put his eyes out.' "'How dare you tell me so!' retorted Mrs. Pocket. "'Go and sit down in your chair this moment.' Mrs. Pocket's dignity was so 
crushing, that I felt quite abashed, as if I myself had done something to rouse it. Belinda, remonstrated Mr. Pocket, from the other end of the table, how can you be so unreasonable? Jane only interfered for the protection of baby. I will not allow anybody to interfere, said Mrs. Pocket. I am surprised, Matthew, that you should expose me to the affront of interference. A good God, cried Mr. Pocket, in an outbreak of desolate desperation. Are infants to be nutcrackered into their tombs, and is nobody to save them? I will not be interfered with by Jane, said Mrs. Pocket, with a majestic glance at that innocent little offender. I hope I know my poor grandpapa's position. Jane, indeed. Mr. Pocket got his hands in his hair again, and this time really did lift himself some inches out of his chair. Hear this, he helplessly exclaimed to the elements, babies are to be nutcrackered dead for people's poor grandpapa's positions. Then he let himself down again and became silent. We all looked awkwardly at the tablecloth while this was going on. A pause succeeded, during which the honest and irrepressible baby made a series of leaps and crows at little Jane, who appeared to me to be the only member of the family, irrespective of servants, with whom it had any decided acquaintance. "'Mr. Drummle,' said Mrs. Pocket, "'will you ring for Flopson? Jane, you undutiful little thing, go and lie down. Now, baby darling, come with Ma.' The baby was the soul of honour, and protested with all its might. It doubled itself up the wrong way over Mrs. Pocket's arm, exhibited a pair of knitted shoes and dimpled ankles to the company, in lieu of its soft face, and was carried out in the highest state of mutiny. And it gained its point after all, for I saw it through the window within a few minutes, being nursed by little Jane. It happened that the other five children were left behind at the dinner-table, through Flopson's having some private engagement, and there not being anybody else's business. I thus became aware of the mutual relations between them and Mr. Pocket, which were exemplified in the following manner. Mr. Pocket, with the normal perplexity of his face heightened, and his hair rumpled, looked at them for some minutes, as if he couldn't make out how they came to be boarding and lodging in that establishment, and why they hadn't been billeted by nature on somebody else. Then, in a distant missionary way, he asked them certain questions, as why little Joe had that hole in his frill, who said Pa, Flopson was going to mend it when she had time, and how little Fanny came by that Whitlow, who said Pa, Millers was going to poultice it when she didn't forget. Then he melted into parental tenderness and gave them a shilling apiece, and told them to go and play, and then as they went out, with one very strong effort to lift himself up by the hair, he dismissed the hopeless subject. In the evening there was rowing on the river. As Drummle and Startop had each a boat, I resolved to set up mine, and to cut them both out. I was pretty good at most exercises in which country boys are adepts, but as I was conscious of wanting elegance of style for the Thames, not to say for other waters, I at once engaged to place myself under the tuition of the winner of a prize-wary who plied at our stairs, and to whom I was introduced by my new allies. This practical authority confused me very much by saying I had the arm of a blacksmith. If he could have known how nearly the compliment lost him his pupil, I doubt if he would have paid it. There was a supper-tray after we got home at night, and I think we should all have enjoyed ourselves, but for a rather disagreeable domestic occurrence. Mr. Pocket was in good spirits when a housemaid came in and said, "'If you please, sir, I should wish to speak to you.' "'Speak to your master?' said Mrs. Pocket, whose dignity was roused again. "'How can you think of such a thing? Go and speak to Flopson, or speak to me at some other time.' "'Begging your pardon, ma'am,' returned the housemaid, "'I should wish to speak at once, and to speak to master.' Hereupon Mr. Pocket went out of the room, 
and we made the best of ourselves until he came back. "'This is a pretty thing, Belinda,' said Mr. Pocket, returning with a countenance expressive of grief and despair. "'Here's the cook lying insensibly drunk on the kitchen floor, with a large bundle of fresh butter made up in the cupboard ready to sell for grease.' Mrs. Pocket instantly showed such amiable emotion, and said, "'This is that odious Sophia's doing.' "'What do you mean, Belinda?' demanded Mr. Pocket. "'Sophia has told you,' said Mrs. Pocket. "'Did I not see her with my own eyes, and hear her with my own ears, come into the room just now and ask to speak to you?' "'But has she not taken me downstairs, Belinda?' returned Mr. Pocket, and shown me the woman, and the bundle too? "'And do you defend her, Matthew,' said Mrs. Pocket, "'for making mischief?' Mr. Pocket uttered a dismal groan. "'Am I Grandpapa's granddaughter to be nothing in this house?' said Mrs. Pocket. "'Besides, the cook has always been a very nice, respectful woman.' and said in the most natural manner when she came to look after the situation that she felt I was born to be a duchess. There was a sofa where Mr. Pocket stood, and he dropped upon it in the attitude of the dying gladiator. Still in that attitude he said, with a hollow voice, "'Good night, Mr. Pip,' when I deemed it advisable to go to bed and leave him. End of chapter Chapter Twenty Four of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter Twenty Four. After two or three days, when I had established myself in my room and had gone backwards and forwards to London several times, and had ordered all I wanted of my tradesmen, Mr. Pocket and I had a long talk together. He knew more of my intended career than I knew myself, for he referred to his having been told by Mr. Jaggers that I was not designed for any profession, and that I should be well enough educated for my destiny if I could hold my own with the average of young men in prosperous circumstances. I acquiesced, of course, knowing nothing to the contrary. He advised my attending certain places in London, for the acquisition of such mere rudiments as I wanted, and my investing him with the functions of explainer and director of all my studies. He hoped that with intelligent assistance I should meet with little to discourage me, and should soon be able to dispense with any aid but his. Through his way of saying this, and much more to similar purpose, he placed himself on confidential terms with me in an admirable manner, and I may state at once that he was always so zealous and honourable in fulfilling his compact with me, that he made me zealous and honourable in fulfilling mine with him. If he had shown indifference as a master, I have no doubt I should have returned the compliment as a pupil. He gave me no such excuse, and each of us did the other justice. Nor did I ever regard him as having anything ludicrous about him, or anything but what was serious, honest, and good, in his tutor communication with me. When these points were settled, and so far carried out, as that I had begun to work in earnest, it occurred to me that if I could retain my bedroom in Barnard's Inn, my life would be agreeably varied while my manners would be none the worse for Herbert's society. Mr. Pocket did not object to this arrangement, but urged that before any step could possibly be taken in it, it must be submitted to my guardian. I felt that this delicacy arose out of the consideration that the plan would save Herbert some expense, so I went off to Little Britain and imparted my wish to Mr. Jaggers. "'If I could buy the furniture now hired for me,' said I, and one or two other little things, I should be quite at home there. "'Go it,' said Mr. Jaggers, with a short laugh. "'I told you you'd get on. Well, how much do you want?' I said I didn't know how much. "'Come,' 
retorted Mr. Jaggers. "'How much? Fifty pounds?' "'Oh, not nearly so much.' Five pounds?' said Mr. Jaggers. This was such a great fall that I said in discomfiture, "'Oh, more than that.' "'More than that, eh?' retorted Mr. Jaggers, lying in wait for me, with his hands in his pockets, his head on one side, and his eyes on the wall behind me. "'How much more?' "'It is so difficult to fix a sum,' said I, hesitating. "'Come!' said Mr. Jaggers. "'Let's get at it. Twice five, will that do? Three times five, will that do? Four times five, will that do?' I said I thought that would do handsomely. Four times five will do handsomely, will it?' said Mr. Jaggers, knitting his brow. "'Now, what do you make of four times five? "'What do I make of it?' "'Ah!' said Mr. Jaggers. "'How much?' "'I suppose you make it twenty pounds,' said I, smiling. "'Never mind what I make it, my friend.' observed Mr. Jaggers, with a knowing and contradictory toss of his head. "'I want to know what you make it.' Twenty pounds, of course.' "'Wemmick!' said Mr. Jaggers, opening his office door. "'Take Mr. Pip's written order and pay him twenty pounds.' This strongly marked way of doing business made a strongly marked impression on me, and that not of an agreeable kind. Mr. Jaggers never laughed, but he wore great, bright, creaking boots, and in poising himself on these boots, with his large head bent down and his eyebrows joined together, awaiting an answer, he sometimes caused the boots to creak, as if they laughed in a dry and suspicious way. As he happened to go out now, and as Wemmick was brisk and talkative, I said to Wemmick that I hardly knew what to make of Mr. Jagger's manner. "'Tell him that, and he'll take it as a compliment,' answered Wemmick. "'He don't mean that you should know what to make of it. "'Ho!' for I looked surprised. "'It's not personal. "'It's professional, only professional.' Wemmick was at his desk, lunching, and crunching, on a hard dry biscuit, pieces of which he threw from time to time into his slit of a mouth, as if he were posting them. "'Oh, it seems to me,' said Wemmick, "'as if he had set a man-trap and was watching it. Suddenly, click, you're caught. Without remarking that man-traps were not among the amenities of life, I said I supposed he was very skilful. Deep, said Wemmick, as Australia. Pointing with his pen at the office floor, to express that Australia was understood, for the purposes of the figure, to be symmetrically on the opposite spot of the globe. If there was anything deeper— said Wemmick, bringing his pen to paper. He'd be it. Then I said I supposed he had a fine business, and Wemmick said, Capital! Then I asked if there were many clerks, to which he replied, We don't run much into clerks, because there's only one Jaggers, and people won't have him at second hand. There are only four of us. Would you like to see him? You are one of us, as I may say. I accepted the offer. When Mr. Wemmick had put all the biscuit into the post, and had paid me my money from a cash-box in a safe, the key of which safe he kept somewhere down his back, and produced from his coat-collar like an iron pigtail, we went upstairs. The house was dark and shabby, and the greasy shoulders that had left their mark in Mr. Jagger's room seemed to have been shuffling up and down the staircase for years. In the front first floor— a clerk who looked something between a publican and a rat-catcher, a large, pale, puffed, swollen man, was attentively engaged with three or four people of shabby appearance, whom he treated as unceremoniously as everybody seemed to be treated who contributed to Mr. Jagger's coffers. "'Getting evidence together,' said Mr. Wemmick, as we came out, "'for the bailey.' In the room over that— a little flabby terrier of a clerk with dangling hair, his cropping seemed to have been forgotten when he was a puppy, was similarly engaged with a man with weak eyes, whom Mr. Wemmick presented to me as a smelter who kept his pot always boiling, and who would melt me anything I pleased. 
and who was, in an excessive white perspiration, as if he had been trying his art on himself. In a back room, a high-shouldered man with a face-ache tied up in dirty flannel, who was dressed in old black clothes that bore the appearance of having been waxed, was stooping over his work of making fair copies of the notes of the other two gentlemen for Mr. Jaggers's own use. This was all the establishment. When we went downstairs again, Wemmick led me into my guardian's room, and said, "'This you've seen already.' "'Pray,' said I, as the two odious casts, with a twitchy leer upon them, caught my sight again, "'whose likenesses are those?' "'These?' said Wemmick, getting upon a chair and blowing the dust off the horrible heads before bringing them down. "'These are two celebrated ones, famous clients of ours that got us a world of credit. This chap, why, you must have come down in the night and been peeping into the inkstand to get this blot upon your eyebrow, you old rascal. Murdered his master, and, considering that he wasn't brought up to evidence, didn't plan it badly.' "'Is it like him?' I asked, recoiling from the brute, as Wemmick spat upon his eyebrow and gave it a rub with his sleeve. "'Like him? It's himself, you know. The cast was made in Newgate, directly after he was taken down. "'You had a particular fancy for me, hadn't you, old Artful?' said Wemmick. He then explained this affectionate apostrophe by touching his brooch representing the lady and the weeping willow at the tomb with the urn upon it, and saying, "'Had it made for me express?' "'Is the lady anybody?' said I. "'No,' returned Wemmick. "'Only his game. "'You liked your bit of game, didn't you? <laughs> "'No, deuce a bit of a lady in the case, Mr. Pip, except one, "'and she wasn't of this slender ladylike sort, "'and you wouldn't have caught her looking after this urn, "'unless there was something to drink in it.' Wemmick's attention being thus directed to his brooch, he put down the cast and polished the brooch with his pocket-handkerchief. "'Did that other creature come to the same end?' I asked. "'He has the same look.' "'You're right,' said Wemmick. "'It's the genuine look. Much as if one nostril was caught up with a horsehair and a little fish-hook. Yes, he came to the same end. Quite the natural end here, I assure you. He forged wills, this blade did, if he didn't also put the supposed testators to sleep too. You were a gentlemanly cove, though, Mr. Wemmick was again apostrophizing, and you said you could write Greek. Yeah, bounceable! What a liar you were! Ha! I never met such a liar as you! Before putting his late friend on his shelf again, Wemmick touched the largest of his mourning rings and said, sent out to buy it for me, only the day before. While he was putting up the other cast and coming down from the chair, the thought crossed my mind that all his personal jewellery was derived from like sources. As he had shown no diffidence on the subject, I ventured on the liberty of asking him the question when he stood before me, dusting his hands. "'Oh, yes,' he returned. "'These are all gifts of that kind.' One brings another, you see. That's the way of it. I always take em. They're curiosities, and they're property. They may not be worth much, but, after all, they're property and portable. It don't signify to you with your brilliant lookout. But as to myself, my guiding star always is, get hold of portable property. When I had rendered homage to this light, he went on to say, in a friendly manner, if at any odd time when you have nothing better to do, you wouldn't mind coming over to see me at Walworth, I could offer you a bed, and I should consider it an honour. I have not much to show you, but such two or three curiosities as I have got you might like to look over, and I am fond of a bit of a garden and a summer-house. I said I should be delighted to accept his hospitality. Think ye, said he. "'Then we'll consider that it's to come off, when convenient to you. "'Have you dined with Mr. Jaggers yet?' "'Not yet.' "'Well,' said Wemmick, "'he'll give you wine, and good wine. "'I'll give you punch, and not bad punch. 
And now I'll tell you something. When you go to dine with Mr. Jaggers, look at his housekeeper. Shall I see something very uncommon? Well, said Wemmick, you'll see a wild beast tamed. Not so very uncommon, you'll tell me. I reply, that depends on the original wildness of the beast, and the amount of taming. It won't lower your opinion of Mr. Jaggers's powers. Keep your eye on it. I told him I would do so, with all the interest and curiosity that his preparation awakened. As I was taking my departure, he asked me if I would like to devote five minutes to seeing Mr. Jaggers at it. For several reasons, and not least because I didn't clearly know what Mr. Jaggers would be found to be at, I replied in the affirmative. We dived into the city, and came up in a crowded police court, where a blood relation, in the murderous sense, of the deceased, with a fanciful taste in brooches, was standing at the bar, uncomfortably chewing something, while my guardian had a woman under examination, or cross-examination, I don't know which, and was striking her, and the bench, and everybody present, with awe. If anybody, of whatsoever degree, said a word that he didn't approve of, he instantly required to have it taken down. If anybody wouldn't make an admission, he said, I'll have it out of you. And if anybody made an admission, he said, Now I have got you. The magistrate shivered under a single bite of his finger. Thieves and thief-takers hung in dread rapture on his words, and shrank when a hair of his eyebrows turned in their direction. Which side he was on I couldn't make out, for he seemed to me to be grinding the whole place in a mill. I only know that when I stole out on tiptoe, he was not on the side of the bench, for he was making the legs of the old gentleman who presided quite convulsive under the table by his denunciations of his conduct as the representative of British law and justice in that chair that day. End of chapter Chapter 25 of Great Expectations This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens Chapter 25 Bentley Drummle, who was so sulky a fellow that he even took up a book as if its writer had done him an injury, did not take up an acquaintance in a more agreeable spirit. Heavy in figure, movement, and comprehension, in the sluggish complexion of his face, and in the large, awkward tongue that seemed to loll about in his mouth as he himself lolled about in a room, he was idle, proud, niggardly, reserved, and suspicious. He came of rich people down in Somersetshire, who had nursed this combination of qualities until they made the discovery that it was just of age and a blockhead. Thus Bentley Drummle had come to Mr. Pocket when he was a head taller than that gentleman, and half a dozen heads thicker than most gentlemen. Startop had been spoilt by a weak mother, and kept at home when he ought to have been at school, but he was devotedly attached to her, and admired her beyond measure. He had a woman's delicacy of feature, and was, as you may see, though you never saw her, said Herbert to me, exactly like his mother. It was but natural that I should take to him much more kindly than to Drummle, and that, even in the earliest evenings of our boating, he and I should pull homeward abreast of one another, conversing from boat to boat, while Bentley Drummle came up in our wake alone, under the overhanging banks and among the rushes. He would always creep in shore like some uncomfortable amphibious creature, even when the tide would have sent him fast upon his way, and I always think of him as coming after us in the dark, or by the backwater, when our own two boats were breaking the sunset or the moonlight in midstream. Herbert was my intimate companion and friend. I presented him with a half-share in my boat, which was the occasion of his often coming down to Hammersmith and my possession of a half-share in his chambers often took me up to London. We used to walk between the two places at all hours. 
I have an affection for the road yet, though it is not so pleasant a road as it was then, formed in the impressibility of untried youth and hope. When I had been in Mr. Pocket's family a month or two, Mr. and Mrs. Camilla turned up. Camilla was Mr. Pocket's sister. Georgiana, whom I had seen at Miss Havisham's on the same occasion, also turned up. She was a cousin, an indigestive single woman, who called her rigidity religion, and her liver love. These people hated me with the hatred of cupidity and disappointment. As a matter of course, they fawned upon me in my prosperity with the basest meanness. Towards Mr. Pocket, as a grown-up infant with no notion of his own interests, they showed the complacent forbearance I had heard them express. Mrs. Pocket they held in contempt, but they allowed the poor soul to have been heavily disappointed in life, because that shed a feeble reflected light upon themselves. These were the surroundings among which I settled down and applied myself to my education. I soon contracted expensive habits, and began to spend an amount of money that within a few short months I should have thought almost fabulous, but through good and evil I stuck to my books. There was no other merit in this than my having sense enough to feel my deficiencies. Between Mr. Pocket and Herbert I got on fast, and with one or the other always at my elbow to give me the start I wanted, and clear obstructions out of my road, I must have been as great a dolt as Drummle if I had done less. I had not seen Mr. Wemmick for some weeks, when I thought I would write him a note and propose to go home with him on a certain evening. He replied that it would give him much pleasure, and that he would expect me at the office at six o'clock. Thither I went, and there I found him putting the key of his safe down his back as the clock struck. "'Did you think of walking down to Walworth?' said he. "'Certainly,' said I, "'if you approve.' "'Very much,' was Wemmick's reply, "'for I have had my legs under the desk all day, and shall be glad to stretch them. Now I'll tell you what I have got for supper, Mr. Pip. I have got a stewed steak, which is of home preparation, and a cold roast fowl, which is from the cook's shop. I think it's tender, because the master of the shop was a juryman in some cases of ours the other day, and we let him down easy. <laughs> I reminded him of it when I bought the fowl, and I said, "'Pick us out a good one, old Britain, because if we had chosen to keep you in the box another day or two, we could have easily done it.' He said to that, "'Let me make you a present of the best fowl in the shop.' I let him, of course. As far as it goes, it's property and portable. You don't object to an aged parent, I hope. I really thought he was still speaking of the fowl, until he added, Because I have got an aged parent at my place. I then said what politeness required. So you haven't dined with Mr. Jaggers yet? He pursued as we walked along. Not yet. He told me so this afternoon when he heard you were coming. I expect you'll have an invitation to-morrow. He's going to ask your pals, too. Three of them, ain't there? Although I was not in the habit of counting Drummle as one of my intimate associates, I answered, Yes. Well, he's going to ask the whole gang. I hardly felt complimented by the word. And whatever he gives you, he'll give you good. Don't look forward to variety, but you'll have excellence. And there's another rum thing in his house, proceeded Wemmick after a moment's pause, as if the remark followed on the housekeeper understood. He never lets a door or window be fastened at night. Is he never robbed? That's it, returned Wemmick. He says, and gives it out publicly, I want to see the man who'll rob me. Lord bless you, I have heard him a hundred times, if I have heard him once, say to regular cracksmen in our front office, You know where I live now, no bolt is ever drawn there, why don't you do a stroke of business with me? Come, can't I tempt you? Not a man of them, sir, would be bold enough to try it on, for love or money. They dread him so much, said I. Dread him, said Wemmick. I believe you, they dread him. No, but he's artful, even in his defiance of them. No silver, sir. Britannia metal, every spoon. So they wouldn't have much, I observed, 
even if they ah but he would have much said wemmick cutting me short and they know it he'd have their lives and the lives of scores of em he'd have all he could get and it's impossible to say what he couldn't get if he gave his mind to it i was falling into meditation on my guardian's greatness when wemmick remarked as to the absence of plate that's only his natural depth you know a river's its natural depth and he's his natural depth look at his watch chain that's real enough it's very massive said i massive repeated wemmick i think so and his watch is a gold repeater and worth a hundred pound if it's worth a penny mr pip there are about seven hundred thieves in this town who know all about that watch there's not a man a woman or a child among them who wouldn't identify this smallest link in that chain and drop it as if it was red-hot if inveigled into touching it at first with such discourse and afterwards with conversation of a more general nature did mr wemmick and i beguile the time and the road until he gave me to understand that we had arrived in the district of walworth it appeared to be a collection of back lanes ditches and little gardens and to present the aspect of a rather dull retirement wemmick's house was a little wooden cottage in the midst of plots of garden and the top of it was cut out and painted like a battery mounted with guns my own doing said wemmick looks pretty don't it i highly commended it i think it was the smallest house i ever saw with the queerest gothic windows by far the greater part of them sham and a gothic door almost too small to get in at that's a real flagstaff you see said wemmick and on sundays i run up a real flag then look here after i have crossed this bridge i hoist it up so and cut off the communication the bridge was a plank and it crossed a chasm about four feet wide and two deep but it was very pleasant to see the pride with which he hoisted it up and made it fast smiling as he did so with a relish and not merely mechanically at nine o'clock every night greenwich time said wemmick the gun fires there he is you see and when you hear him go i think you'll say he's a stinger the piece of ordnance referred to was mounted in a separate fortress constructed of lattice work it was protected from the weather by an ingenious little tarpaulin contrivance in the nature of an umbrella then at the back said wemmick out of sight so as not to impede the idea of fortifications for it's a principle with me if you have an idea carry it out and keep it up i don't know whether that's your opinion i said decidedly at the back there's a pig and there are fowls and rabbits then i knock together my own little frame you see and grow cucumbers and you'll judge at supper what sort of a salad i can raise <laughs> so sir said wemmick smiling again but seriously too as he shook his head if you can suppose the little place besieged it would hold out a devil of a time in point of provisions then he conducted me to a bower about a dozen yards off but which was approached by such ingenious twists of path that it took quite a long time to get at and in this retreat our glasses were already set forth our punch was cooling in an ornamental lake on whose margin the bower was raised this piece of water with an island in the middle which might have been the salad for supper was of a circular form and he had constructed a fountain in it which when you set a little mill going and took a cork out of a pipe played to that powerful extent that it made the back of your hand quite wet i am my own engineer and my own carpenter and my own plumber and my own gardener and my own jack of all trades said wemmick in acknowledging my compliments well it's a good thing you know it brushes the nougat cobwebs away and pleases the aged you wouldn't mind being at once introduced to the aged would you it wouldn't put you out i expressed the readiness i felt and we went into the castle there we found sitting by a fire a very old man in a flannel coat clean cheerful comfortable and well cared for but intensely deaf well aged parent 
said Wemmick, shaking hands with him in a cordial and jocose way. "'How am you?' "'All right, John, all right,' replied the old man. "'Here's Mr. Pip, aged parrot,' said Wemmick, "'and I wish you could hear his name. Nod away at him, Mr. Pip, that's what he likes. Nod away at him, if you please, like winking.' "'This is a fine place of my son's, sir,' cried the old man, while I nodded as hard as I possibly could. "'This is a pretty pleasure ground, sir. This spot, and these beautiful works upon it, ought to be kept together by the nation, after my son's time, for the people's enjoyment.' "'You're as proud of it as Punch, ain't you, aged?' said Wemmick, contemplating the old man, with his hard face really softened. "'There's a nod for you,' giving him a tremendous one. "'There's another for you,' giving him a still more tremendous one. "'You like that, don't you? "'If you're not tired, Mr. Pip, though I know it's tiring to strangers, "'will you tip him one more? "'You can't think how it pleases him.' "'I tipped him several more, and he was in great spirits. "'We left him bestirring himself to feed the fowls, "'and we sat down to our punch in the arbour.' where Wemmick told me, as he smoked a pipe, that it had taken him a good many years to bring the property up to his present pitch of perfection. "'Is it your own, Mr. Wemmick?' "'Oh, yes,' said Wemmick. "'I have got hold of it a bit at a time. It's a freehold, by George.' "'Is it indeed? I hope Mr. Jaggers admires it.' "'Never seen it,' said Wemmick. "'Never heard of it. Never seen the aged never heard of him no the office is one thing in private life is another when i go into the office i leave the castle behind me and when i come into the castle i leave the office behind me if it's not in any way disagreeable to you you'll oblige me by doing the same i don't wish it professionally spoken about of course i felt my good faith involved in the observance of his request the punch being very nice, we sat there drinking it and talking, until it was almost nine o'clock. "'Getting near gunfire,' said Wemmick then, as he laid down his pipe. "'It's the aged's treat.' Proceeding into the castle again, we found the aged heating the poker, with expectant eyes, as a preliminary to the performance of this great nightly ceremony. Wemmick stood with his watch in his hand until the moment was come for him to take the red-hot poker from the aged, and repaired to the battery. He took it and went out, and presently the stinger went off with a bang that shook the crazy little box of a cottage as if it must fall to pieces, and made every glass and teacup in it ring. Upon this the aged, who I believe would have been blown out of his armchair but for holding on by the elbows, cried out exultingly, "'He's fired! I heard him!' and I nodded at the old gentleman until it is no figure of speech to declare that I absolutely could not see him. The interval between that time and supper Wemmick devoted to showing me his collection of curiosities. They were mostly of a felonious character, comprising the pen with which a celebrated forgery had been committed, a distinguished razor or two, some locks of hair, and several manuscript confessions written under condemnation upon which Mr. Wemmick set particular value as being, to use his own words, "'Every one of them lies, sir.' These were agreeably dispersed among small specimens of china and glass, various neat trifles made by the proprietor of the museum, and some tobacco stoppers carved by the aged. They were all displayed in that chamber of the castle into which I had been first inducted, and which served not only as the general sitting-room, but as the kitchen, too, if I might judge from a saucepan on the hob, and a brazen bijou over the fireplace, designed for the suspension of a roasting jack. There was a neat little girl in attendance who looked after the aged in the day. When she had laid the supper-cloth, the bridge was lowered to give her means of egress, and she withdrew for the night. The supper was excellent, and though the castle was rather subject to dry rot, insomuch that it tasted like a bad nut, and though the pig might have been farther off, I was heartily pleased with my whole entertainment. Nor was there any drawback on my little turret bedroom, beyond there being such a very thin ceiling between me and the flagstaff, that when I lay down on my back in bed, 
it seemed as if I had to balance that pole on my forehead all night. Wemmick was up early in the morning, and I am afraid I heard him cleaning my boots. After that he fell to gardening, and I saw him from my Gothic window pretending to employ the aged, and nodding at him in a most devoted manner. Our breakfast was as good as the supper, and at half-past eight precisely we started for Little Britain. By degrees Wemmick got drier and harder as we went along, and his mouth tightened into a post-office again. At last, when we got to his place of business and he pulled out his key from his coat-collar, he looked as unconscious of his Walworth property, as if the castle and the drawbridge and the arbour and the lake and the fountain and the aged had all been blown into space together by the last discharge of the stinger. End of chapter.